Hello and welcome to this beautiful lecture of C and C++ programming. My name is Prashant and I'm a coding instructor who is going to take you through this beautiful course where we are going to explore programming with C language and C++ language. I have catered to more than thousands of students and helped them settle in their placements with respect to their college and after college journey. In this course, we will be exploring two different things which is C language and C++ language. As they are very similar to each other, I have divisioned or I have partitioned this course into two parts. The first part is part one and the second part is part two. Where in the first part, we will be learning everything about C language and in the second part, we will be going slowly and exploring the C++ language. As the syntax and semantics are almost same, C++ language will actually give you a quick revision of whatever you have learned in C language and will give you a better hands-on in explore in exploring the methods of C++ language. Moving ahead, let's see how this course is going to look like. Very first, we'll be starting with programming with C language, which is going to be our part one. We'll be starting with the introduction to the programming concept, like what is programming, why you should learn programming, why C language, then introduction to the C language. Then we'll be setting up the environment where we are going to write our code. And after that, we'll run our first C language program. Moving ahead, we will see variables and data types in which we will be exploring what is variable, data types in C, declaring and initializing variables, basic operations with variables, constants, and typecasting. As soon as we go ahead, we will explore operators and expressions in which we'll see different operators which are arithmetic, relational, logical, assignment, increment and bitwise operators. Bitwise operators are something of an advanced topic, I would say. So we will not be going in depth with the bitwise operator in the very beginning, but slowly as we move ahead with our course, we'll definitely explore that as well. Then we will see control structures, one of the best and one of the important topic of any language in which we will be starting with the if conditions, where we'll also explore with if and else, the nested if conditions, followed by switch statements, and in the loopings which contains for loop, while loop and do while loop. Then we'll also see break and continue in order to work with various questions. Moving ahead, we will see functions and parameters like what is function, what are recursions, how to pass arguments, what are parameters, the return and also the function overloading. This is going to give you a better hands-on practice as well. So stay tuned, moving ahead arrays and string. So if in case you want to store any data, we definitely need arrays and a string in which we will be exploring everything about array, including declaration and initialization and manip manipulation as well. And so the same will go with the strings as well. Like what is a string declaration and initialization of a string, a string manipulation and some libraries with respect to a string. Moving ahead, we have pointers, which is a bit complex topic but I will make it very simple and easy for you in which we will be exploring from the very basic like what is pointer, why do we need pointers in C language or in any other programming language or is it really helpful. Moving ahead, we'll see how to declare a pointer and pointer arithmetics, pointers with respect to arrays where we have to pass different addressings, pointers and functions which is a quite good topic I would say and dynamic memory allocation including alloc, malloc and cloc. Moving ahead, then we will see file input and output. Using this, we will be able to manipulate our text and other document files. We'll see how that could be done with the streams, how we can open and close file, read and write file, and even delete the content of any particular file. And the same, we will see how that could be done with the binary file input and output. This will lead to the closure of C language. Post that, we'll see a small project and along the way along the curriculum we will also see different questions which will help us understand these concepts in a better way part two where we are starting our programming with c plus plus is actually going to help you with the revision we will see the introduction of c plus plus and writing the first program in c plus plus where the syntaxes are little different just the print and the scanning is going to get converted to c out and c in Moving ahead, everything is looking quite familiar. We will see the same thing, variables and data types, which is having nothing other than what we have seen in C language. 
moving ahead operators and expressions if you see they are exactly similar as the language so we will have a quick revision and we will move with these topics quite fast as we already know what they are moving ahead control structures where well we are well aware with these topics now if else nested switch for while do while break and continue so the same will be done with them as well we will move quite fast and we will cover more programs rather than fo focusing on what is inside them moving ahead functions and parameters followed by arrays and string this is going to be a little different as we have various libraries for arrays and strings so we will also see what are different methods present and how that is going to make our work very very simple moving ahead pointers there are uh, there's just one more thing which we need to understand which is little different than c language which is dynamic memory allocation and we'll see how that could be used in data structure and how that is done we will not be covering the part of data structure that is a complete separate and a very big topic but i will give you a hint like how these pointers are very very helpful in passing any data to any other data type or to any other location now we go ahead we'll see structure and unions which is a c++ topic so what is a structure how to initialize how to declare structures then accessing the members of it or accessing the elements of the structures and the same goes for union as well we will do the same with the unions as well moving ahead file input and output which is very similar to our c programming language there is almost no difference i would say so we will also go ahead very very fast and this will actually help us go ahead with one more extra topic which is object oriented programming also known as oops in which we are going to see how everything could be partitioned into classes and how we can relate or call those data with the help of the objects here we will see different concepts of oops and we'll also explore them with different projects see ya in the coming lectures bye bye Hello and welcome to the first video of introduction to the C programming where we are going to learn about why exactly we should learn programming what programming is and why exactly we should learn C programming and the best thing is that today we are going to write our first program in C programming so hold on to your seat sit tight relax yourself and let's get started moving ahead the first thing is what is programming so if you are new to programming this question would have came to your mind even if you know programming and if you know what programming is i will make it very very simple to you instructions given to any machine which could be your mobile phone laptop even the cars or any robots is your programming so machines don't know english or hindi or any other language right so in that case we have to communicate to them with an intermediate language or a translator language which we as well as our system understand which is programming language but moving on to the definition it says something else programming is the process of designing writing testing debugging and maintaining the source code of a computer software so why exactly we will learn programming to make something right it could be a website the applications or the games or any sort of software so what we have to do is we definitely have to go ahead and write some code and what this code is this code is your source code or also known as program which we will write it could be as simple as printing your name or as difficult as designing a complete operating system okay so that basically is programming instructions given to any machines moving ahead why should we learn programming so hear me out very properly as we are going and increasing with technology with a such a fast pace the future is going to be a tech future or a technology driven future right in the initial days when we used to see cars it was just the metal bodies right but now it is 50% software and as we move ahead with time it will be 20 to 30% of the cars with the metal bodies and 80 or 70% of the software which is going to drive the car if you see tesla what is that the way it is able to sense what's coming in front of it or the way it is able to utilize the self driving feature is done with the help of programming and in order to explore these trending 
domains which is going to come for us in future we should definitely know what programming is be it in health sector be it in um, automobile sector or be it in your tech sector everywhere programming is coming and making its own space if you are from health sector you know that the bigger operations or even testing of medicines are done with a lot of robotics and machines which are highly equipped with great softwares and how those softwares are built with your program or programming so that's why we should definitely learn programming so c programming is the first programming language i would say and it's also known as the mother of all the programming language though there were different programming language before c as well like b and a but they were not that good and not that efficient so c was developed in 1972 by dennis ritchie at bell labs and you will be surprised to know that it is still used today all the other language be it python java c sharp is built on the foundations of c language only and that's why it is known as mother of all language one more thing it is one of the fastest language and that's why it is used in today's time as well moving ahead what we have setting up the environment mm. basically you can go ahead and set the environment either physically or sorry either offline or online if you want to go ahead with the offline mode we have visual studio code which is a great tool but i am no longer a fan of offline softwares so what you need to do in order to set up the vs code you just have to click on a new tab in your favorite browser and search for vs code and click on download so this is the first thing which you have to do and then click on download be it on mac linux or windows you will get that over here if in case you're not getting you can see click on this small icon and you will see download it for different things and you can download here and then you have to set it for different things all the things are given over here over here if you see and go to the docs they will guide you step by step in order to set up this environment but i am a very big fan of online ides now and one of the best one which i will suggest to you is to use replit why exactly replit because it is going to store all your softwares or all your code and you can access them from anywhere let me just go ahead and show you how replit looks like basically the url for replit is r e p l i t dot com so you just have to search this and you will land up over here basically i am logged in or signed up so it is looking different for me but i really wanted to show you something if you go to my ripples here all my projects are saved no matter how like uh, how earlier i created it okay so these are present over here that's why i am suggesting you also to use the best online ide how to set this up is i'm going to help you right now i'm going to the incognito window i'm going to search for replit.com and this is going to take me over here on the top right hand side corner we see sign up as well as login button if you already have your account click on login and then you can enter your id and password and then you will be able to get in if you're not already registered here we have to click on the sign up button as soon as we click on sign up button it will ask us different name what exactly you have to give in the user name in user name uh, it's more like a reference name or a unique name for your identity let's suppose my name is prashant i will write prashant and then i will follow up with few more characters let's suppose 4789 so that is an available username it is very similar to finding your user id of instagram right and then we have to pass our email id i'm going to pass a sample email id prashant2345.ty at gmail.com though this is just an uh, example of sample mail id this is not my personal mail id i will set up with the password with the password you have to be very specific it has to be eight characters and it should also have different uh, characters it should have one capital character okay one capital character one small character at least one small characters one digit and one special symbol which could be anything or dollar has or something like that let me set this up and i'm going to show you one password which all of you can use for yourself which is a student at the rate 123 which i use for all my students if i am setting up their account 
So it is eight characters long. It is having one upper character, all the lower characters, one special symbol, and also the digits. If you are not coming up with a very good password, you can utilize this. Click on create account by clicking on that blue button. It will take some time and uh oh, it says it's an invalid mail ID. I'll remove the dot and I will click on create. If it does not help, I am going to put up my actual mail ID. Okay, now let me just go ahead and create the account. So it says it's successful. And this is how you will be uh, given with the interface. You have to select based on whatever is your level. If you do not know programming, you can select not at all. Or you can select beginner because you are going to learn things with us. It will say want to start with coding tutorial. No, I got this as you're already on a coding tutorial, which is going to help you throughout this journey. And this is how your overall layout will look like. What we have to do over here is this is the home page. If you scroll down, here are multiple projects from people around the globe. If you want to explore it, you can click on it and you can explore those projects. Now, if you go to my ripples, all your projects will be saved over here. All your projects will be saved over, over here. That's one thing. Then how do we create the project? We have to click on this blue button, create ripple. As soon as we do that here, we get bunch of different options from which we have to select our template, which is going to be the C programming. Just type C. And here you get C from Replit. Click on it and that's selected. Now it is going to ask you to give a title as this is our first program. I'm just going to give it as first program. And once I have given the title, I will click on create REPL. Once this REPL is ready, I will sit tight. This is a blue box which may appear in front of you for the very first time, which we definitely have to ignore. Click on cross to delete that. Now let us understand the interface of this as well. On the top, you see your username and the title of the project along with in what language you are coding it. Here on the left hand side, we see files in which we can see main.c, which is our main file is present. If in case you want to add anything, you can upload it from here. If in case you want to add different things, you can add that as well. Here is our code area where I can see my code and on the right hand side, which is a black window that is called as console where our outputs will be visible. If I click on run, which is the blue button, it is going to execute the code and it is going to give you the output. If in case there is an error, if you run that, it's going to show you what exact error you made. If you see, we are missing up with a semicolon. So that's the expected error. It's not going to tell you what exactly your error is. It is going to tell you that could be the expected error. And that's how we get to know that we made some mistake in our program. So we'll definitely close this. And now you know how to set it up. So you can go ahead and set up your replet. And then we are moving ahead with the first program, which is Hello World. And then we will also see how to print your own name in C programming. So let's jump to Replit. Click on Create Repl. Select C language. And then I'm going to give the title as First Program Hello World. And then I will click on Create Repl. Once I do this, it is going to take some time to boot the Replit and then it's ready in front of us. Very first thing which you need to do is you can delete the entire thing which is present over here because we are going to understand it one by one, line by line, character by character. As we go ahead, we are going to write has include and then we will write stdio dot h. Now this is the header file which we got. I will explain every single thing in coming lectures. Don't worry about it. Just write as it is. Then followed by int main and then we will give these parentheses followed by curly brackets. Inside this, if in, if in case you want to print something, we'll write print f and then we will give the parentheses, then the quotation and here we need to give our value. Let's suppose we just want to print hello world. We'll write that up and we'll end it with a semicolon. 
and because we are using int main we also have to give return zero all those things you will get to know as soon as we proceed ahead now this is the code which you just need to copy down on your applet stop the video and do it on your side and then click on run and tell us what you got in the output if you got the output as hello world then that is the green signal that you got your output and congratulations for your first code now what we actually did over here has include std io dot h what is the meaning of that so that's called as an uh, that's called as one header file and what is the header file let's go ahead and check that header file so because we are running a lot of code basically all the commands which are here it should mean something to the IDE. What is the IDE? Integrated Development Environment. Basically, replicate where we are writing our code. It should understand what is the meaning of printf, right? In order to make it understand the meaning of printf, we are importing one header file, which is stdio, which is input output, standard input output header file. Dot h is the extension and we place it within these symbols. Now, this is telling us that whenever you are using printf, that is going to give the output in the console window. As it happened over here, if you see, hello world got printed on the console window. Moving ahead, we use has include. It's a preprocessor. Very first, whenever your code is running, it will find wherever your has include is present. It's called as preprocessors. It is processed even before your code. Okay, and that's how it gets to know what are libraries or headers it has to import in your code. And that is how all the other codes which you're writing below it will make sense to your C program. Don't overwhelm yourself. Do not try to understand these things. Just have a gist of it. As soon as we move ahead, you will understand every single bit of this course. I promise you that. Then we went ahead with next line, which was int main. There are two things. One is int main and the other is void main. So what these things are, we will cover that in details in coming lectures. As of now, just understand this thing that this is the data type which we are passing. Int means integer. As of now, let's not go in a lot of detail of what int is, but what is the meaning of main function? You definitely have to understand that. The main function is something where we are going to write our code, which is started with a curly bracket and ended with the curly bracket. All the codes which are present here is the code which is going to run when you click on run. Is the only code which is going to matter to your IDE or to your replicate when we are clicking on that front button. So whatever code we write in it is only going to get executed. Let's go ahead and slowly understand what those lines were when we started writing. The very first line which we wrote was print f. So as it is very similar to printing. So if in case you want to give anything to your console, if you want to print anything in your console, what we need to do is we have to use print f followed by the parenthesis or the round brackets. And if in case you have a message which was hello world, I will have to give the double quotation over here. And then we write our message, which was hello world. Okay. And then we close our quotations. We close our bracket. And every single line inside the int main will be closed by a semicolon. So the same we did, if you see over here, we closed the line with a semicolon. Then because of this int main, just because of this int main thing, we have to write one more code, which is return zero. What is the meaning of return zero? It simply means that my code is error free and then run the code without any errors or without any problem. And it's going to run very properly. If in case it has some error, it will automatically give you in the console like what all errors you have. Okay, let's go ahead and run this one more time and see if it is working. Yes, it did. So if in case you want to print something in the printf, what you just have to do is write printf inside the quotation, give your value. So can we change this from hello world to your name? Let's look at this. So 
I will definitely go ahead and write one more printf which will make little more sense. And here I'm going to write Prashant Mishra followed by the semicolons to the end line. And now if I run this, you will see that hello world and Prashant Mishra is coming right next to each other. So whatever we write in the printf will be present in the same line unless and until we give a new line. Okay, don't worry, we'll learn how to give the new line and everything. But right now what we are going to do is we are going to give a space after hello world and see if that is making a difference. Yes, hello world uh, exclamation mark and we are getting a space and Prashant Mishra got printed. So if in case you want to print anything, you just have to write printf, give the quotation, double quotation and then start with your code. I love coding. Okay, let's click on run and see if we are getting our output or not. So hello world, Prashant Mishra, I love coding. Now, if you want to bring I love coding to little down to the next line, you need to know about one thing, which is backslash n. So if in case you give backslash n, not the division sign, it is backslash n, which you will find in the query row, uh, Q W E R T Y row towards the end. And if you do that before any line or towards any line, it's going to come in the new line. If you see right now, I love coding came in the next line. But this is going to just add new line. If you add it before our text or before a message, it will add before it. If you add after a message, it will do a similar task. It will print your message and then it will add one more line. So after that, if you are printing something, that will again go to the next line only. So instead of a space, I will go and give backslash n over here. And let's see if that is bringing our Prashant Mishra to next line. Let's look at this. And yes, it did. So congratulations. Now you know how to print something in your C program. If you have any doubts, you can do let us know by putting it in the comment section. Thank you, bye-bye. See you in the next video. Hello and welcome to this topic, variables and data types. As this is a very important topic, we have actually partitioned this video into two. Very first, we will be learning about variables and then the data types. This is going to be the foundation of your coding because Coding or softwares without variables is nothing. We will see that in coming future. For general example, you can just imagine that these are the foundations. And if you do not set up a very good foundation, your building is going to shake, okay? So you need to pay extra attention in order to understand this topics, variables, and data types. So let's see what is a variable. I'm sure you would have heard this name before, especially in your mathematics where variable was meaning something which can vary. Definitely here also it is going to vary, but it has bigger meaning or bigger values. Now I'll cover this up with a very small and beautiful example. You will be able to relate it. Let's suppose you are moving from place A to place B, and now you have to keep all your items in the boxes. Imagine you have different boxes and you want to keep all your box books in one box okay so you kept all the books in just one box and now what you want to do it you have labeled that box as books so i'll create the visual representation of the same now this is a box which has nothing but the books now out of all the different boxes which you have you now know what is that particular box or which one is that box where you have kept your books in. So variables have a very similar meaning in programming. If you go through the definition, variables are storage locations in your system. Imagine a memory because that is the only storage location in our system. Let's go ahead and create a representation of memory. Though the memory does not look like this, but let's create some blocks and understand this by imagining that this is our memory. Inside memory, we have small, small blocks where we can store our data. Let's suppose an image or our name or a video file. So this particular block has one image, okay? Now, in order to know what that block is, where you kept your image, you need to have some sort of map which is telling you 
where exactly you need to look for. So variables work is only this much that it is going to point out to that particular storage location where your image or data is stored. So it's more like the container where we can store our values. Let's go ahead and see. They're more like containers, boxes of different item. The values stored in variable can be changed through of the program of execution. Imagine that you went to point B and now you removed all your books from this box of books. Now, definitely we can change this from books to some other item. Let's suppose all your gadgets you kept in this box and now you want to relabel it to gadgets. We can do that, right? So definitely now we can utilize the same box or same memory block to store some other data. If you delete that location, if you delete that data, we can now utilize it to put something else. That is what is variable in programming. Moving ahead, we will see what are keywords and identifiers. Basically, keywords are predefined words present in C language. So there are certain words like printf, which we already did. So that is one pre-written word or predefined word in C language. And if we use this as labeling our box or marking like where exactly is our storage location, it's going to give us an error because it already has some meaning in C file or in C code. Imagine you named a box as bomb, okay? Though you don't have to do that, but imagine if you named a box as bomb and if you go to airport and the airport facility sees that, they are going to really check that box because that is not going to surpass the security because of this special word bomb, right? In a very similar way, we cannot use certain keywords, certain words which are already present and has some meaning inside C program. So those are known as keywords. They have different keywords like if, while, for and much more which you will see in coming future and you will know that which all names you cannot use for your variables or for labeling your data. Now what are identifiers? Identifiers are nothing but the name. Let's suppose you are giving this a name as bomb so this is going to be your label. This is going to be the name of the variable. Okay. Now we have certain rules of naming this because coding is all about rules and regulations which we have to follow very properly. Then only it's going to work or it is going to give us the error. So let's have a look at all the rules, basically four rules which are very important before giving a label to any identifier, so any variables. These are known as identifiers. So the first statement says a valid identifier can have letters, both uppercase and lowercase, digits and underscores. So it can actually have anything between A to Z in capital, the small A to Z, numbers from 0 to 9, and in a special character, we can only have underscore. What if we keep a hyphen? What if we keep a space? Or what if we keep a dollar sign? Will that be valid? No. These things are going to give you the errors that these, this is not the proper syntax, not the proper rule of naming a variable. Let's go ahead and look at the other cases. The first letter of an identifier should be either a letter or an underscore, which is telling us that it cannot be the number or any other special characters. So if in case we are giving the variable name as name and we are storing my name, let's suppose Prashant in it. In that case, it's valid. But if I give it as one name equal to Prashant, then it's going to be of real troublesome. This is going to give you the error and it's not going to work. Whereas if you do not start your name with a digit, other than that, if you start with a letter or underscore, that is going to get accepted. You can definitely use it more like name one or name underscore or underscore name. But this is definitely wrong according to our rules. We will see all of them one by one as we see what is the syntax of writing our variable. Going ahead, you cannot use keywords like int, while, etc as identifiers as the variable names. As discussed, the bomb example, we cannot use certain words as our variable names. There is no rule of 
how long an identifier can be however you may run into problems in some compilers if the identifier is longer than 31 characters imagine you started writing the name let's suppose you want to store name of one particular book the book name is how to code how to code in c language if it has more than 31 characters and this is going to be a book if you put this as your variable name which is going to be more than 31 characters it may give you some trouble in some compilers whereas in other compilers which are much more advanced will definitely take this also in consideration though keeping that big name is definitely not very good practice because humans will also have a lot of trouble writing this again and again which is going to increase their time and it's going to cost them little more because time is equivalent to money if you see okay we go ahead syntax of a variable how exactly we can go ahead and create the variables so here we can see very first is the data type if you see over here is the data type this is what we are going to learn but i will tell you that number character or a number with the decimal values okay and do that decimal values now you can actually look at them little differently like number you can identify which is a whole number what is a character what is the decimal value number or which is a decimal number so this is the actual type of data what type of data you are passing is nothing but your data type in short so very first we have to mention that what type of data i'm going to store if it is a number i have to write int if it is a character we have to write char if it is a decimal we have to write float and then only we can give the name of the variable which is over here then you have to give the name of the variable though we can give any name starting as small as a or as low as n or as good as n num okay but when you are going through these names you will have a problem in understanding why exactly you use this name for let's suppose if you are storing age it's better to have the full name of the variable that is going to give you much more clarity like where exactly you're going to use those variable names or here we can have name here we can have number so this is how it is giving us much more clarity for what purpose we are creating those variables and followed by the semicolons this is the syntax and later on in order to give the value we can definitely give it as age equal to 10. let's go ahead and try that in replet and get hands-on practice on it we'll go to replet click on create search in replet c we will select the language c give the title as variables and go ahead and click on create rebel now moving ahead let it load we already have some pre-written files if in case you do not want to write this again and again you can reutilize this thing i will just remove this printf and i will create one small variable which is going to be my int h equal to i am just writing int h now i just want to give h equal to 10 and in order to print this can we use printf and give here h similar to how we gave initially like printing a small name printf computer okay let's see let me remove this if i'm simply giving printf computer that is going to get printed can we do the same for our numbers let's see that I gave her age and let's run it so here we are going to have some errors and what will be the error it will say segmentation fault core dumped which means this is not a right syntax in order to print your data types or in order to print your variables we have to mention something as format specifiers we have to tell them what type of data we are going to print and there's a logic there's a rule for that as well in order to print something we will go ahead and we'll write printf then inside the quotation we will mention what type of data we are putting for integer we have to give modulus d followed by comma 
and then we can print what exactly we are trying to print. Let's go ahead and try this with model SD, which is also known as format specifier. Here I'm going to write model SD. After the quotation, I'm going to separate it with the comma and then I'm going to mention my variable, which was age. Let's run it. And it now says computer 10. Now, if you want to get that 10 in the next line, you can go ahead and give patchless n right after the computer. Now this 10 will come in next line. What if you want to mention that I am 10 years old? Okay. So what is our line? Our line is I am 10 years old. What is 10 over here? It could be replaced with the variable. It's a data. I can replace this with the variable. So I'm just keeping it inside a curly bracket so that you can understand that we are going to replace it with the data. Let's remove this or let's keep this here. I'm going with a different print of a statement. Inside the quotation, we are going to write I am 10 years old and comma age. Okay. If I'm writing modulus D right after the old, let me delete this or else this is going to give us the error. If I simply write modulus D after the old, what exactly we are getting? Let's see that. It says I am 10 years old, 10. Now, if I'm writing modulus D after old, I'm getting the age value there. Can we replace this with modulus D and see if we are still getting the same output? Let's look at this. It will give you actual zero. Why exactly zero? Because we have not passed one more variable. We have not passed one more variable with respect to modulus D and which means number of format specifiers equivalent to number of variables. If you're passing modulus D two times, we have to separate it with comma and give variable also two times. And let's see, it is giving us, I am 10 years old. So let me just remove this modulus D from here and also remove this age from here and let's not confuse you. If in case you want to print that I am 10 years old, this is how you will go ahead and write it. You have to do that modulus D somewhere in the mid and that modulus D value will actually get replaced by your variable value. Let's go ahead and try this. Let's click on run. It says I am 10 year old. Basically, it's also giving you 10 from the above line. So let me have a backslash n over here, which will give me much more clarity. It says I am 10 years old. What if you really want to break the line over here? We can even give backslash n after modulus t. So it has to go inside the quotation. Wherever you see quotation, you can give that. And due to which it is giving one blank line to us. We can do that as well. Now, let's go with some other data type. Let's go with some character, a simple character. So in that case, we will have to give care. And this is going to be my name, first character. And when I'm giving the character, I have to keep that inside single quotation. Whereas for numbers, we don't have to do that. I'm just keeping it as P followed by the semicolons. Let me just go ahead and do that. Print F modulus c for your character type and here i'm going to write name after this old i'm going to give bachelor's n so that i can get this p in next line hold on it gave me error because i missed a semicolon let me just go ahead and run this again and it says i am 10 years old and at the last line if you can see there is a p which is the first name what if i keep a big name and then if i run this let's see if we are going to get errors or if I'm still getting one particular character. So it's giving me T, which is going to be the last character of the string or the word which we have. If we have a very big name, it's only going to take the last character. What if we replace this with the double quotations? Will that make any difference? Let's look at that. And still, we are getting something. We are getting something, which is ampersand symbol and why exactly we got that because it's not a character but a string value in order to give a string we have to use it in a little different way we will see that in coming classes don't worry but you need to see that whenever you want to print a character you have to give that in single quotation and you have to make sure you are only giving the one character or else it will take the last character value and now this is going to work if in case my first name or my first character of my name is first character of my name 
is modulus c which is p so i can use this in order to get first character of my name is p if you don't want that extra closing symbol to come at the last we can have a backslash n in order to remove that i'm not going ahead with the new line whenever i am exceeding the space limit it goes to the new line first character of my name is p that's how we go ahead with the format specifiers and actually print your variables now we will learn about int cat float string and various other data types in coming video this is one thing now you would have seen me writing that here i gave int age colon and then age equal to 10 we can actually replace this and put it in one line int age equal to 10 directly and that is also going to work and can we change this value a little later definitely we can do that i will just give after this line okay i'll give age equal to 29 okay age equal to 29 and now i want to print this particular value my new age is modulus b comma age let's see if we got a new value in the output in order to get this in new line we can definitely have backslash n and backslash n it says my new age is 29 so right after you change your value if you use that value in the print of a statement it's going to update basically what i mean to say is if you are printing age over here it will still give you 10 okay it will still give you 10 and here also if you see it is still giving you 10 but here in line number 16 when we updated the value to 29 after that if we give any command where we are printing the age this new value will get printed what will happen if i give int age equal to 29 will that also work or it's going to give me some sort of error so it's going to give me the error it says that int age is already there we don't have to create the new variable with the same name which means we cannot create two similar looking variable here when i'm writing int i'm actually creating the variable which I don't have to do. Here, if I remove int, I'm updating the value, which I can do, okay? It's more like you are going to buy uh, maybe an ice cream, okay, of $10, and that cost you $10. So with that same $10, you cannot utilize it to buy two ice creams, right? You have to need one extra $10 amount in your hand or in your pocket, right? So the same thing goes over here. We have to have a new variable in order to use it. Either we give one or two or three in front of it, or we create a complete new variable. It's going to work flawlessly. Now listen, until we start creating the same variable twice. Okay, let's go ahead and run this. My new age is 29. This was all about variables. See you in the next video. Welcome to the next part of variables where we are going to start from adding variables together followed by data types. So let's begin. We have learned so many things so far till now and let's utilize that knowledge very first. I will go ahead and delete this. For you, you can either go ahead and continue in the same program or you can also prefer creating a new program so that you do not lose this important things and where exactly these things will be visible. If you see over here, go to my ripples whatever ripples we have been creating so far till now it's all present over here if in case you forgot to get the name that will be present in over here in unnamed folder and you can see all your codes over here so we'll go back to the same code and we'll start creating in the same variables let it load here we go i will actually remove the code which we did because i no longer need it okay now what we are going to do in this we are going to add two different value let's suppose you want the sum or difference or multiplication or division of two numbers in this we are going to use something called as operators plus minus multiplication division though we will learn this in detail in coming up lectures but as of now these basic operators is something which you should be knowing how to perform inside your variables let's go ahead and do that for this for addition of this we will actually need two variables num1 and i'm going to give some value to it let's suppose 10 and then i'm going to have num2 and i'm going to give some value to it which is 5 let's suppose okay moving ahead i just want the sum of these two values either i can do it 
directly by printing f modulus t and then printing num1 plus num2. This will also give me the result if I simply run it. So it's giving me the result as 15. We can also add a text addition of above number is and now it's going to give me 15 along with the text. What if we really want to store this data into some other variable called as sum? How exactly we are going to do that? Int sum equal to num1 plus num2 semicolon and instead of num1 plus num2 we can directly pass here the value sum and it's going to work. Whereas if you want to subtract any data you will just change the sign and the result will be 5. Though we just have to change the text and it's going to work. And the same operation could be also done with the multiplication where now the result will be 50 if you can see that. Okay. So I hope you would have understood this basic operations of adding of two values and this is how we go ahead and utilize these knowledge with coming up projects. Moving ahead with our topic, we have declaring multiple variables. As you just saw me that I took two lines in order to declare these two variables but can we do that in the same line separated it with the comma? Let's see that. I will actually remove these two lines and I will write int only one time num1 equal to 5 comma num2 equal to 10. I can definitely go ahead and do that as well. So I have to just separate it with commas. I don't have to write int again and again. And if I run it, you will see the sum of the above number is still 15, which is adding up 5 plus 10 and giving you the output. What if we want to sign the same values? We can actually do one more thing, which is int x equal to y equal to z equal to 10. Now, x, y and z is going to have some similar value. But if you see, they are going to have some errors, which is what, which is saying that we cannot do it like this. So we have to declare them separately and we have to give their values separately. So if you follow this method, we can assign same value, which is 10 to all three variables, which is X, Y and Z. So this is how we can even go ahead and test it by printing it. Print F modulus D modulus T and modulus t because we are printing three different variables x y and z so we will have to do it like this hold on let me click on run and let's see what's our output so it says 10 10 and 10 so in order to get that in new line i'll just have to give a backslash n and we will get our output in next line this is how we declare multiple variables if we have different values if in case we want to get the same value this is also something which we can try I hope you would have understood this pretty well. Moving ahead, real life project of student data using a different sort of data types. We'll come back to this once we understand different data types and different uh, format specifiers for it. Data types. I'm using this term from quite long time, right? What exactly is data type? Let's look at the definition. A variable in C must be specified with data type and you must use a format specifier like modulus d inside the printf function to display it properly let's go ahead and check what different type of data which we can store inside our variables very first a whole number for that we have to use integer and the short form which we use is int if you want to store just one single character in that case, we use the character type of data and the short form is char which we use. Then going ahead with the decimal, we have two things over here. One is float and the other is double. We'll look at this with a wider picture and then we'll understand this. What is the difference between float and double? And then we have a string type of data which can store the complete name. We have not done that before. So if in case I want to store my full name, which is Prashant and display it, that will be done with string data type. And this is how we are telling that we are using different type of data. And that's how we mentioned that in a print statement as well. 
Moving ahead, let's see what we got for us. So here are basic data types, int, float, double, char, and a string. So what is the size value of one int value which we are giving? Or how do we print it? What is the format specifier related to that? int or the integer value or the whole number value is going to take approximately from two to four bytes depending on different IDs, depending on different compilers. Then float, it's going to take four bytes of data double it's going to take eight bytes of data char is going to take only one byte of data because it is just one single character and a string depends how many characters we have multiplied with one that many data or that many byte of data it is going to consume followed by the format specifiers int could be done with modulus d or modulus i let's go and have a look at this i'll remove the old code which you have to keep so that you can store a start a new program for this going ahead with int num equal to 10 this is my value and i want to print it so printf typo printf modulus t comma num let's see if this is going to give us the output if yes it's a good situation we got the output as 10 let me also give it as backslash n so that that extra symbol goes to the next line and we got the value as 10 over here if you see okay let's try this with modulus i as well and check if it is actually working and as a result which is taking a little bit of more time so i'll stop and i will run this command again and we got 10 with modulus i as well so for integer value we can use both modulus t as well as modulus i or the percentage i the percentage symbol is called as modulus okay now if i want to give the data type as int can we store 10.3 in it and let's see what will be the output so it will give the value 10 only it will actually remove the non-whole number or the decimal values it will even remove the decimal it's not giving us any error but it will not print the decimal value in order to do that we have to use float in front of it and now if we are printing with modulus i, it's going to give us garbage value. Any random value every single time. If you see, it's giving us garbage value or the random value. So we have to give the right kind of format specifier as well in order to get the correct value from it. If you see, right now what we are getting is 10.300000. Okay. The same could be done with double as well. And let's see what will be the difference with the double. So let me just go ahead and write here double and give it as LF instead of just F. Now let me just go ahead and see is there any difference exactly not. Now let us see how we can actually remove those last zero values if you don't need it. Or let me just go ahead and give different values over here and try this with the double as well as with your float and let's see if there is any difference if you see with double what it is doing is three four three six four six it is changing that five to six but what will happen if you go ahead with float and do it you just need to change this from lf to f and let's run it and see the difference so it is giving us the output till the scheme three four three six Four, six. It's rounding off to the value and it's only giving us to a particular decimal value. If in case you want to increase this or decrease this, we use decimal modification. In that case, we have to come right in front of F and we have to put a dot and write one. Now, this is only going to give us one value after the decimal. If we go ahead and give it, give it as two, it's going to give us two values after the decimal and so on. You can keep on increasing to get different numbers and will keep on giving you the different values for it. The difference between float and main uh, double is the occupancy of number of decimals and how long or how big number you can store in it. As you would have already seen here, it's going to take four bytes and the other one is going to take eight bytes. So double is definitely going to store a bigger value. Next is going ahead with the char. Let's go ahead and do that. We'll remove this. If in case we want to store just one single character, like my name first character, I will just go ahead and use a single quotation and I will give it like this. And if in case I want to print it, I will simply go ahead and write print F, modulus C and comma name. Now this is going to give us the entire first character. 
hold on and there is our output now the thing which i was waiting for is a string because now you have to display the entire text and this is going to be very very important now as you know a string is nothing but the sequence of characters which we will see in coming videos as well so we actually give char as the data type only and let's suppose i want to store name before, right after that i'm going to give these square brackets equal to inside the double quotation i'm going to have my full name prashant mishra okay i will put this semicolon and then i will print it print f now i have to use modulus s in order to give the entire name hold on let me click on run and see what are we getting so voila we got prashant mishra in the output and you can now use the variables to get your name also in the output so what are you waiting for go ahead and try this and utilize this good information of different data types now we will go back to the same thing which was the real life project of a student data here we have id age fee grade and we are also going to import one more thing which is going to be the name so let's go ahead and use this real life project to store the real life data from the student's life. Let me just go ahead and take the very first variable as int student ID. So here we are going to use camel casing in order to get if you see after student I is capital. So that thing is called camel casing. My student ID is 001. I kept it as that. Now my next data which i am going to put is my student age that will also be one integer value because that could be a whole number a student age equal to 23 which was there in it next is what we are taking is a student fee this could be in lakhs thousands whatever but it could definitely be in decimal so i'm using float a student fee equal to 70 point seven eight possibly then next is the student grade which could be a grade b grade c grade or something like that which is just one single character so in that case we will be using a student grade with cat now let's suppose the student got a and then right after the id let's also have the student name okay a student name followed by square brackets equal to in the double quotation the name of the student i'm going to give here alpha beta okay now what we need to do is get this data printed so let's get ahead print f what we need to do is print a student id so we'll write a student id and this is a decimal oh sorry this is an integer value so i have to use model as d and every time we'll be using backslash and to get the data in the next line now what exactly do i need to give it there is a student id and we are good let's go to the student name we'll write student name model as d sorry model as s backslash n and here we will give a student name we are good next we are going with the a student age student age model as d why because it's one integer value or a whole number you can say a student age we are good print f next is the fee of the uh, student so that is one float value so we have to use model as f a student's fee model as f backslash n comma a student fee next is the student's grade which is in character so we will be going ahead and utilizing that a student's grade model as c and here we are going to pass students grade we can also use backslash n over here so it's the last value but still we can use it to make it look good now we are going to click on run to see if you are getting the output a student id is one so any number uh, any number which is zero before the numbers will be removed so 001 will be one 
and student name is alpha beta student age is 23 student fees is 70.779999 so this happens with float if you do not want those sort of changes you can always use double and that will actually retain the real time information a student's grade is a so that's how we store the real time data or the students data with our program and that's how we print it and that's what is your first program which is covering the real time data moving ahead we have further more things which is setting up the decimal value which we have already seen if you want to set it up to two precisions we have to use dot 2f okay or 2lf if in case you are using double and that's it in this video we will meet again with newer topic newer projects and we'll see you soon bye bye hello and welcome to the next video where we are going to see about type conversion basically what type conversion is yes you would have got this right by the name itself it's very much self revealing type conversion is where you are converting from one data type to another be it from a string to characters or into float or vice versa let's go ahead and see this from the example of code we are going ahead with int sum equal to 5 by 2 you already know what is the me what is the result of 5 by 2 it is 2.5 but because it is stored in int sum the result will be little different let me just go ahead and get this data modulus d comma sum now i am printing this value and here we converted our 2.5 which was a float or a double value or a decimal value to the integer value or when it is done automatically even 5.34567 or 568 now when we are printing this we are getting what we are getting 5 so we are converting the type to the integer this is what is called type conversion moving ahead different types of conversions are implicit conversion which is also known as automatic conversion and then the second one is yes the opposite of that explicit in which we have to manually do the type conversion so let's see them one by one and let's get ahead so implicit conversion is something which we are going to see now even this is an example of implicit conversion only where we are taking int sum equal to 7.890 and now when we are printing the sum modulus d comma sum this is an automatic conversion where we are converting that 7.890 to 7 if we run it you will see that in example in the console here so we got 7 and it could be done vice versa as well if you we just go ahead and write over here float and instead of 7.890 we just give 7 and here you definitely know we have to convert this to model as f so let me just go ahead and put that now this will get converted to 7.0000 and 0 so now those decimals and zeros are added automatically to our result this is called automatic type conversion or implicit type conversion we will go ahead and do one more example with the same where we are having one float value and then we convert that value into our integer value float num1 equal to 6.789 this is one float value and if we are putting this into the integer value int num2 equal to num1 let's see what exactly we are going to get i'm simply going to print f model as d num2 in this case what's happening over here in num2 is that it is getting the value of num1 but only before the decimal only the whole number and not the decimal values even this is the result of implicit type conversion only where the things are happening automatically we are not mentioning anything now let's go ahead with the explicit type conversion where we have to manually do that work we have to tell our system our program to convert that type into that particular type let's go ahead and do it so we are going to take one simple example of int num1 equal to 10 or let's take it as 5 and then we are going with the simple 
and similar example with num2 which is going to be 2 and now we are going to have the float result which is going to have 5 divided by 2 and now when we want to print print f modulus f comma result what do you expect in the result the actual result should be 2.5 but if you see over here what we are getting is 2.0 so in this case what exactly do we need to do is we have to manually convert this data as well because initially it was what initially it was integer value and that's why when we are dividing those integer values it is giving us the output as 2.0000 but when we do it by explicitly converting the type to float this is what we need to add and then only we are going to get the right result let me add backslash n as well which will make our work very simple and this is how the result will be in front of you uh, there are different situations where we have to convert the type from one to another and in those situations this is going to be very very helpful so i hope you would have understood this see you in the next video Hello and welcome to this new topic where we are going to learn about constant. This is going to be the last topic of variables and data types. Post this, we will be going ahead with the operators. So what is constant? From the name itself, from the meaning itself, it shows that something which cannot change. So here we are going to declare some variable const or constant and its value is not going to change. So why exactly do we need something like that? Or why would we take any variable for which we do not want to change the value? Imagine you are using pi. So pi value is fixed through 3.14 or 22 by 7. So for that we do not want to change the value and if something is trying to change the value of pi that should actually give us the error. And there are certain different variables for which we would not love to see the value changing because that could actually result in false or undeclared or aka unknown errors which we want to avoid. So let's go ahead and see how exactly do we have to write this. So whenever we are creating some sort of variable, let's suppose a num. So we'll write int num and we want to give some value to it, 10, right? Usually what we do is we can actually change the value to this. Let's suppose we want to change the value from num to 20. This will get changed. But if we simply add this const in front of it, it's going to do its game. Then the value will never get changed. Let's do this in our replet. Let's quickly go ahead and open up a new program click on create select c and give the title here i'm giving it as constants click on create triple you will have a by default template with you which you want to delete so you can definitely click on this and delete it so what exactly we are going to do we are going to check with the normal value first num equal to 10 and then we simply want to print this value print f modulus t comma num now let's click on run to see what is the output of this and here the output is actually 10 now we would love to change the value of num from num to 10 to 20 let's see how this is affecting our result or if this is really affecting our result yes now we got the value as 20 okay good enough now let's see what will happen if we add const int num equal to 10 just adding a const will result this into an error and what does this error says let's read this error cannot assign to variable num what exactly we cannot assign num equal to 20 so it says that if we are using num equal to 20 when the num was already defined as const we cannot do that and that's an error so definitely this is causing us some error and if you simply remove that if you want to print that it is going to get printed in a very same and normal way the only thing which it brings us is that we cannot change the value of it now one very good thing about constant is that what and how we are going to identify that if the number is constant so this is known as clean coding or a good practice with coding where we give the name as uh, all in uppercase. Let's suppose if you want to give the value as pi. So how will I exactly give is const int and I will write pi in capital. 
So whenever I see that kind of variable, I myself will get a message that this value is going to be a constant value. That's how all developers have learned things and that's a, a traditional practice. It's not mandatory, but it is considered to be a good practice. So whenever you yourself use something which is in capital or if you are trying to change the value, you will get a message to yourself that that is a constant value and you have to avoid changing that value. So let's come over here and instead of just num, let's give it as num. And now we also have to change the printing variable num, okay, because it has to stay same as it is case sensitive language and now we are getting the answer as 10 let me also create one more value which is going to be the pi const int pi equal to 3 okay let's take it as float because again pi is a floating number or decimal number 3.14 and let's print that as well print f modulus f comma we'll also give backslash n comma pi Let's print the value of pi as well. And we got one error. So here we missed one semicolon due to which we got an error and that's how we solve the errors. So we got the value as 3.14000. If in case you want to increase the value of 14 of pi, you can do that. And that's how the const work or the constant work. See you in the next video with operators. Hello and welcome to this new video which is operators and expressions. In this we are going to learn about all the operators which is present in expressions. Let's uh, understand what is operator. So we all have learned operators in math. What does it do? It is a symbol between two operands or two values and it results into something, right? So what are operators? Operators are nothing but a symbol which is going to perform some action on two values or more than two values which are also known as operands, okay? So here is a simple example of int minim equal to 100 plus 50, and it can add the values of 150 resulting in 150. So what are different type of operators? It is just the arithmetic operator plus minus multiplication division. Let's explore that together. I'll come to this my replet. I will remove the values over here, and let's go with int some number num equal to 100 plus 50 and now what we are going to do is print f modulus d backslash n and we'll simply print this value num what does this plus operator do over here it is simply adding the value of 150 and giving us the result so it is doing some action on these two values however it can also work between two variables let's simply remove this 50 from here okay and let's take one more variable int num2 equal to 67 probably int result equal to num plus num2 now instead of num we are going to print result and let's see what are we getting so we will get 167 so it is not only adding your numbers or values but it is also working on some of the variables as well Let's go back and explore what are the different types of operators. So here we have arithmetic operator, assignment operator, comparison operator, logical operator, and bitwise operator. Though we are not going to explore a lot about bitwise operator because for that we need to understand in the of binary thing, which is zeros and one, and how the operations on binary actually work. And that is a pretty big and lengthy topic. We will be covering it, but towards the end of the chapter or towards the end of this video, probably after learning C++, I guess. And uh, we have one more operator, which is size of operator, which is not a traditional operator, but it's more like a method which we are going to use, but it is also given some place in operators types. Let's go ahead and explore arithmetic operator for the very first time. Here we have different symbols, plus, minus multiplication division modulus which is also known as percentage so we will be calling it either mod or modulus then we have plus plus which is known as increment operator and minus minus oh we missed one minus so it is going to be minus and minus which is called as decrement operator then in this increment and decrement we have 
pre increment and post increment and pre decrement and post decrement we will also explore that thing so in order to go ahead and explore those things let's quickly go ahead and use first word operators and get the result for that we already have num1 and num2 in result we already are storing the value of num1 plus num2 we will assign it as add now let's go with sub which is the representative of subtraction num1 minus num2 then let's go with the multiplication in mul equal to num multiplied by num2 let's go with division as well int dev equal to num divided by num2 so if you're taking the values num divided by num2 basically it will remove the decimal values but we will anyways get our result which is the division of num uh, num2 which will be the quotient okay so let's actually print these values all together print f add and we'll give colon modulus t comma add and this is how we will be going ahead printing all the values print f sub modulus t comma sub print f mul modulus t comma and we will also write backslash n to get the better clarity we will write mul and dev so print f modulus not modulus dev colon modulus t and here we will give dev we missed a colon over here which will not make it look good and let me also give backslash n with every print statements here we go and putting a semicolon let's go ahead and run this and let's see what is the output which we are getting so addition subtraction multiplication division is very common which you all know i won't be going ahead and telling you how it actually works behind the scene or in the back end but the other operators are definitely important so we'll give a space and we'll actually look at those operators the next one is mod what is the work of mod here in r programming modulus is used for finding the remainder that is used for finding the remainder okay now when we are finding the remainder it is just the remainder if in case we are dividing 10 by 3 we get the quotient right it is like 3 what is the remaining value we don't get that but if we use this 10 modulus 3 we will actually get 1 as the remainder let's go and check that out and see if it actually works so let's go to replicate and here we are going to have the remainder int rem equal to num modulus num2 let's see what do we get and it's better to use a smaller value to actually check if the results are good okay and here we are going to print f modulus okay let's write it as remainder and then we'll write modulus d backslash n and here we are going to give it as rem okay let's go ahead and run this and let's see what are we getting exactly and we got the remainder as one if you do not believe me you can go ahead and test this out if we divide 9 by 3 we will actually get the value as zero in the remainder okay so that's how your remainder works now you no longer need to uh, do different type of mathematics to check how to find remainder this is going to do your work just a simple operator is good enough to find you your remainders let's go ahead with different operators which is plus plus and minus minus in this we need to understand things with a lot of clarity so please pay extra attention let's understand what is plus plus so plus plus is nothing known as increment operator increment operator so what is the use of increment operator it only increases your value by one okay increases your value by one let's go ahead and test this out so we will go to main.c and here we have the num2 value okay and we are going to do what post finding the remainder we will do this okay post finding the remainder we are going to increase the value of num2 and then we will print the value of that what i wrote is num2 plus plus okay just adding that let's print of the value of num2 okay 
num2 updated value okay and here i will give modulus d and then num2 let's see what's the updated value of num2 after writing that plus plus so the updated value of num2 was 3 and uh, the new value is 4 so this is how it just increases your value by 1 and we can do it multiple times control c control v control v control v and it will increase the value over here is 4 5 6 and then 7 so let me just put this and now we got the value as 7 what will happen if we put 3 plus sign no that is an error so the only syntax allows us is 2 plus values and that's how we can go ahead and use increment operator what will happen if i use decrement how do i use decrement operator and what does it do so minus minus is your decrement operator okay and in this the value decreases by one the value decreases by one by one okay let's go ahead and utilize this now we already got the value as 4 over here. I will just put this. We already got our value as 4 for our num2. Now what we will do is for num1 we are going to reduce the value or num we are going to reduce the value. And here we are going to print the very same thing. But with num, the num updated value is num let's see this would have reduced the value from your original value which was 10 to your newer value which is going to be 9 and the same will happen if we go ahead and put this multiple time it's going to reduce your value by one every single time here you go so this is what is your increment and decrement operator in this we have two more things which is pre-increment and post-increment which is a quite logical topic or quite tricky topic I would say so here we have pre and post from the name itself you will be able to understand what is the meaning of it pre means behind or like ahead or post means after okay we can also go ahead and use plus plus num or we can even use minus minus num and for post it is num plus plus and num minus minus is there any difference between plus plus num and num plus plus let's check that out here what we did is num 2 plus plus which was keeping our value to what it was keeping our value to 4 let's also have a backslash n which will give us more clarity if you run it right now the updated value became this now let me just copy this and paste this now we have to increase the value of this but not with plus plus in the back but in the front and not with minus minus in the back but in front let's see if it is coming back to the original value or sorry it is increasing the value of num2 by 1 and decreasing the value of num by 1 so this should value this value should become 5 and this value should become 8 let's see if that is happening yes so what is the actual difference between pre-increment and post-increment and pre-decrement and post-decrement here you need to understand things much more clearly i will just go ahead simply and use a division actually okay so i'm just putting up these lines and i'm dividing it i mistakenly gave the single quotation instead i have to give double quotation and there we go and here i'm writing my semicolon so if i run it right now it will come up with the slashes okay and i will give here backless n to be in the next line what exactly we are going to do is checking what is the actual difference between pre-increment and post-increment hear me out very properly i'm going to use int um roll number okay roll equal to five that's my value int roll equal to five that's my value and now i want to print this print f roll value in post increment let's go with post increment okay in post increment and i will use colon modulus t and right after comma i will write roll plus plus okay let's test this out and exactly what we are getting you will get to know with this so what is the value of roll 
with post increment it's not changing what's happening over here let's test that out with pre increment and let's see if that is making any sense or if that is making any change i'll write plus plus over here i didn't change anything but i just added plus plus on the in the beginning okay here the value is changing i will do that again plus plus at the end the value is not changing but plus plus in the beginning the value is changing okay let's test this out what exactly this means is that whenever you are using pre increment and you are using the variable then and there okay when you are using pre increment plus plus and then you are using the value then and there it will do what it will update the value it will do what it will update the value first update first and use later use later but when you are working with post increment which is num plus plus what this is going to do is use first update later update later okay it's going to do what use first update later so if you are trying to use the variable in the very same line at the very same spot and you are trying to print the value this is going to be the only difference with pre increment the value is incremented then and there but with post increment the value is decrement oh sorry incremented after that line after that execution is done once that line is executed fully so in the next line definitely it will be increased i'm going to show you that as well let me just go ahead and change this from plus plus in the beginning to at the end now this is not changing anything it will keep the value of whole number to 5 only but if i want to use this value little later than that model is d i'll write roll over here roll and backslash n here also i'll put backslash n so that it is coming to the new line and here exactly we'll write our roll we are not updating it we are just printing the value and you will see a difference that here the value became 6 so that's the only difference if we do plus plus before and then we print it the values are updated then and there and it is used if you see the values are 6 and 6 but with post increment the things are little different the value is incremented after executing that line i hope you would have understood this well if not try rewatching it the same is done with the decrement as well if you decrease the value then and there if you want to decrease the value then and there we have to use pre decrement which is minus minus in the beginning so this is going to reduce your value then and there which is pre decrement and then the value will be decremented later as well 4 and 4 if you can see but if you want to decrement the value little later we have to use post decrement okay i hope this would have made a lot of sense and you would have understood this here the value is 5 and later on with the post decrement the value is 4 in the bottom this was all about increment and decrement operator next we have assignment operator so this operator is something which we are using from day 1 where we started variable so the value assigning is done with the equal to right You, if you want you can uh, pause the video practice all this uh, arithmetic operator and then let's move to the assignment operator now talking about the assignment operator it only has one thing which is equal to it only has one thing which is equal to and the work of equal to is just one thing it assigns value it assigns value and where do we assign value mostly to the variables right or anything which can store the data there are different things which can store data right now we just know variables so it assigns the value to the variable so till now what we did is num equal to 20 so 20 was given to this num and it is storing the information this is your assignment operator this equal to is your assignment operator and i really don't have to show you anything in order to do that but let's do it okay let's do this let's go over here if you want to save this code please write it down fully practice it very properly and then move on to create a new version of your c file that is how you will retain all your codes with you and you can practice them whenever you want i don't need these codes so i will be deleting it
let me select from here to here and delete everything even this as well okay here what we have is num equal to 10 here what we have is num equal to 10 so this equal to itself is the assignment operator i don't have to do anything else in order to show you what assignment operator looks like but we definitely do have few more things in assignment operator which is called as shorthands which is called as shorthands which i can show you short hands imagine if you're working on the updation of the value if in case you want to add one to your age after you after your birthday okay let's suppose you are 26 years old right now and today is your birthday after today or from today itself you are going to write 27 if this is there in the variable age how exactly are you going to update it either you will use age plus plus in order to increment it or maybe like plus plus age in order to increment the value or else what you will write is age equal to age plus one isn't it let's test that out if that is actually increasing the value i will write int age equal to 26 and now i will simply print it out print f h model as d and here i'm going to write age simple sorted now i want to write age equal to age plus one simple sorted i simply want to print that age again okay let me just go ahead and use that here we are also going to put backslash n and backslash n and let me just simply run this so what we got is 26 and 27 age after one year we can write that age after one year and now what we get is 26 is my current age and age after one year is 27 that's how we get the difference between the ages and that's how we do that but because you see there are two times where i wrote age and age only in these kind of situations when when you have a same variable okay same variable before and after the equal to okay before and after equal to so in our case it was age equal to age plus one no matter how it is written if it is age equal to one plus age or age equal to age plus one we have two variables before and after the equal to which are very same this could be written down as age plus equal to one this could be written down as age plus equal to one which is the shorthand and let's see if that is adding up to the equal value what i will do is i will simply not change this i will actually copy this entire thing and paste it over here and what i will do is i will simply remove these things and simply write plus in front of it what we are going to get is something new to you age after one year is 27 age after one year is 28 so instead of writing age equal to age plus one we can immediately write age plus equal to one which is very equivalent to or which is very equal to age equal to age plus one this is how we use shorthand to reduce our time and this does not work only with one you can go ahead and change this to any number 10 20 30 40 50 and it's going to work that's where your increment operator cannot work if it's just one we can use increment operator but if it is more than one we have to use our shorthands to save our time now you must be thinking how much time it is going to save us let's suppose 0.5 seconds but if you have to write this thousand times it is going to save you 500 seconds so that's how we increase our speed and that's how we master any software within the given time or that's how we master the placements okay can we do this even with the subtraction let's try that out and let's see if that is actually going to work with subtraction as well age minus equal to one and i'm simply going to print this basically i'm going to remove this line and let's see age before one year okay let me click on run and see what do we actually get yes it's even reducing your age can we test this out with multiplication who knows let's test that out here i'm going to have one more new variable int temporary okay i'm creating a temporary variable i'm keeping its value as 10 
now i want to multiply that value with 2 temp multiplication equal to 2 and now i simply want to print that value print f value colon modulus t why do i write colon just to give a beautification that is not required it's up to you if you want to write that temp and let me just give a hat a semicolon let's go ahead and check if that is actually working yes so 10 into 2 is 20 which is very much equal to temp equal to temp into 2 and if in case you want to save your time you can use the line number 17 which is over here if in case you are good with the normal traditional method you can even use this okay so let me just go ahead and run this up here we will have the values 40y because we are putting it twice so that's how your shorthand works they also work with your other operators which is division and modulus as well they even work with bits like the and or not but as they are a little bit advanced topic where we also have to learn about binaries we are not covering that up here but it is also going to work with your modulus and your division symbol you can test that out as a example or as a test as a practice for yourself okay let's go ahead with new operator which is known as comparison operator in this what are we going to do we are going to compare values yes so we are going to check if two values are equal we are going to check if one value is lesser than the other value we are going to check if one value is greater than the other value we are going to check if one value is less than or equal to the same will be done with greater than equal to or we are also going to check if one value is not equal to the second value let's go ahead and try them out one by one and also understand what they do actually mean so in order to check the equality we will use double equal to and this question will be asked multiple times if you are starting uh, to learn any programming language with, like why double equal to because if you just put single equal to that will be the assignment operator and that's going to assign the values right so that's why we use double equal to in order to check the equality and what will be the result and what exactly do we need to check we can check if 10 is equal to 10 or if there are two variables one is num1 which is having the value 10 the other is num2 which is having the value 10 so we can even check num1 equal to equal to num2 so what is the value which they are going to return us it is going to return us either 0 or 1 where 0 refers as a false and 1 refers to your true value where 0 refers to your false value and 1 refers to as true value so let's have a look at this equality operator and test that out in our code i'm going to remove the pre-written code which is over here if in case you want to save that it is mandatory to go ahead and create that uh, create a new c file that's how you will be able to save your code and you can utilize that for practicing in the later time okay let's go ahead with few variables int num1 equal to 10 and int num2 equal to 20 okay now i'm simply writing this print f equal or not and i will put colon modulus t comma num1 equal to equal to num2 if you are getting zero that means they are not equal and if you are getting one that means they are equal let's test that out so we got zero that means it's not equal so let's give a backslash n over here and also give the value as 10 and now check if we really get one so hold on and yes we got one that means they are equal what will happen if we give decimal values let's look at this 0 9 and let's check if that will be equal or not so yes what is equal because again when you are putting 10.09 the value which is stored there is actually 10 because it is in the form of int and not in the form of your float and that's why they are equal what if we try that with the float value let's change that very first let's have a float value over here and let's have this also as float value will they be equal now let's have a check and no because in float we will compare till the decimal values and if it is equal it is going to give you equal if it is not equal it is not equal 
okay so this is how we check equality we'll control z to get our data back and we'll also remove this 0 9 let's go ahead with the second operator which is less than so we are going to check if my number 1 is lesser than number 2 we are going to check if num1 is less than num2 however you can also check the same with the digits if i remove this num1 and write 10 equal to equal to 10 you will be able to check this as well and it will give you either 0 or 1 based on the results if it is 11 equal to equal to 10 it will actually give you the results so just to maintain that uh, goodness just to maintain that readiness we are writing variables and not the numbers so we will undo everything okay right now we have this and we are going to check if my num1 is lesser than num2 if my num1 my first value first value is less than num2 or not so if it is lesser it will return 1 if it is yes if it is no it is going to return 0 okay let's test this out here i am writing the same equal value and i am going to check with less than symbol and let me just test this out because the values are equal it is going to return no it is not equal even when the first value is greater it will say no they are not equal and as a result we are getting zero but what if my first value is actually smaller then in that case it will tell yes your first value is smaller and the vice versa happens when we use the greater than sign when we use the greater than sign if my value is greater it's going to return zero sorry when my value is actually greater it's going to return one and if it is not it's going to return zero now the next one is actually very important and you have to look at this which is less than or equal to greater than or equal to in this what we actually check we check two things it is going to give yes it is going to give yes and how we are checking num1 is less than equal to num2 and how exactly we will check when it is going to give yes in two conditions either the value should be small the first value should be small or equal it is only going to give no when it is bigger when the value is bigger or else it will give yes when it is small or equal let's have a look at this and actually utilize this so my 5 and 10 okay i'm going to check with less than and equal to less than and equal to because they are equal it is going to give me the value as one but what if it is lesser what if it is lesser will this also give me yes and yes we got one only in case when the value is bigger only in case when the value is bigger in that case only we will get no or zero or false otherwise we are going to get yes so it is checking two things it should either be equal or less than the same opposite happened when we use greater than equal to so it is only going to give us yes when the value is greater or equal it's going to give us no when the value is smaller so right now num1 is greater so it gave us yes let's change it to 10 and let's see what we are getting so 10 and 10 as they were equal we still got one which is for true now let's check if my first number is actually smaller in this case only we will get zero okay i hope you would have understood that next comparison operator is not equal to what does this not equal to do not equal to is going to tell you it's going to give you yes not okay let me just repeat that not equal to from num1 and num2 it's going to give you yes or we can say one when when the value is not equal when the value is not equal and it's going to give you no when the values are actually equal so 10 and 10 will give you zero any other number which is not equal is going to give you one let's have a look at this so here we will write the value as 10 and 10 and how do we write it not equal to one more thing 
please do not give a space between these two that will be considered as error so they have to be used together and that happens with all the operators be it an assignment operator or comparison oper operator whenever we have this together do not give any space in between them or that is going to give you or cause you the errors now let's check with 10 and 10 not equal to so basically this is going to give us zero but if we try this with any other number which is not equivalent to my next number it is going to give us one and that's how we get our result so practice all these operators and then you have to do one small task so what is the task task is to take three numbers three numbers and tell which number is greatest out of this so this is your task three number and tell which number is greatest out of this you will anyways do it in coming classes so why not to give it a try before you go ahead with these classes at that time it will be a revision for you so go ahead and try the task and tell us how you are going ahead with these lectures let's move on to the next operator which is logical operator and they are really logical so you have to put little extra brain if you have not taken a break take five minutes break and come back to us now let's get started with this logical operator and let's see what they got for us here if you see there are two and symbol we also call them as ampersand symbol okay then there are two lines which is called as or symbol and they are tough to find if you are new to your keyboard so you will be finding this in the qwerty line right after the curly bracket and you have to press that with the shift if in case it's not coming directly and then we have exclamation mark which is for not let's see what they are going to do they're just going to give you some logics between more than one condition so what exactly they are for let's go ahead with the and and they have a beautiful table for them so the table stands like 0 and 0 will be 0 0 and 1 will be 0 1 and 0 will be 0 1 and 1 will be 1 and now you would have understood by this that we are going to have more than one condition and then we are going to check it together with this and we are only going to get true if my both the conditions are true if my both the conditions are true and in this case we are going to do the same let's go ahead and try that out with our different examples with the and symbol you will actually practice them whenever we are going ahead with the next module or the next lecture which is going to be about the if else conditions let's go ahead and try this logical and and let's see how this actually works coming to our repellent we'll remove these codes from here to here and we'll also remove this old task of yours coming here what we need to do is we need to have two conditions so let's have two numbers num1 equal to 10 and num2 which is going to be your five very first we'll be starting with a very simple condition and then we'll slowly go ahead with one more advanced condition okay and we'll see how exactly this is making sense very first let's also have few more numbers int num3 equal to 15 okay int num4 equal to 20 cool makes sense now we are going ahead we are checking if your num1 is less than num2. Here, we, what we are doing is print f num1 less than num2. We are checking that. And for that, what do we need to do? Num1 less than num2. Aren't we going to do ampersand or the logical end? Yes, we are going to do that. And it's for the same. Just hold tight and look at this. Next, we are going to check for num3 less than num4 okay we are going to check that as well so num3 less than num4 and we will make it true and false depending on different conditions and then we are going to merge these two conditions together which is if both the conditions are true conditions are true so I'll write model as D and here I have to go ahead 
little bit more so i'll increase the space so that you can understand this much more clearly in the first bracket i am going to check num1 less than num2 num1 less than num2 and i will use and symbol or the ampersand symbol and then i'll check num3 less than num4 that's what we are going to do very first we are going to check it individually and then we are going to check it all together let's run this and see what do we get so num1 is less than num2 okay we forgot to use backslash n due to which it is giving us different trouble so let's utilize that and get the output in little lesser lines here we go and we will be able to put it till here so what does it say num1 is less than num2 which is 0 num3 is less than num4 which is 1 so we definitely need to change certain things in order to get and make both of them as one so now when both of them are one look at the table again when both of them are one we are getting one that means if both the values are true then only you are going to get true in the final call then only you are going to get true in the final call just remember this that we got one when both the values were one now let's make the second value or the first value false let's go with the first value false okay now when we run it it says my first value is zero second value is one so the total result will be zero so let's check with zero and one we got the output as zero so when any of the condition is false you are going to get false as your result now let's go ahead and test little more we will make this again 50 we'll make it true and we will make this one as false we'll make the second condition as false now let's go ahead and test this num1 less than num2 which is one that means that's correct num3 less than num4 which is zero that means that is incorrect and now what we got in the output is zero so if you look at this one and zero is again zero so you have to keep both the conditions true in order to get one what if my both the conditions are false what if my both the conditions are false now you will get zero and zero with both the conditions and the end result will also be zero so this is your logical and and this we will use whenever we have more than one condition to check can we go ahead and check three conditions definitely in that case also you have to check with a lot of different things 000, 000 001 and then you have to check with so many different conditions i will write it up 000 001 010 then 011 100 101 101 110 11 probably it will be like eight conditions which we have to work on and only this is going to give you the final answer as true and rest everything will give you as no why because in and condition you will only get true or one when all of my conditions are all of my conditions are true so that is what we have to follow and that is what your logical and says when all your conditions are true that is when you are going to get your output now can you try this with some other example yes definitely let's suppose you are creating a voting system uh, for your local area okay we mentioned that person should be greater than 18 years old and lesser than 60 years old now we have to check two conditions we have to check if the person is greater than 80 and lesser than 60. So in these conditions, you will use ampersand. We'll definitely go ahead and use this example. So we are moving to new replet. We will utilize and keep this replet safe for our next example, which is going to be your logical R case. Now let's go ahead and use C as the template. And here we are using logicals clicking on create and let's create this voting system example so let me remove this print f here we are having int age equal to let's suppose anything 18 or something very first condition is that it should be lesser than sorry greater than 18 and lesser than 16 so how exactly we are going to check 
print f eligible for voting okay so yes here i will write modulus d backslash n and then i will check two conditions my very first condition will be if my age is greater than 18 so with what i am going to write age greater than 18 and yes i can compare like that with any static value and second i am going to check with age less than 60 okay now you will be saying that you mentioned that age should be equivalent to 18 if you want to check that you know what to do you just have to add one equal to sign okay my condition is that age should be greater than 18 and less than 60 it should be from 19 to 59 okay and when this condition is true then only give us the value as one so let's go ahead and test this out so eligible for voting zero no if my age is 18 i'm not eligible for voting what about 17 and it's again a no i am not eligible for voting what about 56 that is falling in our age category and then makes sense yes you are eligible for voting so this is how you can go ahead and utilize these information with a real-time projects and real-time data and that's how we use coding and make softwares for different purposes okay now going ahead with the logical or operator which is double slashes not the slashes it will be like two lines okay that is what we have for logical or operators let's go ahead and check what does this do so this is going to check two conditions again and this also has its own table so zero zero will be zero zero one will be one one zero is one and definitely one one is one so this or or logical or is very optimistic it says at least one should be correct okay so let's imagine that your teacher gave you two homeworks okay and your teacher is now giving punishments to all the members who have not done their homework but your teacher was very sweet and that teacher said that okay i will not give you punishment if you try even one homework let's suppose these homeworks are math and coding okay so you have to tell me if the person is eligible for punishment or not let's suppose person a who has not done the math homework neither the coding eligible for voting sorry eligible for punishment what do you think teacher is going to give the punishment yes so it is yes but in our case zero zero will be zero that means zero means eligible for punishment person b coded math homework but forgot about coding teacher is very optimistic teacher is going to leave so one c 0 and 1, person C has done coding homework but forgot about math. So, teacher is going to allow that. Okay, now there is this genius, hardworking kid who did both the homeworks. And again, favorite of teachers, no teacher is going to give punishment to Mr. D, right? Let's go ahead and try this out with our example with the code. Let's go ahead and utilize this. The same example and let's see what exactly do we get. I will keep this value as 1, 2, 3, and 4. Let's check that out. Very first, all our conditions are true. 1, 1. So we got the options as 1. Look at this table. 1, 1 is 1. Let's make the first condition as false. Let's make the first condition as false. 0, 1 will give us 0. Oh, we forgot to change it to or. That was our mistake. So let's do that again. So 1, 1 is actually 1. And now we'll keep our first condition false. We'll make our first condition false, which is 10 is not less than 2. So my first condition will be false. Going ahead, 0 and 1. But look at the table. 0 and 1 is 1. What we will do is we'll make our second condition false. Okay, we'll make our second condition false. So 1 and 0 it is 1 again 1 and 0 it is 1 again now we'll make both the conditions false now we'll make both the conditions false 0 and 0 is absolutely 0 eligible for punishment and yes that's how we use your or, or logical or, or operator next is not and this is 
something which is very very simple it's just going to do one simple task it's going to change from 0 to 1 it will change 0 to 1 and 1 to 0 it's just going to reverse the result let's suppose this is our code okay and here what is the value of this num1 less than num2 so if it is 1 2 3 4 so is 1 less than 2 what do you think yes so it should actually give me 1 but now this is going to give me 0 for this okay do not worry about this thing this is working separately so this is something which we can remove this is not needed so here what we got is 0 what about num3 is less than num4 is 3 less than 4 yes but if we want to reverse that data as well will simply write this exclamation mark which is the not symbol and it's going to reverse your result there we go okay what will happen if i change num1 greater than num2 is my one greater than two no right but it is going to give you the option as one so that's how we reverse everything now the last operator is size of operator and let's go ahead with that so what size of operator is going to do is let me just readjust this and also readjust this now the last operator is your size of operator it's actually going to give you the size of any data type okay or any variable and it's going to tell you how much size that variable is going to hold but if you see we have used something called as lu what is that so that is actually unsigned int okay what is the meaning of unsigned int so normally when we give the value as int int we actually go from negative 32,638 something like that to positive 32,637. So this is how much we travel in negative and positive. So we can, that's an uh, example number. You can go and check the real time value. So this is how it is. But when we give unsigned int, when we give unsigned int, we are telling that I won't go in negative. I don't need my negative value. So why to waste this? data in the negative side so i will add this up in my positive side only and my new value for the unsigned int will be somewhere 64000 or 65000 i can go up to 65000 numbers okay that much value i can keep so it is just going to double your value but it is also going to remove your negative values we cannot consider going back to negative now that's only lu okay so now let's go ahead and use size of operator and get the size of different values let's suppose here we have num1 so let's get the size of num1 print f size of my num1 is i'll give colon modulus t maxless n and here i will write simply size of and there i can just simply write my num1 putting a colon and if you see we forgot to close one bracket of this that's why it would have given us the error now let's click on run to see what is the size of the int it is four bytes so whatever data you are getting it is in the byte form now let's make it to float and let's see what is the result and now float is going to store your four bytes let's keep it as double now let's see if that is making any difference and now it's going to be eight bytes let's check for one care value okay care and this has to go inside your single quotation let's check the size of care it is just one single byte so depending on different compilers depending on different versions of c it is going to take different different sizes so if it is giving you different result in your offline compilers do not get surprised because different compilers have different capacity for different variables just to avoid errors we may go for higher capacity of the bytes and in order to save your spaces like when you are using pro version of any ide where we have to save the data in that case it can give you two bytes in the int okay and here we were getting four bytes in the int that could happen do not get surprised so that was all about operators and its expressions i hope you would have enjoyed this video see ya in the next video Thank mm -hmm. you.
Hello and welcome guys. Welcome to this new topic or new module which is control structures. In this we are going to learn bunch of new things and which is going to be the uh, main core uh, C language thing which you want to apply in the real time, uh, real time softwares. So let's go ahead and see what are things which are present over here are if statements, else statements, nested if else statements, switch statements, for loop, while loop, do while loops, break and continue statements. So moving ahead in this video, we will be learning about the first three things, which is if statements, else statements, and nested if else statements. Rest of the thing will be followed up and is broken into different videos. Moving ahead, what is if statement? Use of if statement is to specify a block of code to be executed if the condition is true. This will not make a lot of sense unless and until we go ahead and see few things and practice this with the real time data. Very first, let me just tell you that all the if conditions work on the logical operators. Let me select the pen from here. All the if conditions work on the logical operators. And what are these logical operators or what are these comparison operators? Okay, so when we just go ahead and use double equal to sign, lesser than sign, greater than sign, or greater than equal to sign, less than equal to sign, not equal to sign, we get two things basically is true or false. So whenever we get these type of values, true or false, in all those situations, we can actually use our if conditionals. What exactly do we do with if conditional and where exactly do we write if conditional? So as it says condition, as it says condition, okay? So if certain actions, certain tasks are happening and we are going to do something based on certain conditions, that goes into condition. Let me make it much more clearer for you. Let's suppose it's a rainy weather outside and if it is raining outside, we have to take umbrella. So when are we going to take umbrella? When there is an action going on, which is raining outside, okay? In certain ways, let's suppose if you have $100 in your hand, then only you can buy certain stuff, which prices of $100. If in case you have lesser than $100, you won't be able to buy that stuff, right? So whenever these kind of situations come where we have to check certain things, we have to verify if that is happening or not happening or if that condition is true or false. In those situations, when the condition is true, we perform certain actions and that is done with the if condition. So what is the basic syntax of if condition and how do we write it? Let's go ahead and with that, very first we write the keyword if and then we put these parentheses. Inside this parentheses, we actually check our condition. And this condition could be anything. It could be raining, it could be the age, it could be the grades, or it could be anything. Even we can check if 10 is greater than two. This is also one condition, which we can replace this from. And then we start our curly bracket, either here or here, at any place you can start, and then we have to end our curly bracket. All the codes will actually go over here. All the codes will actually go inside the if condition. Let's go ahead and try this out with our code and check this. Very first, I'm going to have one variable int rain equal to zero. Where zero refers to as not raining and one refers to as raining. Now, if it is raining outside, we are going to take umbrella. So if rain equal to equal to one, the comparison operator, and we can also use the logical operators. So rain equal to equal to one, we will check if my rain value is equal to one or not. If it is yes, then we will execute the codes present inside the body of the if. What is the body of the if? We will get to know in real time. Just keep on moving along with the lecture. So what exactly we are going to say? Take umbrella and we'll give backslash n and a semicolon. Let's click on run and we will see there is no output. Why exactly? Because my condition was false. And whenever the condition is false, nothing is going to happen. What do I mean by nothing is going to happen is that no condition present inside the if will get executed. What will happen if it is true? 
let me just change this range to one and run this quickly it's saying us that take umbrella and why does this happen because of the condition was true so the code present inside the if statement i'm rephrasing this again and again code present inside those curly bracket will execute only when the condition is true only when we get the answer as yes and if we don't get the answer as yes on that comparison on those logics then our code will not execute that is what is if condition let me just go ahead and use the same example with something else hold on i'm going to take int age equal to 18. now i will simply write if i am greater than or equal to 18 i'm eligible for voting let's go ahead and check that if age greater than equal to 18 in that case what exactly we are going to do is print f eligible for voting dash less n and a semicolon let's go ahead and check this out and let's see what will be the output what do you think will be the output eligible for voting or no output let's run this and check it out so because the age was actually 18 or whenever the age is greater than 18 no matter how big it should be greater than 18 in those cases we are going to get eligible for voting but because of any reason if the age is not equivalent or greater than 18 in those situations it's going to print nothing which is present inside if condition and why am i rephrasing this again and again that present inside the if condition let me just go ahead and print have a print statement outside this if print f outside if condition that's less n and we'll copy and paste the same even here but condition and i will write part two okay let me just go ahead and run this what is my age age is actually 17 due to which my condition will be false so anything above or after the if condition is going to work anyways only things which are present inside the if condition will not get executed if i go ahead and put this inside the if condition then that will also not get executed and what is the meaning of body of the if or inside the if condition this is the starting point this is the ending point those curly brackets are the boundaries and if we are writing something within those range that is considered inside the body of the if condition and when that is going to work when we are making our condition true now very first as this was outside this will eventually work and let me just change this to part three outside if condition inside that we will change that to inside inside if condition part three and because my condition will be true where exactly here and that's why both the things both the print statement is going to work eligible for voting inside if condition part three i hope you would have understood what exactly is if condition let's get our example back for the rain and rain equal to zero if rain equal to equal to one we were saying print f take umbrella backslash n and semicolon and you will get to know why exactly i used it because we are going ahead and start we are going to learn else statement now what is the meaning of else statement as it was raining outside we said that okay take umbrella what if it is not raining outside what if my age is lesser than 18 i am not getting any values right so your else condition is only going to work when your condition is false when your if condition is not getting executed and one more thing this else condition will only come after the if condition and along with if condition this else condition cannot be used separately that's the beauty of the else condition let me go ahead and show you how exactly we are going to use with the syntax first and then with our code so very first we will have the if condition let's write that if we will have the brackets here we will write the condition and whatever that condition is we will close the bracket we'll start the curly bracket and this will be the code inside the if condition as soon as we are ending that curly bracket of the if right after that 
we will start our else condition and we will start our curly bracket why are we not putting any condition for the else because we don't have to else is only going to work if my if condition is false only when my if condition is false then only my else condition will work so what is the opposite of that we can have that sort of code inside this else basically the opposite of that okay usually we use it for all the opposites of if conditions now let's go back with the rain example and look how we can actually go ahead and have else statement in this now let me just simply use else give the curly bracket and have a print of a statement in this what exactly we are going to print don't take umbrella as simple as that don't take umbrella and why don't take umbrella because it is not raining and how do you get to know that it is not raining because rain equal to zero and because my this condition is not working this condition will only work when it is raining when my rain equal to equal to is one if it is raining outside then only my first condition will work else my second condition will work which is my else condition what will happen if i keep rain equal to one the else will not get executed only the first condition will get executed let me show you right now the rain is equal to zero which means it is false it is not raining outside and then it will say don't take umbrella now let me just change this value to one and show you that it is going to tell me that take umbrella there is no way it is going to tell me that take umbrella and don't take umbrella at the same time because either it could be raining or it could not be raining right based on those situations it is going to tell me whether to take umbrella or not take umbrella let me go ahead and use one more example so that you can understand this in a little better way here we will use the same voting example in age equal to 18 and we are checking age greater than equal to 18 eligible for voting else not eligible for voting if age is greater than equal to 18 print f eligible for voting that's less n else the opposite of that it will be not eligible for voting eligible for voting that's less n and a semicolon let's go ahead and run this because my age was 18 or whenever my age is greater than 18 in those situations it's not going to give me not eligible for voting it will only give me eligible for voting but as soon as my condition become false which condition this condition over here age greater than equal to 18 in those situations my if condition will become false this statement eligible for voting will not get executed it will go to else and the else part will get executed so not eligible for voting is something which we would have uh, we actually got moving ahead example is something good morning versus good afternoon and number is positive or negative so we are going to take those two examples in order to understand if else a statement good morning versus good afternoon let's suppose if it is lesser than 12 what lesser than 12 time then we are going to say good morning if it is greater than 12 if it is greater than 12 in that case we are going to say good afternoon let's go ahead and test this out we are going to test our third example which is good morning versus good afternoon so let's take int time equal to 12 like anything lesser than 12 is our good morning anything greater than 12 is our good afternoon so here we will write if time is greater than 12 not greater than equal to greater than 12 okay so anything which is greater than 12 in that case we will sorry anything which is lesser than 12 we are going to say good morning print f and it's a good morning morning there we go and a back lesson how could we forget that else if it is greater than 12 if my time is less than 12 it's good morning else it's a good afternoon good after noon and backslash n so let's go ahead and test this example very very quickly so we got good afternoon why because my time was sharp 12 it was not less than 12 
And if in case my time is anything greater, 13, 14, or anything like that, we will again get good afternoon. But what if my time is actually lesser than 12, maybe 11, maybe 10, or something like that? In that case, we are going to get good morning. So that is one example. I hope you would have understood the working of if else condition a little better. With the second example of number is positive or negative, we will be able to work ahead and we will be able to see this in a little better way. Though I will request you to pause the video and go try it out with yourself after understanding the logic behind it. So let's understand the logic of number is negative or positive. Negative or positive. So any number which is greater than zero is positive, right? So we will have the if condition, we will check greater than zero. Greater than zero. In that case, it will be positive. In that case, it will be positive. Else, if it is lesser than zero. Else, if it is lesser than zero, it will be negative. Even we consider zero as positive number, so we can have greater than or equal to 2000. Okay, not 2000, greater than zero, sorry. That was a mistake. Let's go ahead and try this out with this beautiful example of number positive or negative. Here we are going ahead with num and let's give the value as 56, a random value. We are going ahead with the if condition, if num greater than or if num is less than zero. Let's go ahead with that. If num is less than zero, print f, what exactly are we going to write? We are going to write that the number is negative. The number is negative okay and we will give backslash n else if anything which is greater than zero which is not less than zero it could be zero or greater in that case we are going to write what the number is the number is positive okay there we go now let's quickly run this up and what we got is positive but if we add a negative sign to it let's see what do we get so we got it as negative can we not do it as per the logic greater than equal to zero yes we can so let's try this out with greater than equal to zero if any number is greater than equal to zero we are going to do what we are going to print positive and if it is not positive definitely it will be negative so we are going ahead with the negative so here we go let's run this up and see what do we get so we got it as negative because it was negative 56 any number which is zero or greater we are going to get the number is positive so this is how we go ahead and work with if else condition now next is very very good and very better thing which is else if statement and when do we use else if statement what is else if statement we need to understand this much more clearly because this may confuse you a little a little so imagine when you have more than one condition here with if else we were only working with the dependent conditions or interdependent conditions where things were opposite of each other right but what if we have more than one conditions that could be a scenario right let me imagine that you have one great marks okay marks let's suppose you got 100 marks 100 out of 100 that is again a a grade mark what if you got less than 100 but greater than 90 in that case you are going to get b grade but what if the marks is lesser than 90 in that case you are going to get c grade if lesser than 80 you are going to get d, d, d grade so that is when we are going to use else if condition okay so whenever we have more than one condition to test out in that case we can use else if condition and let me tell you we can use as many else if conditions as we want the only condition is that it should be followed by an if condition sorry else if is going to follow the if condition only that means that we have to write first if condition and then only we can use else if condition otherwise we cannot use it the else is actually optional if you want to write you can if you don't want to write up to you okay so let's see 
the syntax of this though the syntax was already present over there but still let's have a look at this to understand this much more clearly very first let's suppose the grading system only okay marks is equal to 100 okay that's a very good student if mark or marks okay if marks equal to equal to 100 we are actually going to give a plus okay in that case we will give a plus we will actually print that now we have to check anything lesser than 100 but greater than 90 how do we do that do we really need to put two conditions and symbol do we really need to put that no actually i'll also tell you why exactly we don't need to put that so our next condition will be else if marks greater than equal to 90 if it is greater than equal to 90 and lesser than 100 in that case we are going to give a to our student okay what if it is lesser than 90 we can have one more else if condition okay and that's how the else if ladder will keep on going with the marks greater than or equal to 80 in that case situation we are going to give b grade and c grade d grade same on uh, similar to what we did over here in the very same way it will keep on going the ladder will keep on going till wherever you want to go you can even go till negative if you want that is your choice <laughs> by the way okay so we need to understand that why we didn't kept two conditions over here that the number should be lesser than 100 or over here why we didn't kept anything like the number should be lesser than 90 we only kept one condition which is number is greater than 80 so we need to understand the big reason behind it that is that it is going to follow top down approach from top to bottom so top to bottom approach and what is this approach is that it is going to very first check your if condition this is going to get checked for the very first time before even checking any other condition it is going to check that okay as soon as your condition is true hear me out very properly as soon as your condition is true it will ignore the remaining conditions it will not go there let's suppose your parent said that okay if you score 100 percent marks they are going to give to you maybe a mobile phone okay so if you get 100 you will definitely get a mobile phone and your parents said okay if you get anything below 100 but greater than 90 in that case you will get uh, something like a books maybe or lesser than 90 you will get uh, chocolate greater than 80 and lesser than 90 in that case what if you get 100 will they also give you books will they also give you chocolates possibly maybe but that does not fall under our situation that means we are only eligible for our what we are only eligible for our mobile phone so let's look at the example directly and check this out where exactly we can use else if ladder let's go ahead with the same thing same example positive negative in this we can also include zero so if i have to take a number and i have to tell if the number is positive negative or zero what will i do in that situation so i can simply go ahead and write if num equal to equal to zero i will go ahead and write a print of a statement and here i'm going to write number is zero backslash n giving the semicolon the next condition is going to be else if where what am i going to do is i'm going to check if number is lesser than zero my number is lesser than zero then i will write print f number is negative number is negative backless n and then what exactly we can check is else if num is greater than zero in that case we will check num is greater than zero and here we will write what number is positive and we'll give backless n and a semicolon let's check that right now the number is 10 if we give the click on run what do we get is number is positive and absolutely number was positive what if it is zero let's check that so right now the number is zero what if it is negative negative nine 
in that case it will print number is positive okay sorry number is negative now we can even reduce this code and we can replace this thing with no condition you will be surprised that why no condition and if you would have noticed here we didn't wrote any else condition right so if i do this you will be surprised like why no condition now because here the condition left is only positive if the number is not zero number is not negative what that number could be positive right so even without checking we can tell that in the else condition that the number is positive and whenever we have such conditions we can always keep that in the else part or if you want to remove else part we can easily do that let's go ahead with the good afternoon good evening and good morning example and here we will go ahead with the time keeping the time as maybe like 7 or 8 in the morning we will check if time is less than 12 in that case what are we going to wish print f good morning okay there we go that's less n and then we are going to check with else if time is lesser than six if my time is lesser than six what is six in 24 hour clock it is actually 18 so we are going to check with 18 and not with 6 because there we have to mention the am and pm as well so if it is less than 18 what exactly are we going to say we will say good evening okay we will say good evening and backslash n what extra is remaining else if we can keep that as well what extra is remaining we can either keep that in else if if it is lesser than uh, 24 time is less than 24 in that case what can we say sorry here if it is lesser than we can go ahead with one more example in the mid else if if my time okay let me let me just actually change it i will not confuse you we are good with the same example i will say good afternoon rather good afternoon and when my time is lesser than 24 i can actually go ahead and say good evening i won't be going ahead with the good night example and here again backless n and a semicolon right now my time is eight it's going to wish me good morning according to this condition let's go ahead and check that yes we got good morning now when my time is actually 17 which is 5 pm in that case it is going to give me good afternoon so till 6 p.m is going to say me good afternoon after that it's going to wish me good evening if it is 19 which is 7 or 20 which is 8 it's going to say good evening to me okay as we see that here we can also keep else condition why if it is not falling in this condition in that case my number will be like wrong time i would say okay if in case we are giving the time value as 25 so that will fall under wrong time category if it is going beyond we can keep that in the wrong time category anything lesser than 24 is good if it is 24 then we can consider it lesser than equal to with 24 and we can say good evening but anything beyond that will be wrong time we do not have 25 hour clock and this was one example moving ahead going with the student grade system we can change this project a little and let's go ahead with the grading example that will be your third program in the if else if ladder and here we are going ahead with the grade so we will have int marks equal to 100 on the top we will check if marks equal to equal to 100 in that case what exactly are we going to give to our students it will be a plus print f and we'll simply write a plus bachelor's n okay next else if if my marks is greater than 100 and lesser than 90 if my marks is greater than 90 greater than equal to 90 okay in that case what will happen we are going to give simple a to our student okay bachelor's n and why exactly we are not checking with the 100 as well that it should be lesser than 100 because it is going to follow top down approach if my condition of this is wrong then only it will go to else if which is the second else if 
and it will check if it is greater than equal to 90 it will check if it is greater than equal to 90 in that situation it will by default check the max is not 100 then it will be anywhere between 99 to 90 and then we are going to give a grade if you want to mention that you can even do that a plus grade and a grade okay let's go ahead with the next condition else if if my marks is greater than or equal to 80 in that situation what exactly are we going to give to our students we are going to give b grade okay b grade max less n and the same way you can keep on going if anything lesser than 80 i just want to give c grade and i want to stop till there okay anything lesser than 80 i'm going to give c grade and i want to stop till there okay so even if the students is getting marks in negative then they are going to only receive c grade isn't it good maybe so let's click on run and see what exactly are we getting we got a plus grade what if it is 99 in that situation we will be getting a what if it is 97 in this situation also we will be getting a because my first condition became false it will go and check my second condition which will become true and then it will escape the remaining condition as soon as this condition become true it is going to escape the remaining condition and we don't actually have to check the remaining conditions okay we now understood how if else condition or if else if else condition works we are good with this we now understand this very very well now something good is coming something big is coming in your way which will take a lot of attention from your side so increase your attention span if you want to take a break you can go ahead and do that let's go ahead and do the next topic which is going to be my not the ternary operator but the nested if conditions okay what exactly is nested if conditions is it going to form some sort of nest not exactly let's see what that is nested if condition when i'm saying nested if condition it is also applied to if else condition if else if else condition in short we just write it as nested if condition okay what does this line says is condition inside condition a simple line is condition inside another condition so what is the syntax of this basically we will simply go ahead and check the syntax and see how this could actually be done practically and where exactly do we need to write this okay so let's suppose we have a basic simple if else condition here our condition will be there if condition and this is our curly bracket this is my else condition okay and here is my curly bracket but you have something more you have one more if condition inside this if condition okay and that is called as your nested if condition okay you have one more condition inside your if condition or you can have one more condition inside your else condition whenever these sort of situations come in our way is actually called as nested if conditions can we also have else inside if yes we can so we can even have if and then we can have else we can even have else if when are we going to use these sort of things when we have more than one condition to test at this similar time when we have more than one condition to test at the similar time let's suppose let's take the rain example okay so what we will do is we are taking two variables one is rain and the second one is wind one is rain and second one is wind so what exactly do we need to do with that so if it is raining outside and if it is windy outside okay we are keeping both as one so if it is raining outside we can simply take umbrella and if it is not raining outside we don't want to take umbrella but what if it is raining along with some winds some high flowing winds in that case umbrella is not so beneficial or it's not up to the mark in that case we have to use raincoat so how exactly we can go ahead and do this let's try this out with the code actually i will remove this code and we will have int rain equal to one int wind equal to one we'll test this out now it starts with if 
rain equal to equal to one we'll simply check if it is raining outside or not print f we will say raining okay and in the next line in the else part if it is not raining else we'll directly print don't take umbrella okay don't take umbrella that was pretty simple the else part was pretty simple but in the if case we want to do something and what exactly do we need to do we want to check if the wind is also flowing it's raining it's confirmed if rain equal to equal to one it's confirmed that it's raining okay what if the wind is also blowing so if wind equal to equal to one in that situation what we have to print is print f wear raincoat okay we are raincoat as umbrella is not that worthy in winds whatever you want to write i'll give a backslash n and in the else part if the wind is not blowing okay we'll increase this size what if the wind is not blowing it is raining that's that is how we came inside that means by default it is raining that's why we are inside the first if condition in the second if it is having a fast wind in that case will be a raincoat else we can simply say print f take umbrella so this was a pretty simple example in these sort of situations where you have more than one condition to check you can easily put these things and make your code work Basically, we will not use nested if condition when we only have two conditions to check. When we have multiple more conditions and we have to keep on going inside. When we are making games, when we are making applications, like if it is uh, hitting the enemy with the sword, what if it is hitting the enemy with the bullet, what if the health is 100%, what if the health is 80%, 90%, or what if the health is lesser than 50%. In those sort of situations where we have multiple conditions to check and we have to go deep down into those conditions in those situations we use nested if condition so we are talking a lot let's run this example as of now both rain and wind is one so this is what we got we are raincoat as umbrella is not that worthy in winds what if we change the wind to zero what if we change the wind to zero so it will say take umbrella what if we change rain to zero it will say don't take umbrella what if you make wind to one but rain is still zero in this case it will not get inside this condition actually it will not check that it is raining so it will not be checking if it is windy outside or not if it is not windy outside it will directly print don't take umbrella and that does not matter if it is not raining wind actually does not matter a lot so it will say don't take umbrella and that was all about nested if conditions we are left with one more topic and the if conditionals which is ternary operator or it is also known as shorthand if condition and how does this actually work look at this it says variable equal to condition question mark then we give expression true and then we give expression false what exactly are we doing with this hold on so it's more like this let's suppose we have the rain example only I love this example rain equal to one okay we are going to check that if rain equal to equal to one okay we are going to check if rain equal to equal to one and then post that we'll put a question mark we'll put a simple question mark post that we are having two conditions first print a statement print f okay yes is second after the colon will be no after the colon will be no so what does it do is it is going to check if rain equal to equal to one if it is true hear me out very properly if it is true it's going to do what it's going to execute the first statement before the colon thing or if it is false if in case that is false in that case what it is going to do is execute the second thing which is after the colon thing okay then it can in that case it is going to print no then we also saw one more thing which was variable over here what was that variable equal to 
In this case, we can even assign values. If rain equal to equal to one, let's suppose we want to give the value as something. Let me remove this and remove this as well. If rain equal to equal to one, maybe cash, okay? I want to give cash of 100 rupees. Let's suppose I am betting to my friend that it is raining outside. If it is true, I will have to give him 100 rupees. So I will lose 100 rupees minus 100. But if it is not raining outside, I'm going to win and I will get plus 100 rupees, which is going to be 100. So that will get stored in the variable. So this is how it actually works. Let's work with both the things and see how it actually operates. So let's go ahead, the same example, I've removed these things. And why do we actually use it as it is called a shorthand? It gets executed in just one single line. Can we even go ahead with the nested if conditions? Yes, but that will be not that feasible. We have to keep on going and keep on pushing. And there has to be certain things which will make our code look really horrible. So we don't use it very often or we kind of avoid it. So let's go ahead and check that out. Rain equal to equal to one. We will put the question mark. We are having print of a statement inside that. Take umbrella. So this is the thing when it is getting true. Colon print F. Don't take umbrella. Don't take umbrella. And both will have backslash n. Let me increase the size. Both will have backslash n. And at the end, we are going to write this semicolon. Let's run this. And it says, don't take umbrella because rain was equal to zero. When we keep it as one, it will say, take umbrella because rain was equal to one. So when it is true, it's going to execute this line. And when it is false, it's going to execute this line. How will it work with the variable? We don't have to print something, no problem. We can just assign minus 100 or 100, okay? Minus 100 or 100. So if it is raining outside, you have to, you, you lost the bet from your friend and you have to give them 100 rupees or 100 dollars. So you will be uh, in loss of 100. So I wrote minus 100. Or if in case your friend is losing and you are winning, because you bet that it is not raining outside, in that case, it will be plus 100 to you. So we have to store this in some sort of variable reward equal to, reward equal to, and we can actually print this reward if we want to. That's how it works. I would ask you to give it a try and check if it works well and good. If it does not, you know what to do. So that's it in today's video. We will be watching next video on different topics. See ya, tada, bye bye, take care. Hi, and welcome to this beautiful topic switch statement, which is a follow up topic of control structure after nested if and ternary operator. Why exactly do we use switch? We are going to learn that, and how to use switch, we are also going to learn that. So, why do we exactly use switch? If you would have remembered or if you remember in the last example from the last video, we were doing something with the grades. We were doing something with the grades. And I stopped somewhere at grade C. I didn't felt like going ahead. Why? Because of the multiple else if ladder. And there I thought, okay, I am tired and I do not have to go ahead with that. Now, one thing which you really need to understand with this is that switch statement is actually going to replace and make my work easier and it is actually used wherever you want to replace your if else ladder if else not else but if else if ladder and while doing so we have to keep certain things in mind which are the limitations of the switch statement what are the minimum limitations or what are the limitations of such a statement that it is going to only work on one expression? What is the meaning of one expression that we can only pass one condition and it must have fixed values. It must have fixed values as well. Like if you remember the great example, we were taking the range from like 90 to 99. If we have certain situations like that, my switch condition is not going to work very properly. On the other hand, when the values do have multiple conditions to check, but it actually has one fixed value. Let's suppose day. We are going to take the example of day where it could be one, two, three, 
four, five, six, or seven, where one is representing Sunday and it's representing Monday and so on. So we are having this fixed value. In these situations, if we use if else if else, it will be a big and hectic task. So in these situations, we can definitely go ahead and use switch statement and that is going to make our work little simpler. So let's see the syntax of switch and let's also try with this day example. And can we use this when we have different conditions in the day-to-day -day life? We will also see that. So the syntax is actually very, very simple. We just have to write switch and inside the parenthesis, we have to pass expression on which we have to apply our condition, which is day over here. Okay, now the curly brackets will start. First condition could be case one, where the day value could be one. And here Y code will go. And then I also have to break the condition or else it will go to the next case automatically. If this case is true, it won't stop and it won't even check for case two, it will keep on going. What am I talking about? What is break? We'll get to know everything in this video. Let's go ahead. This is case two. Two is my second condition, your code and the break. At the last, we have default, which is very similar to else. If in case nothing is uh, verified, nothing is executed on the top, your default will work automatically. And that is again optional. So if in case you want to remove that, that will not make any change or that will not create any error. Let's quickly go ahead and use this switch syntax or switch statement to work on our program int day equal to one in the starting and then we are going ahead with the switch w s w i t c h and then we are going to put our expression which is going to be our day now when we are ready with our expression what could be the first value of day it is one so i'll write case and then one i will apply colons and then i will go ahead with my Think, what do I really have to do? I'm just simply going to print F, okay? If it is one, it's going to be Sunday, backslash N and a semicolon. Right now, I won't be keeping any break statement just for one thing that I really wanted to show what will happen in this case when I'm not using break. And then later on, I will be using break. This is Monday, backslash N, semicolon. Now, case three, print f this is going to be your tuesday backslash n semicolon case four print f this is going to be your wednesday backslash n and that case five this is going to be your thursday if i'm not forgetting the number of days i would say thursday Backslash n case six print f and here we are going to have the Friday backslash n and then case seven uh, oops case seven and here we are going to have the print f which is going to be our Saturday and Sunday is already covered so we will skip that part I made a small typo over here. So let's change that, print F, and let me put this as well. And then the last is going to be our default, where we don't have to pass any case. And if nothing from the top has worked, this is going to work. Where I'm writing default executed, backslash N and a semicolon. What will happen if I do not uh, give break in the mid? If I click on run, you will see that it's printing from Sunday going till saturday okay this is a small typo we'll change this friday to small friday okay this is a uh, code where we are running it and it is giving from sunday till saturday and also it is executing the default what will happen if i keep it as five so first condition false nothing will work second condition false nothing mm -hmm. will work it's not one it's not two it's not three it's not four it's five so from thursday to default executed it will put everything in the console that is what it does if my case is correct 
it's going to print that data and in order to stop there in order to not go to the next case we have to actually use this break so let me just copy this up and paste it after every single line here we go here we go here we go here we go and here we go we don't have to do that with the default now if it is 5 it is only going to give me thursday which is working if it is 1 then it is only going to give me sunday and nothing else have a look at this it's going to give me just sunday if it is 2 it's going to give me just monday so where we have this fixed value of the expression and when we have only one expression in those situations we can use this switch statement which is going to make our work quite easy imagine doing the same task with the if else if else condition this would have taken a lot of time to us what is default it's going to work more or less like else if i give any number which is not present over here in that case or so default is getting executed that it does not matched any of the conditions from the above case one is my d value equal to equal to one it will print sunday if not it will go to case two is my d value equal to equal to two it, if yes it will print monday if not it will go to the next is my d value equal to equal to three if not it will go to the next if yes it will print tuesday and the same it will keep on going and once it is reaching here it didn't found anything it is meeting the default and that will get executed when it will reach over here when it is not finding anything from the top let's suppose if we keep it as one or let's suppose if we keep it as just two it will check the first condition which is this it was false it will not execute sunday it will check the second condition case two where it is checking day equal to equal to two where the condition is yes it printed monday and because of this break which is over here it's coming out of this switch break is more like the car break for stopping something we are externally or forcefully stopping switch statement we will learn about this break anyhow after the loopings which will be in the coming videos so see you then take care bye bye hello and welcome to this new topic which is loops which means repetition in this we will see three things for loops while loops and do while loops in order to make it little easier we will be dividing this into two different parts. Very first, we will be doing for loops, and then in the second part, we will be going ahead with the while loops and do while loops. Let's look at the loops first. What exactly loops are, and why do we exactly, or why should we use loops? Okay, let's suppose you committed a mistake in your college, or maybe in your company, or maybe at your home. Okay, then what exactly your parents asked you to do is write sorry. 10 times i know that this thing is something which is uh, which rarely happens but imagine if you have to write sorry 10 times okay well you can even write some other things as well as many number of times as possible but imagine if you have to write sorry 10 times you will be able to write it right but what if you have to write sorry thousand times there there you are going to have some problem isn't it or imagine doing a work which is very similar with some changes here and there and it's repeated if you can automate that work don't you think that would be great so in all these sort of situations where repetitions are happening we actually go ahead and use loops okay we actually go ahead and use loops there are three different loops for loop while loop and do while loop but again at the same time they are almost similar to each other so i would request you to just focus on for loop first because if you understand that well you will be able to understand the concept of loop and will be able to easily understand while loop and do while loop that will make much more sense now moving ahead with the for loop loops can execute a block of code as long as a specified condition is reached imagine if condition okay uh, taking umbrella right it is done in the very same way but instead of if we are going to use for and taking umbrella is written 10 times or whatever you want to repeat is written 10 times let's see the syntax of for and then we will look at different examples we'll even solve different questions to understand them in a little better way 
okay so how do we go ahead with the for loop syntax is for here we pass three statements imagine that this is the statement one statement one then we separate them using semicolons this is a statement two and again separating it to the semicolon and then we have to pass a statement three it's sort of a mandatory to pass these three statements even if you're not passing it you have to mention that somewhere out or somewhere inside the for loop and you have to keep those semicolons if you miss those two semicolons it's going to give you the error and then we start with our curly bracket and here is a code which is going to repeat here is a code which is going to repeat how many number of times this code is going to repeat till my condition become false what condition exactly let's suppose i'm writing i keep on writing okay i'm writing i'm writing i'm writing till what time do i need to write till my homework is not done okay i'm writing till my essay is not complete i'm writing till my story is not completed so there i'm doing a writing process till my execution of the complete or completion of the task right i'm going to execute those things till i reach the end of my condition and i have a little better syntax with for the for let's go ahead and check that out very first we write for and very first thing is initialization initialization okay next is condition here we have to pass condition and the third one is updation third one is updation now close the bracket curly bracket and here is something which we are going to repeat this is much more clear now what is initialization we need to understand this is the start point this is the start point this is the condition we will keep on repeating till this condition is false okay keep on repeating till this become false if it is true keep on repeating if my condition is false stop what if it is false for the very first time don't do anything stop if it is false after one run that's okay do it for one time and stop what if it is if it is false after five times no problem do it till five and stop updation every single time we have to count let's suppose we are writing sorry 10 times we wrote sorry for the one time we counted one two three four we should have a check on how many number of times we are repeating and if we are really updating the value if yes that is how we will have to meet the condition that's how we will hit that position where my condition becomes false and i will stop let's look at this with a beautiful example of printing from 1 to 10 okay okay or printing sorry 10 times that will actually make more sense okay now i will simply write for what is my start condition what is my start point one so i will have to specify that int start equal to one semicolon till where i have to go till my start is equal to 10 okay so what will be my condition which i need to pass that it should be true till it is equal to 10 that is starting at one and it is true till 10 it is true till 10 so in that case what we really want to do is start is less than equal to 10 now if i am on the very first time one start is one is my one less than equal to 10 yes execute it and update it now my uh, content is written one time is it two yes two is less than 10 keep on going three yes four keep on going five keep on going like that let me just go ahead and have the updation every single time we write sorry one time we will update it start plus plus so we are updating it by one time in this we will have print f and we'll write sorry and backslash n okay let's see what exactly are we getting we got sorry 10 times if you really want to have a count on that as well what exactly you can do is have model as t and what exactly you can keep here is a number what that number could be start and every time we are updating that value so you will also see how that value is actually getting incremented from 1 to 10 how that value is actually getting incremented from 1 to 10 i know 
things are a bit blurry and you have not understood this. Let's do a dry run and see how this for loop actually works. So moving here, we'll write the for loop again. For and then the condition was in start equal to 1. Why start equal to 1? Because that was our starting point. And I want to keep this condition true till I reach the point 10. So start is less than equal to 10. And I need to update this value because how this condition will become true. Once I update it, right? Every single time it is printing something, I have to update this value. So start plus plus. Start plus plus. And now I will have my curly bracket. Inside this, I'll simply write sorry. So that you already know that we are actually printing it. We don't have to write the printf statement again and again. Now let's see how it actually works. How your condition actually works. Very first, your control flow or your code will come over here and will witness there is a keyword for. As soon as it sees that keyword for, it knows that there is a loop and it needs to repeat. As soon as it gets this condition, it is checked what is the starting point. It will jump from here to here for the very first time. It will jump from here to here for the very first time. It will check what is the starting point. It is knowing that the starting point is 1. After that, it's going to jump. The second jump will be towards the condition check. Second jump will be towards the condition check. It will check if my condition is true or false. Here I can get two results. I can get true or I can get false. If in case I am getting the result as true for this condition, I have to continue. I will keep on going. If in case I am getting the result as false, I will say stop for loop. Stop for loop or terminate the loop. Both the things are same. Terminate loop or do not go inside the loop. After that, do not go inside the loop. Just come out of it. Once it is done, the second time, if, the, if it is true, what we are doing is go inside, go inside the loop, go inside the loop. What is the meaning of the inside of the loop? Check the body and execute the code and execute the code similar to your if condition. Okay, this is what is happening. As soon as this thing is happening, let me just erase these other parts. So, as soon as we are coming in, what exactly are we doing? So, once this condition is true, let's check. My start point was or start value is 1. I kept the start variable as 1 and I'm checking is 1 less than or equal to 10? What do you think? Is it true or false? 1 is definitely less than 10, right? So, it is true. And once it is true, what we will do, third step will be to go inside. What is the third step to go inside and if you look at this what we have inside this is print f what we have inside this is print f and that is why your code is getting executed and it will immediately do what it will immediately check the statement the code and it is going to execute so this will get executed and sorry will get printed okay i will print it over here now the sorry got printed this is for the very first time okay this is for the very first time your sorry got printed now after this what will happen your code got executed it will go here the fourth time will be over here it will not go from second to there it will go for the fourth time over there and then it will update the value start plus plus what is now the value of start initially it was one start plus plus will make it two and after that it's going to jump not anywhere else it will jump to here this will be its fifth move and again it is going to check the condition and once it is checking is 2 less than 10 immediately yes it is going to give 2 is definitely less than 10 which is true so what will happen it will again come here and it gets what your printf statement this is 6 imagine this as 6 now it is going to do what at sees your print of a statement and then your sorry is printed then your sorry is printed now after that it will do what it will again go back to the updation this is going to be my seventh step
दिस इज गोइंग टू बी माई सेवेंथ स्टेप एंड विल कीप ऑन गोइंग फिफ्थ सिक्स सेवेंथ नाउ इट विल कीप ऑन रिपीटिंग फिफ्थ सिक्स सेवेंथ ओके फाइव सिक्स सेवन फाइव सिक्स सेवन फाइव सिक्स सेवन इट विल कीप ऑन प्रिंटिंग सॉरी 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 नाउ इमेजिन योर वैल्यू ऑफ स्टार्ट गॉट टेन टेन आई विल इरेज दिस डेटा आई विल इरेज दिस डेटा ओके नाउ योर वैल्यू ऑफ स्टार्ट बिकेम टेन आफ्टर मल्टीपल अपडेशन ओके योर वैल्यू ऑफ स्टार्ट बिकेम टेन आफ्टर मल्टीपल अपडेशन Now ten is not less than but equal to ten, right? Ten is not less than but equal to ten, which will give the input as true. So after here, it will check it is true. It will come here. It will execute for the tenth time, and for the eleventh time, when it is going up, eleventh times when the start value is equal to eleven, this will do what? This will change the start value to eleven, and now. when it is going and checking what checking what it is checking the condition which condition start should be less than or equal to 10 which is false now which is not true 11 is neither less than nor equal to 10 so your sorry got printed 10 times at the 11th time when the start value became 11 the condition became false it will come outside of the loop come outside of loop this is how your loop actually works as soon as the condition become false it will immediately come outside of the loop be it for the very first time if it is false it will not go inside if it is for the second time it will only execute the code and inside it one time okay now the second question is let's print 1 to 10 using our for loop my start position is 1 for int start equal to 1 as start is a variable so we have to declare it either we can do that outside or we can do it inside the for though it is advised to do it outside but to just make it simple we are going to do it inside only and the start equal to 1 i want to go till where let's suppose i want to print till 20 20 then i uh, start plus plus okay i want to update the value of a start start plus plus what do i need to do is simply model as d and backslash n what is my value which is getting updated start so i will simply print a start and it is going to print from 1 to 20 there we go if in case you want to print till 50 not an issue just update this number i want to go till 50 and it is going to print your values till 50 if you see it's doing your task and we got it till 50 good enough what is my next question print from 1 to n what is n over here n could be any number n could be any number so int n equal to let's suppose 300 so i am not going to change the value of this here again and again instead i'll simply write n over here next what i just need to do is update the value of n over here and it will print till there if in case i want to run till 300 it is printing till 300 if i want to print till 30 it is going to print till 30 what exactly i did instead of passing the numbers directly over here i passed a variable and i am updating the variable outside i did the task little outside and this is how we are printing from 1 to n now our next task is bit challenging and let's see if we can go ahead and do that n is any number okay n is any number okay and you will have to put a lot of attention in order to understand this n is any number and we have to print table of this number of this number table of this number we can find 5 we can put 2 we can put 3 and we have to print the table how exactly we should get the table 2 cross 1 equal to 2 2 cross 2 equal to 4 2 cross 3 equal to 6 this is how we should actually print the table okay it should go till 10 so in this case what is our starting point think as we are starting the multiplication from 1 our starting point will be 1 what should be the condition it has to go till 10 so my start value should be less than or equal to 10 and how am i going to get this 
because we have that in the variable n, I'm simply going to multiply n into i is n, n into 2i, okay, is 2n, simply like that, 1, 2, 3, okay, and when we are updating the value of i, 1, 2, 3, it is going to be 2n, 3n, and so on, and on, and on. So let's see how this will actually happen. Going over here, let's take the int n equal to some value, maybe like 2 in the starting. I want to run this for loop int index equal to 1. I do not want you to just practice with the start variable. You can keep any variable over there. Int index equal to 1. Index should be less than equal to 10. Index plus plus i'm updating my index value by one we can even go ahead and update this value by two if you want to index plus equal to two using the shorthand or if we, even you can write index equal to index plus two but we just need to increase by one so why to increase it by two now we have to print something we need to very first print the number what number n because very first it should keep on printing two 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 so let's just break it into small small portions and just print two multiple times what do i have to do is modulus d dash less n and here i just have to write index or sorry not the index but the n value and then it is just going to print two multiple times look at that it gave us two multiple times basically 10 times next is i want to print this cross next to my two okay sounds good right after d i'm giving a space and i'm keeping a cross let's see if you are getting two and crossed we got it sounds good enough what is that value okay we got multiple crosses as well what is that value which we want next we want any number which is increasing one two three four five and what value is increasing if you see what is that variable for which the value is increasing from one to ten it is just the index in that case we will have to print index as well and if we are passing index over there what exactly do we need to do yes you guessed it right modulus d because that's a number so let's go ahead and check this out 2 into 1 2 into 2 2 into 3 2 into 4 next is 1 equal to so right after modulus d we will give 1 equal to and let's run it it will also have the equal to value now 2 into 1 should be 1. So I have to multiply this n with the index in order to get my value, which was i. So I need to have the total sum over here, total multiplication. And again, as that will also be a digit number only, I can do it like that. And I can pass n into index. As that is a bit confusing, let's have that outside. I will have int multiplication equal to n into index every single time my index value is increasing and it is getting multiplied to my 2 which is n and i can now pass this over here what i can pass my mul or i can keep it as any variable whichever you want and let's see if you are getting the table of 2 okay what about table of 19 that is a tough one if it can give us the table of 19 as well there we go we got the table of 19 how exactly things are working very first it is starting from number one and going till number 10 and every single time it is updating by one here with what we did is we can even keep this here directly we don't have to do it separately we can even do it over here that is not going to make any change and you will still get the same table okay so just to avoid your confusion i kept it separately you can keep anything as per your choice whatever you think is easy for you here what we did we stored the multiplication of n which was 19 and index initially my index is 1 and after every repetition my index value is increasing to 2 3 4 5 so on till 10 and what am i doing here modulus d modulus d and modulus d and for that i have to pass multiple variables and in mid i can have any message bit x or equal to or even prashant if i want to print prashant in the mid you know that we can do that right so let me just have that prashant and run it so we can pass any variable in the mid or any value in the mid 
so why not x we can even pass x or we can even pass a star if you want to go ahead with that so here we go we are getting a star now okay so this was all about the multiplication table and the for loop i hope you would have understood this quite well in the next video we'll be learning about while and do while stay tuned see ya bye bye hello and welcome to this new video where we are going to start from the topic where we left we completed the for loop and uh data for loop is going to be your nested for loops so this is a bit tricky thing and we don't use it often but uh, most of the time where you are willing to go ahead deeper into loops and where the things are a little more complex there we are going to use nested for loops very similar to how we did in nested if condition let me just go ahead and tell you exactly where we are going to use these nested for loops and how is the syntax going to look like very first the syntax will start in a very similar way very first you will have a small for loop let's suppose here you are having int i equal to 0 i is less than or equal to 10 and i plus plus seems good okay and here we are starting the curly bracket now when we are putting one another for loop inside this make sure you are changing the variables we are not using the same variables or there will be some sort of ambiguity or uh, resource sharing problem will be there where it is going to update the variables according to its own choice and you may be in trouble okay so we need to ensure that we are using different variables for both the loops z equal to 0 j is less than or equal to 10 and j plus plus so this is how your nested for loop is going to look like loop inside loop do we have nested while loop yes we do do we have nested do while loop yes we do can we use while loop inside for loop yes we can so when exactly do we need to write these things okay i'll cover this up with a very simple example let's suppose i asked you to create uh, two tasks of repetition one that you have to go from day one to day 30 to your college you have to get up you have to brush your teeth freshen up dress yourself and then go to college that is one repetition okay i do this like go to college that's one repetition and inside college you are following up on the similar pattern you're following let's suppose a curriculum okay and you are following up from lecture one to lecture four okay if in case you have seven lectures it will be lecture one to lecture seven so in every single day you have those lectures and that is called repetition inside repetition every single day you are going to college that's one repetition and inside the college you are following up on same lectures every single time okay though the subjects could be different based on your timetable but we do have seven hours right we do have six hours of study time then after that four hours of study time we do have a lunch break we do have certain breaks which is repeated time after time day after day and that is what is called loop inside loop or repetition inside repetition let's quickly go ahead and see how this is going to look like with the very similar example of going to college and attending the lectures in that case what exactly do we have to do is we have to put a for loop over here okay let's go ahead and do this i want you to go till day 10 not till day 30 it will be a very big task int day equal to 1 semicolon day is less than equal to 10 day plus plus okay and inside this for loop you have lectures so for int lecture starting from one it should be lecture less than or equal to with, let's go with four lectures okay and lecture plus plus because you already understand for loop it's nothing tough for you to understand these two different for loops okay now imagine that they are running within themselves in this day one we are having one very important thing that going to college printf waking up okay waking up backslash n 
printf getting ready backslash n printf going to college and then inside college whatever you do is going to be inside your going to college going to be inside your internal for loop i'm going to skip that part and then you will come back from college okay come back from college backslash n that's it now if you simply run this nothing will happen it will just print like that we started from day one waking up okay let me have one more thing here i'm going to have breakage of the loop with the lines and backslash n backslash n what it will do is it will just break the things up so that you can actually see how things are happening okay so waking up waking up two times three four five six seven eight nine and ten let's reduce this to five or it will be very very complicated for you we are just waking up for five days okay so waking up waking up waking up waking up waking up just five days you are waking up now inside that you are going to follow up on let's suppose four lectures or maybe just three lectures let's keep it as three okay and with this i'm going to use backslash t for printing this data what is backslash t it is one space okay it is one space one extra tab space which we are going to give in order to show that this belongs to the college lectures and it will be little bit shifted nothing else nothing extra okay this comes under escape sequence we'll anyway see that in coming classes let's look at this normally this is going to not make any difference just going to shift your line of print by something okay it will create some sort of gap let's go ahead and have printf okay and in this maybe you are following up on lectures okay different different lectures and that we are going to update okay taking lecture taking lecture and then we are also going to mention what lecture exactly you are taking and we will mention that with the lecture over here cool now you will be thinking that okay it is very similar where is backslash t don't worry i'm going to include it right in front of this i'm going to include that in front of it okay let's see how this is looking are you ready okay let's go ahead so i just kept it as one single loop inside my inner loop and let's see how this is getting executed so did you see that so waking up getting ready going to college inside college you're doing three repetitions taking lecture one lecture two and lecture three then coming back from college again you woke up get uh, you got ready you are going to college then you are taking three lectures you came back to home again got up you took three lectures again you came back to home so these sort of conditions where we are going ahead and utilizing one more repetition inside in the repetition in these sort of situations we go ahead and use nested for loop or nested loop in some short depending on different conditions we use while do while for for with while while with for and so on and on and on so i hope you would have understood this nested for loop by now let's go ahead and look at a different variety of loop which i'm talking from way long which is while loop and when exactly do we use that we're also going to see exactly when we are going to use that let's go ahead with our slide and then let's slowly increase our pace now what is while loop is it something different than for loop no is it not doing repetitions no it is doing repetitions can it perform all the task of for loop yes can for loop perform all the task of while loop absolutely not and why not i will tell you can this perform the task of for loop yes so why do why don't we use while loop and why are we using for loop because in while loop the chances of errors are little bit higher because things are not organized that is number one second while loop takes little bit more time than for loop to execute because it is finding different things at different places updation is there initialization is there and also different things are there but it's not placed inside one bracket okay so it has to check where exactly do we need to go and that is why while loop takes little bit more time to execute than the for loop and that's why we tend to avoid it so when are we going to use while loop that is a big mystery question right okay so when we have or when we want to perform a repetition when 
we want to perform a repetition a repetition until the task is done until the task is done or the condition is met okay now you will be thinking like oh what is that okay let's imagine one container okay you will understand this while loop pretty well i'm very sure of that let's imagine a container okay this is a container cool and you have to fill this container i'm very bad at drawing it's definitely not looking like a container i will delete it i do have shapes option i will actually import those shapes okay so this is going to be your one shape this is going to be your second shape and then we have certain lines which i'm going to draw where's my pen option okay here are the lines i'm connecting uh -oh, which is weird okay let's not experiment with this <laughs> and i'm going to draw that line with the pen only okay so this is the container for you and you have to fill this container with the water water of what water of this pond okay this pond is filled with water this pond is filled with water actually so you have to fill this container using a glass using a glass a simple glass okay when i'm giving you the fixed condition that okay mr xyz do one thing do one task that take 10 glasses of water from the pond and put it inside the container here we have a fixed value i'm asking you to repeat that fixed number of time i'm asking you to do that that okay do it only 10 times okay where you know that my number of repetitions is fixed where you know your number of repetitions are fixed repetitions are fixed in that case we will use our for loop we will use our for loop on the other end i asked you mr xyz what you have to do is you have to keep on pouring the water like take the water from the pond and put it inside the container like keep pouring the water unless and until the container is filled you'll be like i don't know how many times i have to do that exactly when you are not sure about the number of repetitions when you are not sure about the number of repetitions number of repetitions and you are dependent on a condition and what is the condition over here that the container should get filled when you're dependent on the condition to happen when the, when you're dependent on the condition to get meat or when you are waiting for that condition to uh, get completed in those situations we are going to use our lovely while loop okay while loop in those situations only we will be using our while loop okay i hope this would have made a lot of sense and this is a good example now i'll give you one more example i asked you okay uh mr xyz or miss xyz what you have to do is you have to take only 10 steps okay you have to take 10 steps you will keep on count counting okay step number one two three four five six seven eight nine ten you are there right and you'll be like okay you will turn back to me and you will say that okay mr prashant i took 10 steps it's completed i'll be like okay cool enough but on the other hand i ask you that you have to go from point a to point b and you have to tell me how many steps you are going to take you will not have a fixed number you are going to guess absolutely yes in those situations where you don't know what is the exact metric and you are going to make a guess when you're not sure about the number of repetitions you are going to follow when you're not sure about the number of steps you are going to take in those situations we use while loop i hope this would have made a lot of sense now let's see what exactly is while loop and how does it look like i'm keeping here while and inside the parenthesis we put one condition and what is this condition it is the same condition we were talking about on which we are dependent 
the work to get completed and then it is having those curly brackets and inside this we are having our code but one more important thing as this condition is over here and we do not pass anything else how exactly will you know from where to start and where are you going to give that start point that you have to start from point a where exactly are you going to give that so that will be outside your start point will be outside it has to be there outside and your end point will be there where inside sorry your updation will be inside the while loop this has to happen inside the while loop so this is the exact and complete syntax of while loop and using this we are going to do multiple tasks very first we are going to print our name five times or ten times let's see how that could be done so let's come over here and remove this example of four if in case you want to store that you can either keep it in comment or create a new file i don't need it so i will be deleting it now let's go ahead with the while while i am going to count okay that i have to print my name five times so i'm going to count while my count should be less than equal to five from where am i exa exactly starting or what is the what is count to this if in case i just go ahead and write printf prashant mishra and i'll give backslash n and if i simply run it will say uh oh that's an error i don't know what is count if you see over here it says use of undeclared identifier that's correct and when it is not knowing what is the value of count how is it going to start and that's why we said that your start point should be outside of the while loop let's go ahead and put that over here my count is starting from one i'm starting my count from one if i'm going to print it one time then i only i'm going to update it for the second time okay once i will print it one time and then i'm going to update it the second time let's see how exactly this is going to work there's one more error that we have not yet given int in front of it now let's see how exactly this is going to work and if you see this is keep on going this will never stop our condition is never met count is less than equal to five and this condition is never going to match and if you see on the console side it will keep on going and why exactly that's happening because of one simple thing that your condition is not meeting is one less than equal to five yes it printed prashant again it went up it checked the condition is one less than equal to five yes it again printed prashant so when is it going to stop so we missed one thing which is updation and if you miss your updation or if in case your condition is never going to get true it will go in infinite loop this thing over here is called as infinite loop where your condition is never met and your loop is running continuously for eternity not till eternity basically your uh, replicator will get crashed and if you're running in your system your system will get crashed okay and even if i try to stop it you will see that it is going to take more than usual time and it will keep on printing so in order to like stop it either i have to keep on clearing the window and then it is going to stop little faster or else it may take one minute or two minute or three minute to stop the conditions which are processed already but because your system got slow it wasn't able to like print all those things second i can do is i will have to go and start a new replet that will give me a new virtual space and there i will be able to code basically i think this is not going to stop till we talk so let's it's better to like go ahead okay it stopped so it's better to not run these infinite loops and use the updation as well now we are going to update the value every single time i am printing prashant misra i'm going to update my value count by one and this is how it will only print prashant misra five times this is how your while loop works now you will be confused so let's do a dry run on this to understand this in a little more better way like how exactly this while loop works now when we are going ahead let's go and use the same example here we used int count equal to one which is my starting point which is my starting value and i mentioned the condition that count should be less than or equal to five it is like okay i'm good i am less than equal to five and here we are starting our curly bracket which is good inside this we are printing something which is print f prashant mishra
okay and now we are even updating the value count plus plus so now let's see how exactly this is going to work in dry run how exactly this is going to work let's take the orange color very first it will come here it will check okay int count equal to one it got the value of count so whenever it is used later it now knows the value of count and it is not going to give the error that what is count and then it's going to the next line checking the while loop it is checking while it got the keyword while it understood there is a condition which i need to check and if there is no condition that will be error so immediately it will jump over here immediately it will jump over here it is going to check the condition it's going to do what it is going to check the condition and when we are checking condition there are two things either the condition will be true or the condition will be false if in case the condition is false it will directly terminate the loop it won't go inside it will terminate the loop okay it will not go inside it is going to terminate the loop but if in case your condition was true in that case it will come inside if in case your condition is true count is less than equal to five one is less than equal to five yes or no yes one is less than five so it was true it will come inside and it got a command of printing prashant mishra on the console screen and then it will go to the next code count plus plus it updated the value of count by one now count value became two and then what will happen because there was no other code it came back here and the same thing will repeat okay the same thing will repeat it will keep on following this repeat unless and until your condition becomes false unless and until your condition becomes false okay this is how your while loop works if in case you want to understand this one more time i'll ask you to go back and watch the recording again so that you can have a better clarity of how while loop actually works now going ahead with a different example next example is printing from 1 to 10 printing from 1 to 10 inside while loop so how exactly do we want to start what is the start point the start is equal to 1 that is from where we are i need to start while my start is reaching less than equal to 10 i want to go till 10 so here exactly i'm going to write my last value till where i want to go till where i want to reach so it is going to be my end point start is less than equal to 10 and every time i go is one step ahead i'll increment the value of a start and i'm simply printing it my current value is or current value of the start is current value of start is model as d max less n here we are going to print your start and then we also have to update it start plus plus semi colon and let's run it it printed current value of start is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten as soon as it became 10 for the next time when it is going up and checking the condition for the start is 11 less than equal to 10 the condition became false and it stopped what will happen if i write something outside while loop end of code max less n will this get executed let's test this out and end of code is getting executed what if you want to start this at 11 my starting point point itself is 11 it will check in the very first go that it is 11 less than equal to 10 where the condition becomes false and what will happen your current value of start will not execute and it will directly go to the last value basically it is going to skip your while loop and then the last value which we have behind or below your while loop is going to get executed which is end of the code and this is how your while loop actually works now if you remember we did something like printing the table with the while loop let's go ahead and do that challenge with the sorry printing the table with the for loop let's go ahead and do the same challenge with the while loop now our next challenge is that we are going to do we are going to print the table of any number so let's take that number over here in num equal to something i'm going ahead with the five that's my favorite number you can say and while and i also have to go with count so i have to take one more variable because i cannot reduce i cannot change my five 
right? I have to keep on multiplying with the one, two, three. So I definitely have to take another number, which is count equal to one. Okay. And while my count is less than equal to 10, why 10? Because I will multiply this from one, five into one equal to five, and I'll reach till five into 10 equal to 15. So till there, I need to go. And what exactly am I going to print? Very first, I'm going to print this num. I want to print this num five times. Okay. So let's see if this is coming. So model as D backslash N. And I simply want to print num. Basically, we have divided that problem into different, different tasks. Very first, we will be printing five, 10 times. Okay. It will go like that. We are printing five, 10 times. Let's go ahead and do that. And let's see if it is actually getting printed 10 times. And how could we forget the updation? count plus plus let's go ahead and do that usually we will be updating that value only which we are keeping in the condition and that is how your condition will get met or else it's not going to meet okay so five one two three four five six seven eight nine and ten next is i want to get x or star whatever you want to keep okay i want to get that next to five Let's go ahead and keep that. For that, I just have to write x over here and I'll run it and that will be present in front of you. Next is, I want to get the value 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and so on. So what's the value which is increasing from 1 and going till 10? If you see, count is that value, right? So I will write with a space modulus d and because i am keeping one more modulus d i will have to increase the number over here and i have to keep here count i have to keep here count so let's see what do we get five into one equal to five now we just need one thing which is equal to we got that thing now we need equal to and as equal to is just a message you know what to do you will go back and put one equal to right after the modulus d and you are going to get that value 5 into 1 equal to now you just need the exact number or the multiplication 5 10 15 20 25 okay and how can we get that so we can directly multiply num into count or we can even keep this out in certain variable let me just go ahead and do this and then we will do it in outside variable as well so it gave me the value of or table of five let's do this in the outside variable num into count i'm going to keep this inside the result value and here i'm going to create my int res equal to this and this is going to do what this is going to give me the same exact value let's go with the table of six and there we go so we actually completed this concept of running the while loop along so running or making or printing the table along with the while loop and now with this i am hoping and supposing that you would have understood while pretty well and that gives me the opportunity to go to the next concept which is do while now what is this do while and why is it even there do we use do while I will say very rarely in softwares or uh, those situations are very rare where we are actually going to put do while. Why exactly are we learning it? Because it is equally important and <laughs> whenever those conditions are there, uh, do while actually makes a lot of sense instead of putting your for loop or while loop. Okay, seems like uh, a good thing. We should definitely learn. Now, let me go ahead with the do while concept. The only difference between while and do while is that do while is very optimistic. It's very positive. What happens, what happened in the while loop if in case we were giving the conditions wrong that count is we are starting the count value from 11. It will not print anything. If you go ahead and check that, it will not print anything. But your do while is very optimistic. It's going to run at least one time. Okay, that is the beauty of your do while so do while is going to run at least one time okay let's see the syntax very first we write do we put the curly bracket and here we are going to check the while with the condition 
and here we will have these semicolons as well cool and here will be our major code let's suppose if you want to print your name 10 times let's go ahead and give that i will have the count value as one which we generally keep and instead of this we are going ahead with the do while do print f prashant mishra and i want to print this how many times well count is less than equal to 10. let's go ahead and check this if it is actually working this is how your do while works oh my goodness we forgot to update <laughs> and that usually happens whenever we are in so much hurry that sort of situations may arise and we even have to update the value inside it only count plus plus okay let's check that value and let's see if it is actually printing it 10 times or we can do one thing let's also have modulus d over here so that we will also have a check if it is printing for the right count and it is printing till the right count instead of going ahead and checking that uh manually going one two three four it's very bad right we can just do a modulus d and we can actually print the count value so what we are getting over here is prashant one prashant two prashant three prashant four five six seven eight nine ten awesome working like a normal loop yes but what if i keep it as 15 where the condition is false still it is going to work at least one time okay where exactly do we need these kind of situations where uh, we need your program to go and run at least one times let's suppose i asked you uh, okay mr xyz or miss xyz what you need to do is uh, you need to check if the school is open you need to check if the school is open let's suppose there's a notice on the school board that the school is going to remain closed for the next one year probably due to covid 23 24 i'm not sure <laughs> also that does not come and that is a notice which is present on your gate how will you get to know unless until you go there in these type of situations you actually have to go there at least once visit the school at least once and check if there is a notice like that and if yes then in those situations we are not going to school for next one year two years till whatever time you notice is there okay so in those sort of situations we use do while loop and it comes very handy especially when we are working uh, with the softwares and when we are dealing with the exceptions this is fabulous this is going to work little extraordinary because we are checking that exception in the while condition and if there's any exception we are going to stop it and how we will check if there was any ex exception we are going to run it but something should be visible to the user as well right like error 404 or maybe like error 502 something like that so their do while is actually very very good now moving ahead we have something very important for you which is break and continue there are two things break and continue and which we are going to learn so in order to understand break and continue actually we used break one time in switch statement if you remember what it was doing was uh break was actually kicking us out from the switch statement so <laughs> the same meaning is here as well break is just going to kick you out out of while loop or for loop basically we use this break inside uh the loops and whenever this break statement is coming we just stop the loop or terminate the loop we just finish it off okay whenever this is meeting so let's understand this with a very simple example okay and i'm sure you will be able to understand break with lot more clarity now i asked you that okay mr or miss xyz you have to go towards the east okay and you have to buy me a pizza okay there are five pizza shops on the way this is one this is two this is three this is four and this is five and as you have to save your time what you are going to do is you will go in the very first pizza shop and you are going to check if there is pizza available and if yes and you got the pizza are we really going to check with shop number two, three, four, or five? No, right? In these type of situations where my condition is met, I do not have to go further. We break the loop. And how do we do that? With a break statement. And because we were checking the condition over here, so break will always come with a 
if condition only so let's also put one more condition if condition is required in order to utilize your break in order to stop your loop if you are putting the break without the if condition it's not going to run if it is meeting for the very first time or it is if it is present at the end your loop is going to work only for the one time no matter what and there's no point in running the loop only one time or zero time so that's why we keep this condition right what is continue okay i will explain in the same example and then i will go ahead with the code let me just erase this okay okay now i asked you to bring me pizza you checked in shop number one you checked in shop number two there were no pizzas okay let me just repeat that again you checked in the shop number one you checked in the shop number two and there were no pizzas now this shop number three is a stationary shop and you know that you won't be getting pizza over here are you going to check that shop are you going to waste your time over there no right because you know that you will not get pizza over there so what you will do is you will just skip this shop and this skipping of iteration or skipping of repetition is done with continue where break was terminating the loop stopping the loop stopping the search stopping the repetition continue is going to just avoid one single repetition that is what your continue will do it is only going to avoid your one single repetition and in that case and because we were checking with the conditions in that case this will also come with the if condition only and we need to make sure that it is present above all the codes it is present above all the codes and why am i saying that let's suppose my first command is go in the shop and check now my second command is check if it is a pizza shop so you already went to the shop you asked for the pizza and then you are checking if it is a pizza shop or not will that any will that make any sense no right so my first command will be if it is a pizza shop or not if not we are going to skip it totally right so that's why keeping this continue on the top is going to make sense keeping it at the bottom of the code is not going to make any sense and that is all about break and continue let's look at the examples with the numbers because we love playing with the numbers just go with the code what we are going to do over here is we want to print from 1 to 10 okay start equal to 1 and we want to start with a for loop shall we go with the for loop or while loop let's go with the while loop because we were learning while loop and we will also do this with the for loop as well while my start is less than equal to 10 okay now i need to update this start start plus plus and before that i even need to print it print f i am printing from 1 to 10 okay remember so value modulus d backslash n and here exactly i'm going to put my start okay what this is going to do is this is going to print from 1 to 10 simple sorted let's suppose we got to know that my condition is meeting at 5 i'm getting my pizza at shop number 5 and i want to stop if i see shop number 5 okay so what i will do is if if start equal to equal to 5 okay i'm keeping this print f statement inside or let's let's not keep it inside okay let's keep it outside only i'm just telling that if my start equal to equal to 5 i'm going to break it off i am going to break my loop okay now if i run this as soon as the start value is 5 and this condition become true it is going to break even this is not going to work you won't see 5 coming up there okay and inside this we can tell before the break okay before break because after break nothing will work print f break condition was met next let's end let's go ahead and test this out and at value 5 it says break condition was met what if we keep it as 8 you will see it is printing till 7 and it is stopping at 8 so wherever your condition becomes true right after break whatever is down below nothing is going to work 
okay that's how your loop actually works that's how your break actually works this is your break now talking about continue if in case we are talking about continue let's change this to continue let's suppose you just want to skip number eight in that case what will happen anything below continue will get skipped only for that repetition only for that repetition now check this out it's going continuously and why exactly it is going continuously we have a very big reason and what is that reason that this start plus plus is not meeting and because of this the loop is going infinite times the loop is going infinite times because when it became eight after that it was always eight it was never meeting start plus plus was never happening okay so in this situation we can have start plus plus over here just for one time just for one particular time and then it's going to run just for the eight break condition was wet so i'll change this to continue con continue condition was met and the loop was skipped continue condition was met and the loop was skipped okay just for number eight if we are going with number five the same thing will happen with number five it is just going to skip that particular iteration if you see that thing is not getting printed it's going to skip that particular iteration that particular repetition only after that everything is going to work what if this condition is going to be true multiple times in all the values where this condition is true if it is true two times in a loop if it is true 10 times in a loop it's going to skip that particular iteration that is going to skip that particular iteration let's suppose i told if it is even don't print anything in those situations it is going to completely skip let's go with the for loop and check this out for and i equal to 1 i is less than equal to 10 i plus plus here we won't have that start and end problem that is start plus plus is not meeting because everything is present inside the for loop okay if i modulus 5 equal to equal to 0 here my condition is if any number is divisible by 5 if you find any number which is divisible by 5 stop the loop i'm going to have a break over here and stopping the loop print f not point f print f stopping the loop backslash n with a semicolon if it is not there i'm simply going to print that value model as d backslash n as well how could we forget that and we are just printing i what exactly we are doing over here is if i modulus 5 equal to equal to 0 that means i'm checking if the remainder of any number is 0 that means if any number is divisible by z uh, 5 and it is giving us the remainder as 0 in that case we will stop the loop because we are using break otherwise keep on printing the value of i which we are increasing from 1 to 10 let's go ahead and check this out 1 2 3 4 and 5 so as soon as we got 5 it was divisible by 5 because 5 divide, divided by 5 is leaving remainder as 0 and there your condition became true your break was met and it got stopped cool now let's check the condition for continue now I'll remove this if condition what will happen if it was continue if i modulus 5 equal to equal to 0 if in case any number is having divisibility by 5 if any number is divisible by 5 and leaving the remainder 0 in that case what are we going to do is we are going to skip that iteration okay we are going to skip that iteration or let's do with the 3 because we have multiple numbers of 3 if any number is divisible by 3 we are going to skip the iteration and how do we write it continue so it will do what it is going to print your 1 2 3 is going to miss 4 5 6 is going to miss 7 8 9 is going to miss and 10 in case you want to print something instead of that you can go ahead before continue and have a print of a statement as well repetition or iteration miss mix iteration missed and what is the meaning of iteration the same thing repetition okay 
one more thing that we have to use backslash n or else it will have certain issues in printing alteration missed missed and missed why it was missed because my condition was true and it got missed now we have very important thing i hope you would have understood break and continue quite well if not you have to just watch the recording back and check it out one more time practice it along with me pause the video practice it multiple time increase the number decrease the number and that's how you will learn taking the input from the user this is my favorite thing and which you will rarely find uh, on top of any course because we are going ahead with the numbers i thought okay let's learn this right now right here so that we can take the input in the console window from the user and what do i mean by that so let's suppose you want to take the name and age input from the user so how do you do that we are going to learn that okay we are not going to enter the name of the user we are not going to enter the age of the user we are not going to tell that we only need to run from 1 to 10 we can run from 1 to any number and that number is going to be given by the user so how do we take input from the user is using this scanf modulus d we are going to use scanf to get any number from the user we also have f gets but that is used only for strings and that too for a special kind of a string okay so what is the syntax scan f and here inside the quotation very similar to how you used to print for integer we will use modulus d for other things like float we will use modulus f modulus c modulus lf for double and so on and on modulus s for a string yes and we will have a comma separated let's suppose we want to take input in the age so we will just use ampersand symbol in front of it that's it it is very similar to the printf it is just having one extra ampersand symbol which will not go for your modulus s rest everything is going to have ampersand only your modulus s will not have the ampersand let's go ahead and test this out We will remove this code. We want to get the age. Int age, leave it like that. Okay, int age. Next, what do you want to get from the user? Int name. Sorry, not the int name. We have to get char name. Okay, we also have to mention the size. Like how much size do we have to take? Let's suppose I just want to take the size of 10. It can only contain 10 characters now. So for the betterment, let's have 100 characters because we will not go beyond 100 characters for the name. And that is the maximum value which we want to take. Because we also have to avoid wastage of memory because it is sequence of 100 characters which is going to take 100 bytes of memory. Okay, remember that. Now, we are going ahead. Int age is done. Care name is done. Now, let's go ahead with the marks. Okay, float marks. And this is going to be a decimal value. What else we can go ahead and take that? Mm, grades. Okay. So, char grades. These are the few values which we want to take input from the user. Now, we want to give a scanf. Okay. We definitely don't want that. As it was age, I'll write modulus t. And here I will write ampersand of age. And I simply want to print the age very fast. Okay. I'm really, really curious to show you this age equal to modulus t and i will also have a backslash n and here i just want to give age first one is scanner second one is printf let's see how this is going to work if i run over here you are getting a blocker if i write it as 89 so it says your age is 89 can we give a message inside a scanf like if you want to take age, can we put that over here? Like enter your age. Mm -hmm. Enter your age. Okay. That is what I want the user to do. So it is going to do what? It's going to throw the error. Though the error is not coming over here. But it usually throws error. And if you see, it is giving me the garbage value. So either it is going to throw error or it's going to give you the garbage value. So we can definitely not do that if in case you want the user to know that you are asking the user to enter something we have to give in a 
separate print of a statement like enter your age and i'll give a space like that and now user will be asked to enter their age it will come like this enter your age i will enter that 89 and now it shows us age equal to 89 and in a very similar way we are going to ask the user to enter different different things now we are going to ask the user to enter the first name only enter your first name okay and then scanf modulus s comma name then print f what is next modulus okay we want to ask the user to enter the marks enter your marks this is scan f and here we will give modulus f comma and percent of marks okay now let me just have a spaces so that you can see how different things are taken as input print f what exactly are we going to take enter grades okay and here we are going to have semicolon and now we are going to take a scan f modulus c and percent of grades and now we are going to print that data how exactly we are going to print okay this is the age we are going to print of the name name modulus s and here we are okay we also need to give backless n and here we are going to give what we are going to give the name print f and here we are going to give your marks m a r k s marks modulus f y f because it is present in the floating value and here we are going to give marks next is what exactly do we need to give we need to give the grades grades and this is modulus c and backslash n and what are we going to get over here is your grades so let's get this and hit on run are you excited for this program i'm not sure but i am really excited to show you this enter your age let's suppose i'm entering my age as 70 my name as prashant what will happen if i give my full name instead of prashant mishra you will get to see that and okay enter your marks here we made some sort of mistake i guess mm -hmm. enter your marks that was not took let me rerun it 70 pm enter your marks okay i would have entered that I would have pressed one more enter by mistake and the age is 70 name is pm and marks is okay it's not taking me my grades something is wrong with the applet i can tell that and the applet do make these sort of mistakes sometime enter your first name i'm writing my full name over here m i s h r a and right now it didn't ask me my marks grades and all those things okay but not to worry about all those things it is just making the mistake your commands are absolutely correct and that is how you are going to get your input and that is how you can get something one more thing which i would love to show you that is when i entered my name as prashant mishra it is giving me one problem it's giving me one problem and what is that problem that it's not printing my full name okay if i simply give it as p or prashant without spaces then it may consider and that could be one reason of it to give errors that i was putting spaces marks 67 and it's not asking me to enter the grades let me put a decimal value age 6 pm marks 6.7 and it's not asking me to enter grades definitely there is some sort of low char with this marks and decimal values but this is how we take actual input and this is how we take input from the user and using this you can go ahead and do multiple programs now one thing which we need to understand is that how do we get that full prashant mishra so if in case you want to store this you know what to do but next is how to take full string input if I just go ahead and write here care name and here I give like I want to store maximum of 100 characters 
char name of Android and I want to get that as input print f enter your full name or enter your full name and I give one scan f where I'm giving model s s not like that model s s and then I'm asking the user to enter the name which is name and let me just print f print f your name is your name is and then I am giving my name name okay let's see how this is going to work and if it is actually going to work let's run it it says enter your full name I will enter Prashant Mishra and it says your name is nothing okay so definitely it is having some sort of issues with these spaces if I okay I made a mistake I guess modulus is name scan f where exactly am i making oh okay i'm making a mistake over here i forgot to give modulus s in the print f and now it will give my answer prashant mishra and it is giving only prashant so that sort of problem actually occurs in your c program that it cannot take spaces all the special characters including spaces is considered as escape sequence inside C program. So how do we actually get the input? That's one thing very, very important. So for that, we use F gets and F gets is actually going to give me my full name. So this is the overall syntax F gets the name where we are going to take our variable or that variable name, the name which will pass. Then size of this is the same size of which we are going to pass. We don't have to change anything. We have to pass name and then stdin. Let's go ahead and try this out. Instead of scanf, f gets, here we are giving our name, comma, size of name, comma, stdin, and we will also close the bracket. And this is how we take input, and we are simply willing to print our name. Let's see if this works. Prashant Mishra and we got it as Prashant Mishra and now you can even get your full string inside the input from the user. So that's it from my end in this video. We'll be meeting you again in the next video. Till then, bye bye. See you. Tada. Hello and welcome to this new topic which is arrays and this is going to be a very beneficial topic if you are going to prepare for your placements because this is the starting of data structures and this is a highly valuable topic for advanced programming and for placement questions. A lot of questions are going to be based on arrays and if you understand this well this is definitely going to be very very helpful in your future jobs as well as your softwares because it's storing the data and whatever stores data is actually important because all your softwares websites applications are meant to store data now how is it different than variables so arrays are more like a special kind of variable okay we'll write it over here what are arrays a special variables and what is the speciality about this variable that it can store more than one value. It can store one or more than one value. Okay. Now, what does that mean? Let's suppose you want to keep the record of your students. You are the monitor and you are asked to keep the record of your students of your class. And there are possibly, let's suppose, hundred of students. In that case, what we will have to do is we have to create variables and we have to create how many variables you will have to write name one equal to name two equal to name three equal to and you will keep on going like that. But array solves your problem. What we just need to do in array, we have to create a simple list and we just have to follow the syntax and this is going to solve your problem. How the array will look like let's suppose if you are creating it for uh, some sort of strings and we are naming it as students okay we are naming it as students it is just going to look very similar to like this prashant this is the first name which i want to store subham this is the second name which i want to store 
Daniel, this is the third name which I want to store, okay, Daniel. And it will just get separated by comma and we don't have to store these names like that. Then you will also have one question that uh, in variables we can take the input from the user. Can we do that same with your arrays? Yes, we can. So what is this array? This array is nothing but a special type of variable which can store more than one value in contiguous memory location. Now here I'm using one word which is contiguous. Okay. So what is the meaning of contiguous? Let's suppose one int data or integer type of data takes four bytes in your replicate. Okay. It take four bytes. There are certain rows of memories. Okay. A, B, C, D. Maybe your phone number. Okay. It is one, two, three, four, five, six. If this data is taking four bytes of memory to store over here, let's suppose you just want to store day or date. Let's suppose. Okay. Let's keep it very simple. One, two, three, four, five. There are multiple things like that. You just want to store this date. If the first value is at 2120D, if your first value is getting stored at this memory location where 2120 refers to the byte and as it is taking four bytes, where will this data go? It will go adjacent to this but next to four bytes. So it will be 2124D in the column D after four bytes. This value will go adjacent to that 2128D. So they are not continuous. That means they are going to take four bytes of memory. They are going to fill four cells of one byte, but they are adjacent to each other. And that is the meaning of contiguous. And that's how they store data one after the other. And that's how they don't even need uh, the reference like where my data is going because they are storing the data in just one single cell Okay, or in the contiguous memory location So they do not have to worry about where my data is going They just have to take care of the first memory location and as it is going to store similar type of data It will just go to the next 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 by adding those number of bytes. Okay, can we store different type of data? No the condition of array is that it has to uh, belong to one data type only if you want to store integers it should be belonging to integers only if you want to store a string in it it is going to give you error if you want to store float to it it is going to give you the error so all those things we need to keep in mind now let's go to the syntax of array and how does it look like so very first we are going to mention the data type so let's suppose if you are creating it for the integer we will write int and then we will give the array name let's suppose i want to store age i give it as age in here i will give my square bracket equal to followed by the brackets which are curly brackets and some numbers and they are different numbers so let me go ahead these are your curly brackets inside this we are storing the age let's suppose 20 22 21 23 27 these are the different ages of different people and we store it all together okay now this is good how do we print that will be a question right so it's better to go ahead and practice that rather than talking here on theory we'll quickly go ahead and open our replit and here we are going to create age square bracket equal to curly bracket and here we are giving multiple values 1 2 3 4 5 6 okay and at the end a semicolon now you will also see one more thing at some places you may see there is a value inside it there's a value inside h square bracket what is that it is saying that we can store total of six elements here we are giving six elements and we can store total of six element what will happen if I give here five and if I want to store six elements that is going to give you the error that we cannot store that value. Okay, if you're trying to put that, that value will get lost if it is not giving you error. Some compilers will give you error, some will not. But if it is not giving you error, that value is not going to get stored and it will be lost. It will go anywhere. It will not get stored basically because we are not giving that space. Okay. 
So let's suppose you're going to a movie theater, okay? And you just have five seats vacant, but your six friends, where the other friend will be sitting, right? He won't have his own seat. Even if you try to share, the sheets are very thin, you won't be able to fit in. So either you have to adjust in one seat or uh, that person will be lost. He won't be able to uh, sit anywhere, okay? It is very similar to that. Let us remove that and now this is working good. Now we gave this size. This is good. Now we can even put that number or even if you want to remove that number. One question is there, what if there are more number of seats than the number of friends? That is accepted and we can store further values in the future. Extra seats are accepted. We can store further values in the future. So it is always advised to keep greater number because once we are assigning the size, that could not be changed later. If you are creating a movie theater with 50 sheets and uh, there's no extra space left to add on to or install more chairs, it's going to have trouble, right? So that's why it is advised to keep a greater value than the required number so that we can utilize that space in the future if we need it. If you don't, let's not waste a lot of memory and let's keep it very close to our required data. If you are keeping it as 50, it is going to take 50 into 4 bytes, which is going to be 200 bytes. Okay. And that will actually waste a lot of data. That's why we should avoid taking extra spaces. Okay. That's one thing. Now moving ahead, how do we actually print the data? How do we actually access the data out of arrays? It's good that we stored the age, but what if we want to print that age? So we use something called as indexing now what is this new term prashant that that you are introducing these new terms arrays indexing commas sizes different things what are these things don't worry chill after like towards the end of the video you will have a lot of clarity what these things are and we will slowly move ahead with one one topic and we will uh, remove the clutter we will remove the confusion from your mind moving ahead indexing is nothing but the counting Indexing is nothing but the counting and you'll be like counting. Okay, it's simple. We can start the counting from here. One, two, three, four, five. Cool. Very smart. But indexing is something which starts from zero. Okay, so you have to start counting, but definitely from zero. You'll be like, okay, cool. I'll remove the counting. And on this time I'll start counting from zero. And let's check. So we are going ahead with zero. This is zero. This is one. This is two. This is three. And this is four. Is that correct, Mr. Prashant? Yes, that is absolutely correct. So indexing is very similar to counting, but it's, it starts from zero. It's not counting, but it is very similar to counting. It starts from zero and it goes till n minus one. What is n? The size of the array. Let's suppose you have five. It will go till four only because it is starting from zero, right? It is occupying that one space over there. It's very similar to that. And how do we get the data? So if in case you are having the array name as age, so you just have to put zero over here to get the first value. This will give you the first value. If in case you want to get the third value, so you just have to write age of two and this is going to give you your third value. Mr. Prashant, is this actually going to work? Let's check that out. It's better to test rather than believing me, right? So let's go over here and use printf. Give model as d because it is one integer type of data and backslash n definitely. Why do we get backslash n? To get the data into the new line, to get the output in the new line. What is the array? Each will give a square brackets and zero to get the first value. Let's see if this is giving us the answer as one. Here we go. Okay. What if I keep this data multiple times? Okay. Let's do it only for four times. This will have one. This will have two. This will have three. Let's do it. And this will give zero, one, two, three, four. What if I give over here a value of four? Okay. Instead of three, can I give four? Yes. You don't have to follow the order. So it is giving one, two, three, and five. So if I see over here, it will only go till four. What if I use something like 10? Will that also print something? So definitely that is beyond our 
uh, given index and if you are going beyond our index but that size is present inside the array so it is by default assigned with zero so what if you are giving the size only as six what will happen in these case where we are not having 10 sizes in that case it will still give you zero because somewhere it is knowing that we are going beyond our limit so instead of giving you the error it is giving you the value as zero because that is not present with us and it is very similar to false instead of giving errors it actually gives you false value okay that is not the value of zero but it is giving you the false value that it is very similar to null it's very similar to like i don't have that value okay it's very similar to that now moving ahead this is good can we just put the data over here how can we assign the data don't worry we will go through them one by one let's change the value that is one thing which we are going we are going step by step and i want to change the value of three three is at which index zero one and two so age of two equal to now i want to give it as 99 now i want to print f model as d backslash n not b backslash n and here i want to print age of two you will see that this has now got updated to 99 the actual value of the age got updated can we change all the values absolutely yes you can change all the values in a very similar way okay and let's go ahead change 0 and 1 as well to 98 and 97 and now let's print them as well this will be 0 and this will be 1 let's see what is the difference of these things it's giving you 99 98 and 97 99 98 and 97 what are the values which were assigned this is how we change the values of the elements of the arrays elements okay moving ahead what if there are so many students let's suppose i have hundred of students do i have to really print it like that do i have to go ahead like that and print every single time no absolutely dear we can use loops in order to get the data just by writing one single line so what are you saying mr prashant can we just simply go ahead and uh, get the data just by putting a loop let's check that out let's suppose i have multiple values over here okay and i won't be going in the order i have 45 67 89 87 65 44 33 22 11 and so on and on and on okay so i have these values and i just want to get that so one two three four five six seven eight nine let's have one more value and make it total of 10 and here i'm going to give it as 10 now in order to print this data just by using a simple loop i will start in i from what from zero why zero because my indexing is zero and then i will go till where till less than 10 because i have to go only till 9 okay so it will go less than 10 and i plus plus here i is referring to the indexing and i want to print f model as d backslash n comma age of zero or one or two what exactly can we pass we can actually pass the value i which will increase from zero to one to two to three to four and it will keep on going till 10 and that is how we can print the entire loop just by using one simple for loop and that is where your arrays are very handy okay so 45 67 89 87 65 44 33 22 11 and 12 it will print in the very same order in which it was stored okay this was good can we also change the value using looping why not to try it out so just try to change different values and change it with the loop and let's see if you can do that okay going ahead setting the array elements so can we do that let's check that now instead of printing the values what i am going to do is let's suppose whatever values i stored i am printing that value and post that i want to update these values i have 
a broken uh, line which is just a divider okay suppose that i want to run the same loop so i'm just going to copy it same room same loop running from 1 to 10 and this time i want to update the value of age of i to what i want to keep it as i into 10 okay i want to keep it as i into 10 so for the zero time it will be zero for the first time it will be 10 then 20 then 30 then 40 then 50 and it will keep on going till 90 and then let's print this array and how exactly are we going to print it using the same for loop copy and paste let's see what do we get in the output what exactly i did you need to understand this so what i did over here age of zero when the i value is zero is of zero equal to i into 10 what is the value of i it is zero so zero into 10 0 into 10 equal to 0. So, age of 0 is going to store 0. Age of 0 is going to store 0. Age of 1, when the next loop is working, when the next iteration is working, i value got incremented to 1 and age of 1 equal to i into 10, which is 1 into 10, which is 10. For age of 2, it will be 2 into 10, which is 20 and will keep on increasing. And when we are printing this value, we are getting what? We are getting 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. And that's it because we have total of 10 elements. Now you must be wondering what if I want to store the data from 1? No problem at all. Here, what you can do is i plus 1 and keep that in one bracket. Keep that in one bracket. Now for the zeroth time, it will be zero plus one into 10. So one into 10 will be 10. Next time, one plus one, which will be two into 10 will be 20. And instead of zero, 10, 20, you'll be getting 10, 20, 30. And that is the difference which you are going to get just by making changes inside your expression, inside your equation. And that's how we get 20, 20, 30, and that's how we set the values in the arrays. Now, let's move ahead, taking the input from the user. What if you don't want to store the values of 10 users or their age by entering it by default? What if you want to take it from user? Test this out. So what we will do is, we'll remove everything. We want to store data for how many members? We want to store data for 10 members. Okay, sounds good. So we'll write int. Let's suppose you want to store, uh, okay, let's go with age only. Let's not confuse you. I want to store for the 10 members. I'll simply write it like this. Int age of 10. I'm creating a space for keeping or storing 10 data. I cannot change this space later on, okay? So make sure you are keeping little bigger size than required. Now you have to go, let's, let's have a print statement, print f enter the age of students backslash n and now we will have to use for loop we want to get for 10 members so int i equal to 0 i is less than 10 because it will start from 0 and go till 9 that will be total of 10 members how exactly look at this 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7, 8, and 9. So 1 to 9 is 9 plus 0 is 10. Okay. This is total of 10 numbers, including 0. Now we went ahead with i plus plus and we want to get the data. How do we get the data from user? Scan f. And because this is an integer value, model as d. And then what are we going to do? Ampersand age of i. And that's how we get the data. And how do we print it? The same loop for int i equal to 0, i is less than 10, i plus plus. Instead of scanf, we are going to have printf modulus d backslash n. Here we are going to give age of i. We will just not put ampersand and we will replace scanf by printf. And here we are going to print your data. Printf students, students data that's less n okay that's how we are taking the input in the user and we are storing it 
for age of i which will be age of 0 we are scoring and we are putting it which is very similar to age of 0 equal to the data which is given from input as from the user okay we can either do directly or we can do it indirectly how can we do it indirectly that we can take the input in some sort of variable let's suppose the variable is num and we are doing a scanf for this num okay oh, oh i'm sorry we just took this variable num okay and how do we take input in a variable not array in a variable so scanf modulus d m percent of num now user will be entering this data right so age of 0 equal to num we can even go ahead and do this indirectly but that will be a bit lengthy method in order to avoid this we are directly putting that value of age of i right so that is how it is now coming in just one single line okay i hope you would have understood that now let me remove this part which is not required and let's print the data we are entering for 10 members so let's enter some random number 7 6 8 3 5 8 7 6 9 1 and a student data is 7 6 8 3 5 8 7 6 9 and 1 it will be present in the same order and that's how we take the input from the user okay so we actually now know how to take input from the user so let's solve this question take five marks from the students english hindi science coding whatever and then give the average marks obtained or the percentage is code okay this will be a fun question what exactly we are going to do is we are going to have marks we are going to have marks and how many subjects we are going to ask the user to enter is five we are going to ask the user to enter five subject marks okay so we will be running the loop for int i equal to zero i less than five i plus plus enter all the subjects marks here we will have that in the printf enter all the subjects marks okay backslash n and let's do one very good thing we will even put the print of a statement in it we will ask that enter the marks of subject one okay enter the marks of or let's let's simply write subject one subject two okay here we are writing subject and then modulus d for the number backslash n and i plus one why exactly i plus one because i is zero for the zeroth index i want to give my first value i want to give my first value that subject one not like subject zero if i give their i it will be like subject zero but i want to give it as subject one and let me also have this space let's not give that backslash n because backslash n will do little bad it will actually go to the next line which i don't want i plus one and there we are going with this scanf in the very next line and here we are writing modulus d and what exactly we are getting from the user is we are getting the marks we will be storing that in marks of i and as that is an input we have to put m percent as well putting a semicolon and using the same thing to just print the marks okay for int i equal to zero i is less than five i plus plus let's put the marks print f subject modulus d and here i want the data uh, which will get printed subject one and then i want to print marks subject modulus d which will be subject one marks which will be again modulus d i have to pass there two values one will be i plus one and the next will be marks of marks of i okay so this is going to do our task and here we can have backslash n let's see what this is going to do enter all the subject marks first one is 67 next one is 56 next one is 89 next one is 99 and it is 65 
So subject one is 67, 56, 89, 99, and 65. But this was not our question. <laughs> My question was, you have to get five subject and you have to print the aggregated value. You have to print the average value, okay? So instead of printing these subject marks, which we want to remove, what we want to give is total average value. So here, I will do what? Int total equal to zero. Int total equal to zero, which I want to get as an input. What exactly I will do is int total equal to zero and I'll keep on adding total equal to total plus marks of i. Total equal to total plus marks of i. So all the marks 67, 56, 89, 99 and 65 will get added and will go inside the total as we have seen that in the previous example. Okay. Let I will also do a dry run of how things are working so that you will be able to understand things in a little better way. So at the very end, I just want to print the total average marks. So print F average marks is more or less D and we are not printing the decimal values. Okay, so total by five, total by five and that will do our job. Because we were having total 5 marks, 50s, okay, that was 5. That is going to reduce our total, okay, 89, 90, and 78. So the total average marks is 72 because of the subject one where we got failed and we got only 5 marks. That was not my fault. I immediately pressed enter after that. So the total average marks is 72. How I exactly went ahead and solved this question let's look at this program and do the dry run here itself very first what i did is i took a small array and i gave the size of the array to be five this is how i am taking the array and i'm giving the size of that array as five because we just need five subjects we are not going ahead of that Okay, in that case, we just give it as five. Next, we give a printf where it is saying enter all the subject marks. Enter all the subject marks. So let's separate that as well. Okay, so we'll come here, we'll hit enter. Now we are running a loop. Uh oh, we made a small mistake. Okay, that mistake is gone. Now we have one for loop. And because total we have how many subjects? Five. So we will go from zero to i less than five. I not equal to five. I less than five. So zero, one, two, three, and four. I should not be equal to five. And we are going ahead with those five values starting from zero. Why zero? Because my indexing starts from zero. Because my indexing starts from zero okay that's why we go ahead from zero okay cool good enough inside that every single time we are printing print f subject model st i plus one so for the zeroth value of i it will be zero plus one it will be reflected as one for the first value of i it will be one plus one which will be reflected as two for the second value of i, it will be 2 plus 1, which will be reflected as 3. So because we don't want this 0 over here, we are adding 1 to it. And that's how we got 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 inside the console. Let's remove that as well. Right below that, because we are not giving backslash n. So right below that, I can actually ask using a scanner that enter the value of marks of i, which is starting from zero so i'm putting the first marks as here i mistakenly gave five that was not my intention and as soon as i hit enter because we are hitting enter over here that's why it is going to the next line automatically it's going to the next line and that's why you will see i have not used any backslash n inside this because again in order to give that value we have to hit enter to go to the next line yes so that is what we did we hit enter we went to the next line and I entered my second value, third value, fourth value, fifth value. As soon as I hit enter, my this loop is completed. After this, my this loop got completed.
what we are doing post that as we really wanted to calculate average so what exactly we are doing is we took a variable total in which we will add all the marks together taking out from the array okay sounds good sounds like a good plan initially total value is equal to what we kept it as zero now we ran the loop from zero to five which will be for zero one two three and index four it will start from zero and it will go till index four now i mentioned here total equal to total of marks of i which will be very equivalent to zero plus marks of i which will be zero in the starting i value is zero so marks of zero marks at index zero is five so zero plus five so total value will become five in the next go my i value will increase by one it will become from zero to one okay and we will run the same loop total equal to total plus marks of one and what is the marks of one 99 so what was the last value five so we will take this over here five plus 99 it will be equal to one not four okay cool now we will go to next value where i value becomes one more and becomes two here i value was one in next it will go to two and in that case again we will run the same expression total equal to total plus marks of two in this case what will happen what is the current value of total 104 from the past and what is the marks of 2? 89. So 104 plus 89. And that will aggregate to somewhere. I'm not sure what that value will be. But I guess it will be 293 if I'm not wrong. So that will be your total value. Sorry. 193. I made a small mistake. It will be 193. So that will be your total value. And that's how we kept on adding. And at the very end. We divided it by 5 that is how we find average and we got our total average marks this is how we went ahead and solved this simple question in array okay now let's go to our next topic okay so next is two dimensional array and that is something very very big and it is equally confusing as well so you have to give little extra attention over this what is 2d array are we going to two dimensional three dimensional four dimensional things possibly yes now look, let's have a look at this let's suppose you have a matrix if in case uh, you would have learned matrix in math how you actually go ahead and write that matrix so this is how your matrix look like here you will have the first value second value third value fourth value fifth value sixth value seventh value eighth value and ninth value this is a three by three matrix now if you see what we did over here is we have rows and we have columns now it is present in 2D. We have rows and we have columns. Now, in order to get these type of data, we actually have to use 2D array. Okay. So how do we actually write it? That is one very important question. So let's suppose you are having the matrix. And the matrix is 3 cross 3. So we will keep it as 3 by 3 equal to. How do we store value? This is my external bracket inside this i'm going to pass my first row one comma two comma three this is done i will keep a comma and i'll pass my next row four five six and i'll pass my next value seven eight and nine and i will end my curly bracket but printing this value will be a real drama okay now let's see what things are over here Let's suppose this is a 3 by 3 matrix. It will look something like this. Okay. Here, if I want to keep my first value, it will be 0 and 0. It will be 0 and 1, it will be 0 and 2. Then next value will be 
वन जीरो वन वन एंड वन टू नेक्स्ट वैल्यू विल बी टू जीरो टू वन एंड टू टू वेयर योर फर्स्ट वैल्यू रिफर्स टू एज आई एंड द नेक्स्ट वैल्यू रिफर्स टू एज जे आई सेट इट वेरी नॉर्मली एंड इन ऑर्डर टू प्रिंट दिस विद कोडिंग इज गोइंग टू बी really tricky in this situation we have to print two values okay and we have to take care of two variables which is i and j and if you see this is one repetition this is my second repetition and this is my third repetition inside this i am making one two and three repetitions and inside second value also i'm making one two and three repetitions for the third again we are doing the same one two and three repetitions so when we do repetition inside repetition that is a case of nested loops in order to get this type of data or in order to print this type of data what we really have to do is let me just remove all of this thing and have a small matrix int matrix of 3 by 3 equal to 1 comma 2 comma 3 comma 4 comma 5 comma 6 comma 7 comma 8 comma 9 this is my simple 3 by 3 matrix in order to print this i have to go ahead with the for loop with i int i equal to 0 i less than 3 i plus plus why till 3 because my i value is going just to 0 1 and 2 so it should be less than 3 so 0 1 2 less than 3 i only need to go till my 0 1 2 for i value and inside this i am going to have my j value int j equal to 0 j is less than 3 j plus plus and this is how we print the data print f and here i am going to pass modulus d and what am i going to write matrix of i comma j matrix of i comma j so it will do what it will keep on printing the data now i will do what i will give a space over here and once this loop is over i will then give a new line and then give a new line okay i am not giving a new line over here so it should print 1 2 3 1, and then go to 3 4 5 sorry 4 5 6 and then go to next line 7 8 9 9 okay i want to get the data like that so 1 2 3 Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now you must be wondering why exactly I wrote it like that. Okay, so if in case you want to access data presented this value, let me just convert this into a matrix form so that you will be able to relate better. And then I'll again go back to code so that you will be able to love the explanation which is coming from here. So this will be one. This will be two. This will be three. Then four, five. Six, seven, eight, and nine. Let's suppose you want to access this data five. So how exactly you will be doing that is matrix of what is the i value one, what is the j value one, and that's how you will access. Let's suppose if you wanted to access this eight, how exactly will you do that? Matrix of Two of i and y value, sorry, j value will be one. So two and one. It is going like that. So how exactly this is working? We are doing the same thing for the value of i. Look at this. Just look at this. Okay. Now when my i value is at zero, when my i for the very first iteration my i value is zero. now i went ahead inside this i saw this one more, more loop as like okay and this loop is going for the j value of 
0, 1 and 2. If you see it is less than 3, so it is going only for 0, 1, 2. And now I am coming inside this, I am coming inside this J loop, I am printing matrix of I and J. So for the, this time, what is my I value? For this time, my I value is also 0, J value is also 0. So it will be 0, 0. For this time, my I value is still 0. But my J value is 1. For this time, my I value is still 0. But the J value is 2. And that's how we get the first row. 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2. That's how we get the first row. 0, 0, 0, 1 and 0, 2. Now, for the second iteration, when my I value will become 1. And again, the J loop will repeat again. It will again come inside. It will say there is one more loop which is J which will run for 0, 1 and 2 again. This time what will happen? Because my i value was 1 and this j is 0, it will be 1 and 0. This will be 1 and 1 and this will be 1 and 2. Okay. For further values where i equal to 2. And again it will come inside. It will see there is one more loop which is j and it is running for 0, 1 and 2. So here i value is 2. What is my j value? 0. Here my i value is 2. What is my j value? 1. Here my i value is 2 and what is my j value? 2. So if you see, look at this data which I am getting right over here. This is my first row 0, 0, 0, 1 and 0, 2. So this is my first row 0, 0, 0, 1 and 0, 2. If you look at the second, uh, second row 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2. This is 1, 0, 1, 1 and 1, 2. Look at the third one. 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 2. So, are we getting the same over here? 2, 0, 2, 1 and 2, 2. That means we were able to solve a 2D matrix with the nested for loop with the uh, i and j value by keeping the data over here. This is how if in case if you are ever getting a matrix problem, please keep the data over here and then only work with that data. Cool enough. Sort it. Mr. Prashant, how can I actually go ahead and put the data inside the matrix? So for that, again, we will use uh, the same concept in instead for loop. And the next one is we are going to check how to put data or how to store data into a three by three matrix. So if you're having a three by three matrix and we are not having a data inside it, will be something like this okay let me remove everything let me remove everything from here we just have a three by three matrix whose name is matrix now we want to enter the data okay with my uh, big heart i'm going ahead with this for int i equal to zero i less than three because it is a three by three matrix i plus plus i will mention the print of a statement enter the first row element okay elements and i will give a backslash n because i really don't want to get the data in the very same line and i will go ahead with the j loop int j equal to zero j less than three j plus plus and now where my first value here is referring to i so my it will my first value i will go from zero to three and j value will go from 0 to 3 if in case this is 5 if your matrix is 3 by 5 so j value will actually go till 5 okay that's how we will go ahead let's just go till uh, 3 by 3 matrix only and here we are going to take the input so it will tell that enter the first row elements if you want to get the exact element if you also want to print 0 0 0 1 0 2 you can go ahead and print ij as well but i will say that's not even required and you should not bother but at the end i will also tell like how that could be done let me simply go ahead and show you that here we are going to do scanf simple model sd because it is int type of matrix and here we will write m percent of matrix i comma j as simple as this write m percent of matrix i comma j and once this is done it will go it will say enter the first row instead of that i just want to put modulus d because 
we are not in control of first, second, third, but we can actually control the number. Here we are writing i plus one. So say enter the one row element, enter the two row element, enter the three row element. Okay. So let's go ahead and do it. I will go ahead and run. Right now we are just taking input. We are not printing anything. I want to give it as one, two, and three. Enter the second row element. Four, five, six. Enter the third row element. Seven, eight, nine. And that's how I am able to enter all the elements inside my matrix. And now in order to print it, I will simply copy this data. I will have a print of a statement basically, which is just going to do nothing but divide. And it will have a backslash n as well. And it will have one backslash n in the beginning as well. Okay. And now I simply want to paste this. Instead of a scanf, I am just going to write print f. And here I will remove this m percent. Now this is going to give me the data in the exact same way. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it is going to give me 1, 2, 3 into the second row element. Okay. Uh, we will remove this line. This is not needed. Okay. And here we will give modulus n. Sorry, backslash n. So if we enter the data like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, it's going to give me 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. But you really don't want data to come in this form. You want the data to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So instead of giving backslash n over here, you can give backslash t, which is just going to create one space. Okay. So now it is going to give all the elements in one row. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. It's going to give all the data in one row. And if one row is over, you want to break the line. So this is responsible for printing one row. After that, we want to break the line. So print f backslash n after that line. And it is going to break the line after 3. And look at this, what's, what it is doing. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So it is printing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, where backslash t is nothing. It is equal to two spaces. So even you can remove this and you can give two spaces. That is going to work in the exact same way. 1, 2, 3. Okay, let's have our different number. We'll write again. That got some error. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. So here we are getting the same output 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. I hope you would have understood how 2D array works, how matrix works. And if you have already done mathematics, if you already know about matrix, you would know addition, subtraction of matrix is also there. Give it a try. What we just need to do is matrix 1 and matrix 2. And addition subtraction is easy, multiplication is very difficult. Okay, we just have to add this matrix one and matrix two of i and j, and we have to store that in matrix three. Okay, so that is going to be a different cup of tea. Possibly, we will be doing that while we are solving different questions. But if you really want to go ahead and try that, it's up to you. Give it a try because you now understand 2D array, you will be able to do it now. Uh, we will be going ahead with the different video and we'll be meeting in a different concept. Till then, bye bye, see ya, tada. Hello and welcome. So, we have actually covered array still here, and the next topic which we are going to explore is strings. So, we have already seen a bit of strings by taking it in the input, or while learning different things, we have already seen what strings are. They are nothing but some characters or sequence of characters or the words or some sort of sentences. Okay, that is called as strings in the programming language. If you go ahead, strings are used for storing your text or your characters. So, how exactly do we store text or characters inside C language? So unlike other programming language, she is not very good with the strings. It does not have uh, good functions, good functionalities, good working with the strings. And that's why we have little bit of difficulty. 
but as a string is also known as sequence of characters so we actually use some similar method in order to store our strings let's suppose we want to store um, my name okay so what we do is we instead of doing cat uh, string we only have this cat data type and then we use it more like an array and then we go ahead and give the name and we keep it empty and then how we go ahead and do it using equal to and then we just go ahead and put something over there let's suppose if in case we want to put prashant i will simply keep it like this okay and this is how we actually store elements inside the array like the array characters this is how we store a string inside c with character array okay that is what your string is inside your c programming so let's go ahead and do that with our code and let's see how that is actually done though we already have practiced this but let's do it one more time char name equal to prashant mishra and we know that in order to print this we need a modulus s so we will go ahead and use that print f modulus s comma name and let's see what we are getting in the output so we got it as prashant mishra let's have one more string care hobby equal to i love coding okay that is my in the string and i want to print this as well print f modulus s and okay because i was taking little bit more of the indentation it's actually going again and again to the back and that is what was troubling us so after that what we will do is we'll give backslash n and after this as well we will give backslash n and then here we will put a b and let's see what exactly we are getting inside our output so we got prashant mishra and i love coding this is how we keep data inside a character array aka your strings and this is how we print your strings what will happen if i give here the size is 5 let's try to run it so what exactly is going to happen that it is only going to store your five characters okay and uh, yeah your remaining characters will get lost so if in case you are giving your array some size make sure you are keeping appropriate size for that character array do not give thousand two thousand because that is more like thousand. if you give the sizes thousand one character is equal to one byte and that will be thousand bytes but just single variable will be of thousand bytes which is quite similar to one um, megabit i would say and that much data if you are giving to just single variable imagine what if you have thousand variables your program is done okay and that much a uh, size in the application of the software could be very harmful and that's why we try to keep the minimum size let's suppose 30 characters for a name will be more than enough just to be in the safe side you can keep it as 40 but keeping more than that will be definitely real dangerous as per the memory size this is all about strings let me just go ahead and take you through the different things of a string let's suppose it is an array so can we access single single character of a strings yes we can using what using the indexing how we used to access we used to do that using indexing and the same we are going to do over here so prashant and i love coding is coming i will create a breakage of line okay using hyphens so that you do not get confused and here i'm going to print the first element first element of my string is going to be done with the modulus c and how exactly i'm going to print it even you can go ahead and do that with the modulus s i guess let's go ahead and try that so name of zero and then we are going to keep it on run though it may cause some trouble but i don't think so that should okay it is a segmentation fault so we have to give modulus c and that is must and now this is going to print my first character if in case you want to print my uh, eighth character or the last character which is t it will be on number seven i guess if i'm not wrong and that is going to print t for me okay 
and the first element is t basically the last element of prashant is t and that is how we can go ahead and use the indexing in order to print single single character from a string now can we even put loop on this string or can we change the value of it let's suppose i want to keep it as prashant uh let's suppose i want to keep it as uh rashant or maybe like uh rashant okay i want to change my first element i want to change my first element of my name okay let's not print it up i definitely want to change that name of zero equal to i want to give it as m and let's see if that is going to get accepted I want to print the first element now and it should print mrashnd okay so now it is printing okay so we are just printing the first character if i print the entire name it will actually print what mrashnd here we go and let me also give a backslash n that will actually make more sense while getting the output so it is Prashant instead of Prashant and that is how we can even change the value and next what we are going to do is we are going to loop through our string we are going to put loop through our string and we are going to print character by character for okay here something you need to know that here because you don't know what is the length so you have to go till a specific length if you know the length you can count it or there is a method to do that which we will see in the coming slides okay int i equal to 0 i less than equal to 15 i plus plus and then i will be going ahead print f modulus c less n and here i am going to give name of i here i am going to give name of i so this loop will do what it will break everything into character by character and that is how i am getting my entire name prashant mishra what will happen if i am going till 20 so you can just check that by clicking on run and making it till 20 so it is going till there and rest everything is your null value or the garbage value so make sure you are going not beyond your limit though this problem will get solved as soon as we find that length function which we have in the coming slides okay this is how we can even apply loop on our strings and this is how we can even change characters of our string because it actually is an array of characters moving ahead we already modified we already looped now storing special characters this is actually very very common problem let's suppose i want to store something like um i live in india okay if i really want to store that kind of a string it's going to give me the problem and what problem is it going to create let's see that okay let me just remove everything car place equal to i live in india and india is something which i want to keep inside the quotation and this is it now let me just go ahead and use printf in order to print this string so modulus s comma will also give backslash n if you want place okay and now in order to get that india we actually created the error because it is getting confused the double quotations over here is representing the end of the string it is representing the end of the string which is why it is giving us the error so in this situation we have to use a backslash and a backslash which will result into the quotations the double quotations and that will actually keep your string as i live in india okay so there are three things one is the single quotation the double quotation and the backslash even if you want to give backslash that is going to have trouble so how do we actually do it if in case we want to get single quotation we do it like this and this will be the result in this string if you want to keep double quotation it will be like this and it will get resulted into the double quotation if you want to give a backslash it will be like this and this will be resulted into single backslash and that is how we use special character special sequencing in order to get your special characters inside the string and that's how we can even print i live in india 
with quotations on okay that's one thing moving ahead we have certain string functions but before going ahead to the string let's see how to take a string input okay let's go ahead and do that so let's try that with the scanf though we already did that with f gets and scanf but let's try that again okay so here i have char name and i will mention the size i want it to be 50 to not run out of storage now i want to scan that up with my model as s and here i want to get name and in the string we do not pass n percent i simply will print f modulus s comma name and let's see what we get i'll click on run if i simply go ahead and give it as prashant that will not cause any problem okay but if i give it as prashant mishra that will cause the problem because in c programming spaces are actually covered as escape sequences it is going it has some meanings inside the c programming and as soon as it is getting a space it is causing the trouble and it is not accepted it's more like you are hitting the enter okay you are hitting the enter uh, in order to enter the second value right so it, it's stopping over there so after the space the same thing is happening it's a stopping and it is going and checking if there is second variable which can take that input mishra but there was no second variable hence it just printed prashan now how to uh, avoid the situation using f gets so how do we go ahead and use f gets we'll write f gets and then we will pass the variable and the size of the variable size of name and then we use stdin then we use stdin and this is how you will be able to get your entire string though we have two more things puts and uh, like we do have puts and sets but uh, there is some problem with that and which we will see in the coming slides don't worry about it so here we are entering the result as prashant mishra and the same thing is coming there's no loss of your characters or strings because of these spaces and this is how we go ahead and get the string along with the spaces moving ahead Let's see some of the functions which is going to make a task easier and for that we need to actually include one more header file which is has include a string dot h. If you look over here, this is before, this is done on top of main. So here we'll write has include and then I will write my string dot h and I will close it. And now once I have included it, I will be able to use certain functions and len is one of the function. If you want to get the string length, we will use strlen and it is going to return a integer value, okay, an integer value and that we can store somewhere. Let's suppose this is our name and we want to get the length of the string name, okay. So l equal to str len and here inside this will pass the name we can even get that from size what do you think no we won't be able to get that from size because size is actually going to return your data in form of bytes and that uh, if you are keeping capital characters that will cause errors if you are keeping special characters that will cause errors it also has null character at the end so it will never be able to give you your right value and let me just go ahead and print this up print f modulus d bachelors n and this l is going to be my length so here it shows some sort of error let's see that use of undeclared okay we just forgot to write int in front of it now let's click on run and get the data in the input so here it is asking me to enter the string so prashant let's keep it as till prashant okay i know that is eight characters long and right now i'm getting nine Okay, so P R A S H A N T. So it is taking four and four eight. Why is it going till nine? Is it including something else? Yes, it is including the last character which is backslash zero. Okay, and that will come when you are using F gets. If you are using simple scanf or if you are just giving the value in the uh, assignment as well, things will be little different. I hope. This is going to work. Hold on. Now, if I go ahead and use the same thing, it will have a different value, which is going to be your A. So let me just go ahead and give a bachelor's N over here. And here you will see that your value 
is actually 8 and not 9. So when you are using f gets, it is also taking your null character or it is also considering your special character which is coming at the end. And that's why the size which was given to us was 9. But if you assign it like this, your size will be given as 8. And this is how we use strlen. And now you won't have that problem. We can simply use this l and put it over loop for int i equal to 0, i is less than l, i plus plus, and we can simply go ahead till our name. So print f. We don't have to count the characters now. Okay. And sorry, name of i. And this is going to print our things character by character. So it is going to ask me like enter your name, though it's not going to ask me because we already did it over here in a static form. And that's how I'm getting my input in uh, character by character form with this given data. And because I was knowing the length, how to find it using this L, S T R L E N, I don't have to go and count my characters now. Moving ahead, we have concatenation of a string. And what is the meaning of concatenation of a string? Let's suppose you have two names. One is your first name, which is F name. I'm giving it as this and I'm keeping it as Prashant. And your L name, which is your Mishra, and I'm keeping it like this. Okay, so Prashant and Mishra are two different things. If you want to merge them together, in other uh, programming, we just use plus to do that. But here in this, if you use plus, that is accepted more like a binary operator and that will give you the error so we cannot definitely add put a plus to get concatenation done what is concatenation this will actually result in the placement of the string side by side and this will be your total output and how do we do that let's go ahead and check that we simply write str cat str1 and str2 let's go ahead and try that out so here we will have this is your f name, first name basically. Let's keep the value as 10. And this is going to be your l name. And for this, let's keep the value as 10 again, equal to Mishra. Okay, now strcat is something which you have to use. And inside this, we have to pass different things. Very first, I'm going to pass first name. Next, I'm going to pass my l name. Okay, so it is going to return you your value and where exactly do you want to see that value? You can even have that stored somewhere. And let's suppose if you're printing your first name, first name, modulus S, and here I'm going to print my F name. And right after that, I'm printing my L name. Last name modulus s by the way i forgot to keep backslash n over there so that is definitely required and after that i will write my l name and let's see what exactly we are getting in the output here i made a small typo l name let's see what exactly we are getting in the output so okay buffer overflow detected let's keep the size as 50 it is causing the trouble okay and here we see the first name is Prashant Mishra and the last name is Mishra. So what it did is, if it added the last name to your first name. It did what? It added your last name to your first name. So whatever value is there in your last name or the last variable or the second variable will get added to your first variable. And this is how you are going to see your string side by side adjacent. Now your first name variable is having that string, complete name. Prashant Mishra instead of just your Prashant and if in case you want to give space either you can give over here or over here it is up to you and uh, we can even go ahead and do one more thing which is strcat and here we can give f name in the second place we can give one space we can even do that okay and this is totally going to work so I don't have to give any extra space over there and this is how I'm going to get Prashant Mishra with the spaces. Okay, here I got extra space, but this is how we get space. Let me print that again, and there we go, Prashant Mishra. Okay, 
So we are good with this. We understood how this string concatenation is working and this is just doing nothing but adding those strings together. Now let me go here to a string copy. Let's suppose you already have my first name and you want to keep that data in my name variable. Okay. I'll remove all of these things. If you already have my first name and you want to keep that data in the name variable, which is of size 50. So can we directly give f name over here? So that is not true and that is going to give you the error. Let me just go in, let me just go ahead and print this up with mod less s comma your name. Okay, what sort of error it is going to give that it is an array and we need to actually initialize it. So if you see array initializer must be assigned with the list or the string literal. So you either have to give a list or you have to give the string literal. So in this case, if in case I really want to put some value which is there in my first name, what I can do is I can actually use strcty. Okay, here I'm going to pass. Let's suppose I want to put that value in the name. So strcpy, what I will do is I'll pass your name and I'll give my first name over here. So that will do what? That will actually store the f name to name. And here am I going to print name and that will actually give me Prashant. So this value got printed or copied to which your name variable. So here we have to pass to which we want to copy. And here we need to pass from which we need to copy. And it goes like that. Moving ahead, a string comparison, it actually gives you zero if the result is or the strings are equal. If it is not equal, it is going to give you non-zero values. Basically, what it does is it tells you the difference in ASCII character. So it's actually very tough to find uh, the exact difference, like what will be the value. If it is more, if the second value is more, it could give you like uh, some ASCII value. It could range from 97. Uh, or if it is just a small a, it will be like 97 or negative 97. If it is just a matter of capital A, it could give you 65 or negative 65. But if in case that is coming somewhere in the mid, you won't be able to calculate what exact value you are getting. So it either returns zero or non-zero value if it is not equal. So if it is returning zero, that is how we will get to know that we are having the exact same value. Okay, here we actually have name and f name. Let's do the comparison over here. So what exactly do we need to write a string comparison and this is going to return us a decimal. So str cmp and inside this we will pass the first string f name and here we are going to give the string s name. Let me remove the last value. Okay, so if it is equal it is going to give me zero in the output and what do we get is zero. Okay, what do we get over here is, I'll give a backslash n, we get it as zero. Let me remove this string copy and put Prashant over here, P-R-A-S-H-A-N-T. And if I just add one A to it in the second value, possibly it is going to give either 97 or negative 97. Okay, we have one error. Okay, we forgot to close the semicolon. So 97 or negative, okay, negative one. As I told, uh, it really uh, is not in your hand and it depends like where exactly your string is changed okay now it could give either of that value which i said okay it's giving us one so anything can come which is non-zero and you won't be able to predict i tried doing it using ascii characters but that didn't help and it will not help you as well you won't be able to guess what exact value it is going to return based on one simple change over here it could result really up and down okay right now i got it as one because even the string was changed still i got it as one but if in case there is some difference you may get some other number it can range from negative 97 negative 65 to 128 and uh, it can range anywhere in the mid okay it goes like that so this was all about a string comparison basically if the string is equal you are going to get zero that is fixed rest nothing is fixed okay moving ahead we have gets and puts which i told is actually used for getting the input uh, from the user as a strings and puts is actually for printing it so uh, let's suppose we have this okay f name and we have l name i will remove this and now we are going to use gets and puts okay we're just going to use it for uh, f name gets 
and here we can pass def name by the way it's very dangerous okay we should never use it and i'm going to tell you the reason why we should never use it okay print f u entered modulus s comma f name okay even we can go ahead and do that or we can go ahead and print it using puts okay so it says enter the string here i'm writing prashant and you entered prashant instead of that we can even go ahead and i'll actually remove this we can even put puts you entered and i'm keeping it as this and then i'm going to put the data using puts and here i'm going to keep f name okay so avoid using gets and puts when they are very simple uh okay it is actually giving you the error over here warning uh, the warning is that the function is very dangerous and should not be used so what exactly is the problem with the gets and puts basically the problem is majorly with uh, gets why we should avoid using it so whatever input you are giving in the console that gets stored in some sort of memory which is known as your buffer memory okay that is known as your buffer memory and with gets this has no limitations this has no limitations and because of no limitations of how many characters we can enter this usually corrupts our software and because the because of the overflow of the memory okay the entire program will crash okay overflow of memory the entire program is going to get crashed if we are not hitting enter so if in case we hit enter then it's going to take that input well and good but if in case we are using it for projects where we are uh, getting the data from the user and we are not hitting enter and we kept on entering the data and then it's eventually going to crash your system because of this overflow of the buffer memory and that's why it is very dangerous it can even uh, affect your entire software and we should avoid using it so instead of gets we use f gets okay that we have already seen so i guess that's it in today's video and we will meet again in the next video with some questions on strings and arrays and then we will go ahead till then see ya tada bye bye Hello and welcome to this new topic which is functions and we will be exploring functions and this function is not only going to help us in many ways but it is also going to open a lot of gates for you. In the very early time when you are starting to learn functions you will have a lot of problem, you will have a lot of difficulty in doing this but believe me once you know it, once you learn it there is no way back from it and you're going to enjoy using function let me just give you one disclaimer about the function and that is how you will feel much more motivated to learn it every single program which is done in corporate every single source code which is written is written via functions and there is a very uh, important need of keeping functions in our source code in our projects and that's how be it netflix be it your operating system be it your applications of your mobile has functions in their source code Let's go ahead and see what these functions are and why exactly do we need them. Let me just tell you in a very simple and sorted manner. Function is nothing but a simple block of code. What function is? Nothing but a block of code. Now you will be thinking what is this block of code? So it is just a code very similar to your while loop, very similar to your for loop and it's present inside the curly bracket. So what is so special about this function that we are calling it a block of code? This function is not present inside your main body. It's present outside the main body. Either we are keeping it on the top or at the bottom, right? And that's why we call it block of code. Why do we need functions? Functions are actually used or created to perform any specific task. What task that could be? That could be any kind of task, okay? So they are here to perform any specific task and we can create them to do anything be it printing your name saying good morning or whatever you want it to do let me give you a very simple example what do you think why robots are made are they made to do any particular task no 
you are made to do your day-to-day -day task only right so this function is also something very similar it is just going to do your normal task of coding only but we are going to break things into small small portions that is one thing which we are going to do moving ahead let's see the definition of function function is a block of code which only runs when it is called so with this i will be able to give you a very simple and general example imagine your teacher is giving you a lot of homework and you are fed up of doing that homework so as per your genius mind you created a robot a simple robot to do what to only complete your task what sort of task your homework and we created this robot to complete our homework cool good enough now we created this robot whenever we have the homework we will give the command to this robot that hey mr robot do my homework and robot is going to do your homework but is this robot going to do your homework automatically or what if your homework is already completed is this robot going to do that no whenever we are giving the commands to this robot then only this robot is going to do some tasks right in a very same way functions are also there we can create function for creating our homework we can create function for saying good morning we can create function to do small small tasks and this function creation is a different thing creation is very similar to like creating this robot but calling a function is little different function is actually divided into these two parts creation and calling so whenever we are calling the function that means we are giving the command to run to get executed to this robot or to this function so you can connect function and match it very similar to a robot robot is a physical body but your function is going to be your code just simple code okay let's move ahead there are two types of functions one is predefined functions and the second one is user defined functions and this will actually give you a lot more clear idea about what functions are okay very first let's talk about the predefined functions So inside the predefined functions, if you remember, we used something like strcmp, strcpy to string comparison to string copy to find the string length strlen. Okay, so what those things were? They were actually functions, and why they are called predefined functions? Because they are present inside your C language. Present already. We don't have to go and create them. They are already present in the system. They are already present inside your code. We just need to call them using some special methods and they are going to perform certain tasks. Like what this strcmp will do, it will do the comparison of your two strings. So this function is only responsible for doing the string comparison. In a very similar way, your different functions are responsible for different different tasks. And the other one is user defined function that means we are going to tell what that function is going to do we will create that function from our own and then we will be using it so predefined which is already present in the library user defined which a user is creating you already have seen predefined functions so we won't be going ahead and exploring them a lot but our main intention is to like create functions today okay so the user defined function is something which we are going to explore very first let's go ahead with the syntax and semantics and then we will go ahead and check how that is actually done with your code and we are going to uh, make a function to do different tasks okay possibly adding two numbers subtracting two numbers all those things we are going to do with the help of the functions so the syntax is very very simple very first we give the data type okay don't worry i'll explain every single thing why data type and in which cases uh, we cannot uh, use or we if you don't want to use data type what else we can pass and a lot of different things we are going to discuss so very first thing which we do is pass the data type yes they are the same data type in float care only so we have to use that data type and then we have to give the name to the function what sort of name can we give let's suppose you are creating this function to do your homework so we can assign this function a name of homework and we cannot give spaces and there are certain rules for these names of the functions they are very similar to the rules of identifiers which we learned like the rules of variables rules of naming the variables they also like uh, follow over here 
so in a very similar way we can uh, avoid certain names which are keywords and stuff and it is going to work very properly after that we have parenthesis inside which we can pass some parameters i know they are not making a lot of sense to you but as soon as we go ahead as soon as we proceed ahead things will get much more clearer for you and we can provide any number of parameter and they are completely optional if you don't want to provide any parameter we can avoid it so this part is called creation okay this part is called creation and in order to call this function we will simply write the name of the function give the bracket and give the values whatever parameters we have for the same we will be passing certain values and this is called function call okay now instead of discussing a lot of lot about your syntaxes let's actually go inside your code and practice them and then we'll come back to these definitions to see if they are making any better sense cool let's go ahead to your repellent and here we are going to create a function if you remember i told you that functions are written outside the main body and on top of it your function will always go above your main okay so let's go ahead and write void over here void is also a type of data type which we write either for here like we write either int or void if in case we want to return certain values like here we are returning zero in that case we can pass int char float depending on what sort of values we are returning if in case we do not have anything to return we can simply give void can we give void here as well definitely the program will work but in this case we have to remove this return zero let's not disturb that let it be like that now i'm going to give the name wish okay i'm going to give the name to this function wish and what this function is going to do is it is just going to say good morning or a good day good day okay as all the parameters all the arguments basically whatever values we are passing inside the functions are known as either parameters or arguments so we'll be referring it by both so your parameters are optional and we are right now not passing anything and we will close it as this is above main but the calling will be inside your main function only your calling will always be inside your main function only cool let's quickly go ahead and check how this is done i will simply write wish and i will do this and your part is done what will happen if i don't call this so nothing will happen it will be blank i just created my robot but i'm not giving it the command to run so it won't do anything what if i simply call this function it will actually print good day there we go so it actually printed good day can we create anything or can we use multiple printf statement inside your wish yes definitely let's go ahead i hope you are doing well that's less n and this is good and let's run it and it will say good day i hope you are doing well how many times can we call this function as many times as you want this is the beauty and this is one very good thing about function that you have to create it once and we can call them any number of time so this is one advantage of function which is code reusability code reusability so we can like write it once and we can use it any number of time okay day after day minutes after minutes seconds after seconds we can use it whenever we want it second it it gives you readability it is giving you readability so is it doing anything simple for you we are doing the same task if you are repeating something we can directly put it inside the function and we can keep on calling the function it is going to do your general task but it is going to partition them into small small chunks now your entire program is not your main body is not going to hold the entire program but we can divide them into certain certain functions and we can make them responsible for doing certain tasks let's suppose you started a company there will be having the directors vps and your managers senior managers and then the bottom level hierarchies and every single member will be responsible for their own task in a very similar way we can create these small small functions and they will be responsible for their own tasks let's suppose one person who was a manager for marketing 
okay your marketing campaigns didn't perform very well who are you going to catch your directors uh, of sales or your managers of marketing definitely the managers of marketing right so in the very same way if you have any error so you know from where the error is coming from if the error is in marketing you will actually just find the bug in that marketing function only and not in your entire program so it is easy to find bugs and rework on that is also very simple so these are some benefits of using functions and slowly we are going to go ahead and explore this and we'll go in depth of function and you're going to love it let's go ahead and create a function which is little bit useful okay i'm going to create a function void add and what this is going to do is it is going to add two values as of now let me take int a equal to 10 int b equal to 20 and here what we are doing is we are going to add these values and we are going to store that in the result we can even print it directly but let's store that in the result int result equal to a plus b simple cool sorted yes and now we can call this add function and we can simply print off this result result equal to modulus d and here we are going to pass my result okay sounds good let's click on run and you will see that result equal to 30 is coming let me also have backslash n over here and call this one more time though the answer will not change but i really wanted to show you something we can call this twice and we will have the results two times what if we are willing to take the data input from the user can we do that let's check this out so we'll write int a comma b and we'll remove this line we created int a into b and now we are going to take that input is can f modulus d modulus d okay and here we want to get m percent of a comma percent of b so we are going to take two inputs from the user and because we were running it twice it's going to work twice let's click on run so here we have to give the first value i'm giving it as five second value is six result is 11. now my next value is eight and next value is nine my result is 17. so this is how we can take the input from the user and we can get the results over there and this is how your function is very very important sometimes especially if you want to get input from the user and you want to repeat that task multiple time or you want to repeat the task whenever you want to okay what is the difference between your loop and your function let me go ahead and tell you so this is very good because uh, we have already seen that function is used for reusability so what is the difference between loop and your function that is one very interesting question so let's suppose this is your loop and this is your function we mentioned if we know that in what all conditions we are going to uh, run this loop in those situations definitely loop is very very important and very handy i would say it's not going to take up on the extra memory it's not going to take up on your extra amount of code extra hard work and loop will work very very fine over there okay it's good where it is good where we know that we have to repeat certain number of time repetition is certain okay but in such cases where you don't know that how many times the user is going to do some task okay in those cases we use function let me give you some simple example and clear this doubt of yours imagine uh i am going to a shop a normal shop okay this is a normal shop where i really want to go and i want to buy something i want to buy something from this shop so what i will do is i'll repeat certain things one that i will pick the item pick the item put it in cart next i will go to checkout i will pay the amount pay amount okay so this is the task which i want to repeat inside one go 
Now, no matter how many times I'm going to the shop and I'm buying things, this will happen. But what is the probability that you will enter the shop and you will do nothing? You won't buy something. What is the probability that you will go inside the shop to look for something, right? So in these situations where something is not certain, but if we are doing something, we have to repeat and that will be in one order only. In those situations, your functions are very handy. If the repetition is certain, we use loop. If the repetition is not certain, in those cases, we use functions and they are very handy. We are only going to call them if that is required. And if it is not required, we are not going to call them. We can call them any number of times based on those situations. On the other hand, loop is going to run for that many specific number of times and it's going to stop after a certain time and we have to write it again little later on but the same thing does not happen in function we can call it any possible time okay let's go ahead and explore a little bit more about function so parameters and arguments this is one very beautiful thing i would say as we were doing this question and we were taking the input from the user what if you don't want to take the input from the user okay Let's remove A and B from here. Let's remove this scanf as well from here. Now, I really don't want to take a static value because that is not so worthy for me. What I can do is I can pass two values over here, 5 comma 6. And the next go, I can pass 11 comma 12. And I'm saying that these value will go to your add function and it will return the result. Yes. How do we do that? If you're passing two values over here, we'll put int a comma int b. And if you're passing two values over here, we will put two. So these are parameters and functions, but let me just go ahead and click on run and show you what will be the result. So for the very first time where we were passing five and six, the result was 11. And for the next time, 11, 12, the result was 23. How did this work? Let me just go ahead and show you the dry run of this code. So here was our function void add and if in case we are willing to pass two values so we will only take two parameters also known as arguments so we took two parameters and we also have to mention the data type int a comma int b okay and we are using the same variable name inside our function maybe like we just want to print off the addition printf modulus d a plus b that is your output which we want to give and on the other end when we were calling the function what we did is we passed the value so add 5 comma 6 what will happen over here is that this 5 will get assigned to your a because it is the first value it is the first value so your 5 will go and get assigned to a and 6 will go and get assigned to b if you are passing integer value we have to make sure we are putting integers over here so this is called as parameters and arguments inside functions and this is how your values get replaced and we can use the same variable name in order to use it inside our function and that's how we used it to get one output which is the result of a plus b i hope i am making sense let's go ahead and try this thing with some other uh, function or with some other code next is what we are going to do is we are going to pass one simple string what exactly we are going to do is we are going to pass one simple string and we are going to say good day prashant okay and this prashant will be given as an input to the user so imagine you are visiting some sort of mall or maybe you are going to your office and you are putting your thumb for the punching right and as soon as you are putting your punching or if your thumb on the punching machine it is able to recognize you and it is saying good day prashant whereas you know, if your colleague uh, sachin is coming and putting there so it will say good morning or good day sachin right so we are going to create a function for something similar let's go ahead and remove this function from here remove this data from here even we can remove that part that's not required and what exactly we are creating void wish 
so we are creating it for wish and how do we take character input so if in case we really want to create any character so we will say char name and then we give that value in the exact same way we will see char name and we are going to have that value and now we are going to print f good day along with the name good day model as s and here we will give the name okay that's how we go ahead and give the name we will also have backslash n over there the same name will be passed so let's call it wish and here we are going to pass our name Prashant. okay so let's see what is the output which we are going to get it says good day prashant whereas on the other end if some other friends of your is visiting the office so it will be able to recognize them with their punching hands and because system already knows the name it will pass the other name so let me pass Sachin and Vijay over here okay let's see what do we get in the output so for the very first time it will say good day Prashant for the next time it will say good day Sachin for the next time it will say good day Vijay so whoever is coming and putting your thumb on the punching machine based on the recognition based on name it is going to wish good day and these are the small places where we can use your function imagine doing the same thing with the if condition that will be a bit lengthy code right and it is only wishing to the values which we are providing so we don't have to check for the entire list isn't it like who exactly is providing or we don't have to do this for every single person so this is where your functions are little handy instead of other codes we can use functions directly we don't have to write print printf print printf print again and again and this is very useful in that case now this is good this is okay what if we go ahead and do something more okay we have seen we already gave uh, integer as the input to the function we already gave uh, a string to the input to the function but what if we want to do something more i definitely have something for you let's go ahead and learn about this return what this return will do imagine that you are going to a tailor okay you visited a tailor and you gave a piece of cloth for stitching okay you gave a piece of cloth for your coat or maybe a piece of cloth for stitching okay so you gave the cloth for making the coat or blazer okay now what this tailor is doing tailor is not giving this to you but wearing it and going to a party okay tailor wears it and goes to the party what will be your reaction what will be your reaction maybe you got that blazer uh for gifting it to your friend maybe you got that blazer for your party maybe you got that blazer for a prom night there are endless possibility where you wanted to use this blazer but instead this tailor is using it so what your functions were doing till here if you look back at your functions they were actually utilizing the information which you were giving to them if in case you really wanted the addition of two numbers they were printing it so it's more like they are using our given values right and we are not getting anything in return so that's where your return comes very handy if you are giving a piece of cloth certain information certain uh, variables to your functions it is going to do some task on it and it is going to give you something in return it's going to give you something in return okay so let's see what exactly we can do imagine that we received uh, two numbers okay we received two numbers number one and number two okay this number could be anything you are giving these two values to your function and you are asking the function to add it you are asking the function to add it for the very first time you want to get these two values you don't know what they are right so you cannot directly print addition of two number is maybe this is just a simple mathematics calculation you just want to do addition but you want to utilize this information as per your use what i mean to say is you just gave two number and you want return in addition like if you're passing four and five it should return you nine that's it you should be responsible what exact message you want to display or where exactly you want to utilize that information maybe you want to add this number to something else or maybe you want to divide this nine by something else or maybe you want to subtract something from this ad so you are going to see 
where you are going to use this knowledge and in that case we can use return where exactly do we use return and what are the changes do we need to make if let me just delete it let me just delete as this as well the entire function let's create a function for addition and you want to return a value which will be integer so we have to give data type as int for the function that is something which you should know and we are passing two values int num1 comma int num2 these are the two values which you are passing inside your functions and you want to get something in return which will be the addition of these two number so we'll simply write return num1 plus num2 and those are the values which will get returned to you so if something you are getting in return or the values you are getting in return where are you going to store it so we'll definitely store it in some sort of variable so calling these functions will be little different very first we have to put some sort of variable in result okay that is a variable where i want to store the information you can directly go equal to add you can give the number but let's keep it separate i want to get some values in result which will be addition of 4 comma 5 okay and here i printed print f i am going to study for study for modulus d hours and here we can pass the result this is what i was talking about you will be able to use that value and you can use it according to your own choice let's suppose for the second time you have two numbers let's suppose 20 and 30 and you will be able to calculate how much how much dollar you need to pay uh, at the checkout okay so you wanted to calculate some value or total bill of 145 comma 784 so these were the two values you wanted to add you passed it to the addition and you wanted to print print f pay modulus d dollar at the checkout okay and here what you will be passing you will be passing the value result now if i run this it will say i am going to study for 9 hours and in the next one it says pay 929 dollar at the checkout so it is doing the same task of addition but we can use that value to print different things we can utilize it according to us and this is what i was telling like if we needed that sort of things where we want to utilize the data where we want to utilize the result according to ourselves this is how we can get something in return and this is how we can use it so hello and welcome to the second part of function where we will be starting again from where we left so last program which we did was from return and again we are going to start one more thing from return so that you will be able to understand the returning in a little more a better way i would say and that's how you will be able to learn about functions in detail so let's get started what is my next question about function which is the grading system if you remember so what we did in the grading system was return a plus if it was 100 return a if it was from 99 to 90 return b if it was from 89 to 80 and return c if it was from 79 to 70 and return d in any other case in the else case okay that's how we are going to go ahead with our function and we are going to get those values in return from the function let's have a look at this and see how that is done very first we will have our function see here we are returning a plus okay if it was just a b c d we could have easily used char as the data type but a plus is not the character it has more than one character it will be treated more as a string and that will be little difficult so what we will be doing is we will be going ahead very first with this data from a to d and then we will be looking at how we can even get a plus let's go ahead and do this very first we'll be starting with the char char grades and here we are just passing the marks so based on these marks only it is going to divide the data if marks is greater than 90 in that case 
see we can do two things over here either we can return it directly over here using return and we can pass that okay i will be passing a or you can have that value inside the result which will be over here and then you can result it you can return it i will be going ahead with the return directly inside it i don't want to create any new variable and waste some memory so return a if it is greater than your 90 else if if the marks are greater than or equal to 80 i'll be returning a different value let's go ahead with the 80 and in this case i will be returning b okay let's go ahead with else if and in this case we'll be returning c 70 return c else return d okay so that is my simple function and in the main what we are going to have is because of this return this because of this int we will have return zero so let's keep that so that our function is running smoothly and now we are going to call these grades which is going to be like that and as we have to store that information somewhere i will have char result equal to grades and here i'm going to pass my integer value which will be my marks i'm passing 89 over here and then i really wanted to print this result i'll say print f and then what exactly i'll do modulus c because it's a character value which we are getting in the return and then we really wanted to print the result so there we go and here we can even see grades r modulus c backslash n and there we go let's run it and see what is the value which we are getting over here so we got grades as b let's pass a different value which is 79 possibly and let's see if that is giving any difference so the grades are c if in case we are passing any number which is lesser than that it will be passing with the grade d this is good with the characters so let's also see how we can pass a plus which will be uh, a string but not your character in that case we have to make a small change with your function name which i have to write one star over here but this is not it we have to do one more task which is how to get that data in the return form because even if i go ahead and make this like this and even if i give that return value over the result this is going to have little difficulty what difficulty exactly it is going to have is that it will say that assign arguments or uh, place some array value which we do not have and this is a very big problem in c that it does not work very good with your strings in the in this case we can either use pointers but yet we have not covered that so what better thing we can do is we can use the function string copy so in that case we will have to import one header file as include and then i'm going to write a string dot h and using string.h we can have one simple method which was string copy strcpy so whatever result i am getting i will copy the same result into which value into my result value so like this we can actually go ahead and put the data and utilize a returned value which is in the form of a string so let me just go ahead and use this else if and put over here one if condition if the marks are equal to equal to 100 we can easily pass a plus and why we can pass a plus because now we are good with one data which is string okay let me also convert this to double quotation because this will also go as strings now and not as characters so making all those changes very very quickly we will be able to utilize our time as well going ahead we will not keep it like this or we will not keep it like this because again that is also one error let me show you by running it one more time what we do is we will simply create one string variable and we'll also pass the size let's suppose we are passing the size of 100 and how do we exactly Store this data inside the result strcpy in the first place i will pass that string where i want to get my data which will be my result variable 
I will do comma and I'm going to call this function grades. So I will call this function grades and inside this I'm going to pass my value as 100 and that data will get copied to my result variable and that's how I will be able to get the output in the result. Let's go ahead and see if this is actually working. So grades are A plus. Okay. So this is how we can go ahead and even get a string in the return window. Moving ahead, what do we have next is function declaration versus definition. And this is a topic where most of the people do get confused. Even when I was asked in one of my interview that what is function declaration definition based on this given data, based on these given definitions of declaration definition, I was able to give some sort of answer. But based on different situations, I wasn't able to make it up to the interviewer. And what exactly we missed, what exactly I missed is going to get covered in this video. Moving ahead, what is declaration and what is definition and what is the difference between them? Very first, let's understand about the definition part. So wherever you are going and creating your function, wherever you're going and creating your function, let's suppose void add and you're keeping it like this. So wherever you're keeping this is called your definition. Okay. Next is if you're putting your body also over here. So the creation of body is called declaration. Okay. The creation of body is called declaration. But what the question was for me in the interview that here is my total function, which is the care grade possibly this. Is it a function definition or declaration? So if I say it is a declaration, I was somehow correct but it was not the 100% correct answer because in this situation we are doing both the things here we are defining and at the bottom we are declaring so if you do that right on the top of the main it is both function declaration plus definition on the other hand if i go ahead and put this data below your main function but you will say mr prashant didn't you say that we have to use or create function above our mean Yes, we have to, but in that situation, we have to particularly mention the definition separately. Care star grades, and here I will write int, and then I will close it with the semicolon. And if I run it, it won't have any error. What will happen if I remove this definition from here? It will throw error. Why exactly it is going to throw error? I'm going to cover as that as well. But let's understand what is the difference between definition and declaration first. So as I did this part separately, now this is called my definition separate and bottom uh, of the main where we went ahead and gave the body to my function is called declaration. But when we did that on the very top, altogether it's called declaration plus definition both. Okay, I hope you would have got a clear idea about both declaration definition. Now let's understand why removing this is giving us these sort of errors. So our program actually follows top to bottom approach. Very first, it meant this these two headers, stdio and string.h. Post that, it saw nothing. There was no such function. And as of now, your program is unaware about any function present inside your code it went ahead with the main it saw that okay there was one string declaration so a definition and then it went ahead and see this uh, small part of code where we are using or we are calling a function grade till this time your function your code is unaware about the function present inside your code of c and due to which due to the uh, unawareness it actually threw some error that this is a conflicting type of the grades which is not present inside your code and how could you call it and that is where the definition is making sense if we go ahead and define it separately like that so moving from the top it saw this and this is giving it uh, an idea that okay somewhere in your code there is the body of the function so right after this it is not going to the main but checking where is the body 
of this function once it is checking the body of the function it is getting the body of the function it will come back here will start checking from the next line and then when it is going inside your main body and getting this grades it is not getting confused because it already knows that function is actually present inside your code and that's how we are not getting the error when we do that definition separately and using this we can even put our function below our main or after where our main is ending so both the ways are correct now you can use or utilize this method to put your functions wherever you want so moving ahead with the recursion and this is a very special topic i took so many days to learn it but i'm going to make sure that you learn in this video itself what is the meaning of recursion let's understand with this small definition recursion is a technique recursion is a technique of function calling itself function calling itself okay now i'm going to give you a very difficult situation and probably if you see avengers or marvel movies you will be able to understand this a little better or if you see science fiction and you know about time machines you will be able to relate with this example pretty well imagine right now right at this time i meet a person coming from future let's suppose i am in the year 2023 and my future prashant came to me from 2070 possibly if that person is uh, willing to meet me at this age okay so that person came to me and met me here in 2023 when i will be going to that year don't you think that i also have to do the same to make this uh, possibility come into reality yes i have to repeat that task as well isn't it so your function your recursion is something similar your function is calling itself let me just go ahead and give you a little simple example which is not requiring you to go to the time machine or go to different years so let's suppose you are seeing one movie okay or a series that will be little better you're seeing a series and what the series is doing as soon as one one chapter is ending it is asking the movie to go to next chapter it is asking the movie to go to next chapter what this is doing is this is calling one function play but inside the play we are updating that it should go to the next chapter we are calling the function again and again play but we are just updating the value inside it that go to the next chapter go to the next chapter and what happens with this thing is that there will be a point of end there should be a point of end as well and in a very similar way while creating recursion we also have to make sure this is our responsibility that we are creating a base condition where your recursion is actually stopping at some point of time okay i hope you would have understood this recursion thing with this example if not i have one more thing to show you and then you will be able to understand this little better now let's understand the things with the visuals maybe there is a function which is void uh, addition addition of n natural number okay so this is just calling the function adding and here we are passing one simple value which is int num okay and while calling this function adding i'm going to pass a value which is one over here cool but till here we already know how to create the function we already know how to call the function inside the body of this function what exactly we are doing is very very important for you to understand inside the body itself we are having one function called adding and here we are again passing certain variables which will be your parameters so here i can pass num plus plus and what's happening with this is that every single time very first how your function will start with this function call there has to be one command from the user side and then rest everything will be taken care by the function itself now one command was given to this 
okay and the value which was passed over here was one it went inside and this called another function adding with the value num plus plus with the value two over here why one was passed now one plus plus is two and now this will again see one more call of adding with num plus plus it will call function three that will call function four and that function will call function five and this is how your call after call will keep on going unless and until you know where to stop and how to give one stopping condition using if condition setting up the limitation that this num should not go beyond the limit if it is going about 10 we need to stop if it is going about 20 we need to stop enough of discussion i guess let's go ahead and utilize this theoretical information into our codes and let's see how this actually looks like moving ahead we are doing one simple code for addition of n natural numbers addition of n natural number and you have already done this before with me like what is the meaning of addition of n natural number that 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 10 if you want to go till 10 we have to give the value of this whatever is the value 59 58 that we have to print and we are going to do this with the recursion now you will be asking me mr prashant what is the need of recursion when we can go ahead and do this task simply by using the loop that's a very wonderful question now what this is going to do is recursion is actually responsible for dividing your task into a small small subtask it is responsible for dividing your task into a small small subtask mm -hmm. and how i can actually explain this example is with one example of office let's suppose you're working in one office and the overall or the biggest task is to make money okay and how they are going to make money by dividing this into two different services let's suppose it's an edtech company where you are learning this course possibly it has two features one your recorded lesson which you are listening to the other is live okay now this is dividing the task into again small small parts that there has to be one teacher who is going to record there has to be one editor who is going to take care of the editing in the live also we are dividing it into small small parts that there has to be one teacher a live trainer there has to be a team which is going to take care of a small small task this team is going to divide certain tasks like marketing editing social media post a lot of different things so this is what happens in the recursion it is going to divide things into small small tasks and those tasks are going to work separately to form upon a bigger task which is for making money okay it goes like that let's go ahead and use the question of addition of n natural numbers i will have to remove the entire definition over here and the declaration as well so let's remove that part let's also remove the int main part which is from our last code so recursion is normal function only what we are going to do is we are going to have one int form why int because keeping one parameter is extremely must inside recursion because how will it know where to stop if you are not giving it some value because based on that value only it is going to stop right that is how it will get to know what value is provided so one very big limitation or requirement of recursion is one parameter one parameter which we need to pass second requirement is the base condition or the stopping condition where your code should stop and if you are passing the parameter how exactly we are going to utilize this information by returning it by returning the value and if you are returning the value we should have a proper data type as well and that's why because we are working with the numbers we are having integer type over here and i'm giving the name as sum initial value is let's suppose int num which we will pass as zero let me just call this function over here and because we were returning we will store that into the result and result equal to sum my initial value is zero and get started i will simply print f modulus d 
where I can I can write sum of first ten natural number is modulus d backslash n and here I'm going to write my result. Okay, now we just have to work with what with our function and how exactly I'm going to work. Very first, I'm setting up the base condition that whenever my number is reaching 10, I have to stop. Whenever my number is reaching 10, please stop. So if num equal to equal to 10, I have to return that particular number. I'll return that number and I will stop then and there. In the other part, in the else part, what I am going to do is I'm going to return num plus sum of num plus plus. I'm going to return num plus sum of n plus plus. Let's see if this is actually giving us, us the output. And did it work? Something went wrong over here. Okay, so I think the problem is over here with num plus plus. Instead of that, I will have to pass num plus one and let's see if you are getting our output. And post that, we will see the dry run of the code. Sum of first and natural number is 55. So let's see how it actually worked. Let's go till actually five because we will be able to go with five numbers and we'll see how it is actually working. So from sum of first five numbers is actually 15 and that's correct. I know that some of first five natural number is 15. So let's have a small dry run of this thing and see how it actually works. Okay. Now, in order to do that, we will need our code. So let's quickly go ahead and have int sum. We have to write all the information int num and inside this. We are having one base condition. What is the base condition? If num equal to equal to 10, I'm going to return num. Otherwise, I have to keep on going. I have to keep on going like return num plus sum of num plus one so this is the total code which we are using and here exactly we are calling our function back our function is calling the function back cool so how things are working is basically for the very first time when the number was passed was zero the number passed was zero it came over here it checked if num equal to equal to 10 condition was false so else case will get executed it printed like return num plus sum of n plus one so it is going to print return num what is num zero and it is going to have the data from where from here what is sum of n plus one which will be zero plus one and it is going to call that function again so it is going to have the same process repeated now the function or the value which is passed over here is going to be one it will again check one equal to equal to 10 false it will again do the same thing return num plus sum of num plus one so it is going to have one division and it is going to have return one plus again the same thing will go one plus one which will be two sum of now this is going to say return 2 plus sum of 3 in the very same way the sum of 3 is going to say return 3 and then plus sum of 4 and the sum of 4 is going to say return 4 and then it's going to do what plus sum of five the sum of five is going to actually return something if you look back at our code if you look back at our code over here we did change it to five so let's actually change it to five over here so that we will be able to relate it little better let me quickly make that as five okay cool so it is only running till five i will small this down and how this will actually work 
So sum of five is returning what? Sum of five will return your value num. It's not going to sum of n plus one. It is returning the value num. What is the current value of num? Five. So this will return what? This is going to return the value five. So it will be return four plus five. It should be return nine. And where this data will go? This data will be returned to this place. This data will be returned to the sum of four. Because sum of 4 is calling that, right? So let me erase it and write return of 9. So this will be, this value will get replaced by 9. Let me just put that up over here. So 9 plus 3, what is 9 plus 3? It is uh, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, my bad. I'm good, bad at counting. It will be 12. So instead of this value, we are going to replace with the sum of this, which will be 12. So let me just erase this and put that data over here. So it will become 12. And return of 2 plus 12 will replace this value. So 2 plus, uh, 12 plus 2 will be uh, 14, which will come over here. So let me erase this and let me keep there 14. Okay. Okay. So let me keep there 14. Return 1 plus 14. So it will do what? Return 1 plus 14 will be 15. So it will be return 0 plus 15. And 0 plus 15 will be 15. So it is going to return your value 15. And that's how it is getting the output as 15. Cool. So we are getting the output as 15 in total. That's how your recursion works. It goes and forms up on a thing. It goes to uh, the ladder go down, 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 and then it executes the last part, the smallest part, add that up to the second last, add that up to the third last, fourth last, and the fifth last, and then it reaches to the top and gives you the final answer. That's why I said it divides your problem into a small, small task. Let's suppose I gave you add 7893 and 87. Five, three. You'll be like, oh my goodness, this is a very tough thing. So what you did is you divided this into two things. One is 7000, which is one easy number. And the other is 893. And then you divided this into one more thing, which is 800 and then 93. You broke this as well into 90 plus 3. And what you did over here is you did the same thing. You broke this also into small, small problem. 8000 plus 753 then this is also broken into a fixed number 753 even this is broken into small thing which is 50 plus 3 now just look at this table with a wider picture now if we have to add 7000 and 8000 it will be very very easy which will be 15000 for you plus if you add 800 and 700 that will be again 1500 for you. Now, this thing is done. Now, what you need to do is 90 plus 50, which will be 140 for you. 15,000 plus 1500 will be 16,500 plus 140. Okay, this is also done. This is also done. What is remaining is 3, which will be 6. So, it will be 146. So, 16,500 plus 146 so here my one will come 16 6 4 6 that is the total number how we broke this into small small parts and made it simple and then we added it i'm not sure if my calculation is right but you would have understood that how recursion works how it breaks your problem into small small problems and then how it adds up and forms you and gives the wider result gives you the bigger result by doing the same task into small small chunks this is what your recursion is all about moving ahead math function let's also look at this math function which we have not seen yet we have already seen string function but we have actually not witnessed about this math function so let's go and utilize this for this we will have to use math.touch though there are various other functions like sine cos tan i won't be going ahead with a lot of details about math but some functions like sqrt which is finding the square root the power which we may use in our coming programs is definitely i'm going to explore let's go ahead remove the unnecessary things from here which is the sum 
and this data. Now we are only left with this thing. Even remove string dot touch because that's not required. Very first thing to use math function, we will do use include and then we'll give math dot h. That is something we really wanted. Very first thing inside the math function is sqrt, which is square root. So if in case you really wanted to find the square root of something, just do print f. Use model as f because this may give you some floating numbers to get the appropriate result. It is advised to use float. Though even if you store that inside your integer number, that may not give you any problem. But that will not give you the exact data. Let's suppose if I want to get the square root of um, 10. So it will be 3 point something. I'm not sure what the exact value will be. But that will be inside float value only. So sqrt of 10. And that's how we will be getting our entire result in the proper values. And it's over here 3.162278, something like that. And this is why we should always use model SF to get that data. We can even store it in some float variable float res equal to sqrt of maybe 16. And then we can even print that data res. Okay. And it will give you the value of what is the sqrt of 16 which is 4 and if it is a whole number it will give you 4.00000 and that's what we have in square root let's go ahead with the next function which is rounding a number in which we have seal and floor what is the meaning of seal the roof okay the top what is the meaning of floor the bottom what this is going to do this is going to round off your number to what value to the floor value or to the bottom value basically if you have some decimal values let's suppose if you have 1.67 or maybe like 10.67 something okay you have that number so floor will do what it will convert it to 10 and seal will convert it to the top value which is 11 that's what is called rounding off the values let's go ahead and check this out how this seal and floor works print f we are going to work on the same number to see what is the better result model s f comma seal 7.8763 okay and i'm going to work with print f model s f this is going to be your floor and here i'm going to work with 7.87 six three the same value and you will see the difference between seal and floor seal is making it to eight and floor is making it to seven let me just go ahead and have the backslash n so that you will be able to relate it with very properly so what is the top value after the decimal eight it is uh, seal is making you to go till eight floor is bringing you to the down so that is the only difference between seal and floor it is going to round off the value but till what extent that matters moving ahead we have power which is definitely used to find the power let's suppose 2 power 2 is 4 4 power 2 is 16 8 power 2 is 64 so it is going to find the power and the first value will be uh, the value for which you want to find the power the second value will be the power let's go ahead and utilize this as well we'll remove it print f modulus f comma power of 8 comma 2 so we will be getting 64 and this is how your calculation will be very very easy we can even go for 8 power 8 which will be a big number i guess and we can even go ahead and utilize those sort of information which is 16777216 and this is how you will be able to find your power as well so that's it in this video function part two next video will be on pointers so see you there till then tada bye bye hello and welcome to this new video where we are going to learn about pointers this is a very easy topic but most of the places or from most of the people you will hear just oppose it so Pointers is actually very easy when you understand them really well and as this is one of the uh, unimportant topic which is used a lot so you will have to pay little extra attention to this as well. So whatever we are learning in coding is definitely important so you have to pay a lot of attention to almost every single topic but this can definitely take 
little more from you to understand okay let's go ahead and understand pointers but before we go ahead and understand pointers we have to learn more about memory addresses okay now what are memory addresses so if you remember that we used to like take some variables like int age equal to 10 okay and in the very first few classes i told that in age equal to 10 is going to hold some memory like four bytes of memory so we are doing what we are actually blocking one space in the memory of four bytes okay and there we are keeping this value 10 okay so in order to print the memory address like at in which block in which row in which column your data is present we use ampersand to get that data and that's how we will be able to see in which memory location our value is present let's go ahead and see that with the example and then that's how you will be able to rate things a little better i will remove this data from the last class and let's go ahead and have int age equal to 10 and then in your next line what we are going to do is print f model less u comma m percent of age okay we can do this with model less p we want less u model less x based on that you will see different values and here we see one hexadecimal value when we are going ahead with p if you are going ahead with x so the things will be very similar actually i'll show you by printing it twice with model less x as well things will be very very similar just this 0 cross 7 ff will go okay let me just have backslash n as well how could i forget that because of that only this output is not coming very proper so if you see the things returned from here 65149e4 65149e4 the value is almost same where the p is returning your hexadecimal value the proper value on the other end x is just returning the memory address value okay now what is this thing over here 0 cross 7 ffc 65149e4 or what is this 6d514 e4 so these things are called your memory address and that is how your location of memory is referenced so these are nothing but the reference of your memory location so if you remember what we said in the first class this variable is going to point to a location inside your memory where it is storing the data variable is nothing but it is pointing towards the memory location and it is fetching and storing the data over there so memory address is nothing but a place inside your memory in which we are keeping the data memory address is just the address like our home where our home is located in india or maybe where your home is inside this globe you have the address right so for every single data we have different address in a very similar way this data also have its own address and location inside memory okay let's go ahead and see a few more things what is scan of with ampersand where if you remember how we used to take data a scan of modulus d this is how we take input right scan of and then we give modulus d and then here we give m percent of age so we are telling that store memory address where this age variable is going I store this data 10 store my age 10 in that location and have a pointer have a reference to that location so that you don't forget that where my data was inside the memory location because this memory is very big similar to the uh, India like India is very big your home could be anywhere if you lose that location you won't be able to uh, Courier you won't be able to reach over a particular house or maybe uh, visit your relatives Okay, if in case you have any in India cool. So the same thing happens over here as well 
Also, while using the scanf function, we mentioned that address var to take user input for any variable var. A scanf model is the address of var. This is used to store the user input value to the memory address. We are telling, okay, store it at some particular free location and just know where I kept it so that I don't lose this address and I can come back and get it out. Okay, it's just like a map inside your forest you can say okay you're keeping one tracer or you're hunting for a tracer how are you going to know where your gold is or where your tracer is so you have to look at the map to reach that location right so this variable is nothing but the map okay going ahead learning more about the pointers but before that there's one special note as i ran this program and here you can see for int age equal to 10 you are getting 6d5149 e4 this value may not be same for you and why am i saying that because you don't know exactly where in your memory location this value is getting stored so based on the memory locations based on different memory specifications these number do change okay so this number can be really different for you so not to worry about the same moving ahead what is a pointer hmm this is something important and this is what we were willing to learn. Now we know memory address. It is nothing but the address of your uh, data inside your memory. Okay. Address of the location where your data is saved. Now what is pointer? Pointer is the variable to store this address. What address? Whatever we are receiving over here. So it is going to store this address. Your variable was always there. So why are we actually storing this address so variable is holding that value at the same time pointing to the location but it is actually holding your data okay hear me out very properly so you have a box okay you have a box in which you kept some books in which you kept some normal books so what is this this is a variable which is holding books. Now you created one simple variable and it is having one map inside it. It is having one map or one paper inside it which is telling where you can find this variable or where we can find this books. Okay, so it is holding the address or the location of that books. Okay, sorry, books. So point is nothing but a variable which can hold the address of those information. And why exactly do we need those address? That is more important than learning what pointer is. See, if you are going ahead telling one variable age to just update itself age plus one. What it is doing in behind the scene is that very first it is checking what is the value present. So it will go to the location first it will check what was the value then update the value by solving this so it will also go what is my value to check the value i need to go to location i need to check the value and then it is going to update by adding plus to it and then the same process will be repeated to update the value over here but in case we already know location it will not do anything it will directly go to that location update the value so it saves time it saves time and this process is faster where we are keeping more address location okay this is like decoding where your data is present by certain rules whereas this is no longer needs to decode it can directly reach your location and update the value over there okay it's very similar let's suppose you are the owner of the company okay you are the owner of the company and they have certain rules over here that wearing uh, of shoes is mandatory okay one rule is that wear a professional outfit or okay let's have this professional outfit one okay you have to wear professional attire in the office if some manager has to change this rule very first they will reach to the director directors will set the meeting 
and then this meeting will go to the owner and owner will decide the rules and then this process will change whereas if you are the owner you will directly change the rule then and there you don't need any meeting or stuff like that you will make instant changes and later on you can just check if those changes are good or not but the result is applicable then and there and that's how a lot of time is saved and the same thing happens with your pointer because it has the address it has the capability to reach to that address directly and then that's how it is changing the value directly that's how it is little faster cool moving more ahead how do we actually store okay let's also have a look at this definition a pointer is a variable that stores the memory address of another variable as its value what does that mean we'll see that in coming slide let's suppose here we have int okay here we have int age equal to 43 which is one, one variable here we have one pointer variable which is having ampersand of my age which is storing the data what data this data it is storing ampersand of my age and you will see how will you be able to identify one pointer you will see this star symbol in front of it and one more thing the data type has to stay same if you are willing to store uh, like a pointer or the address of if you are willing to store address of int pointer will also be int if you are willing to store address of float pointer will also be float if you are willing to store address of character pointer will also be the character only and that is one rule second how do we go ahead we firstly put one star and then give ampersand of my above variable let me just go ahead here let's create one pointer variable int star ptr int star ptr even you can go ahead and write it like this int star ptr both are correct so that will not make any difference or any change this is considered as good practice that's why i have to write it like that ampersand of age okay if i simply go ahead and write this print modulus p comma ptr you will see that it is printing okay let me just remove this okay it is printing the hexadecimal value which is present over here 0 cross 7 fff 1ce 3452c okay that's one thing now how to get your data back how to print your data from this can we directly use print f and use modulus d and then give ptr no that will be one error because it is present in the hexadecimal format and that is going to give you the garbage value let me have one backslash n over here so that every time i'm running it is going to give you one garbage value or irrelevant value okay every time it is going to change now how do i actually print the value of this ptr or how to retrieve the data so we'll use star ptr and that's how you will be able to get your exact value which was 10 so this is how we create pointer and this is how we retrieve the data back from pointer so just by putting that star it's going to give our data back to us moving ahead double pointer and this is a very special concept in this we do nothing we create one more pointer which is storing address of another pointer another pointer so this is what it is doing one pointer which is storing address of another pointer so here we have one ptr okay in order to use a double ptr i'll use star star and here i can write the variable as anything maybe like uh, random equal to address of ptr okay address of ptr and how to print this very first we'll be going ahead with the print print f and we are going to see what address this is holding model as p comma ptr sorry random that was our variable random okay and now how to retrieve the data from this will be model as t because it is the int type star star random and that's how i will be able to retrieve the data 
If it is a double pointer, I can go ahead with the double star. Can we use triple star? Yes, we can. In that case, we will have to put triple star to get the data. Can we use four star? Yes, we can go ahead. It is just storing the address, right? So we can go ahead and store the address in that way. So if you see, so first few values are same, but the later few values are little different. Okay, so this was all about double or triple or four pointers. If you want to go ahead and store different values, definitely you can go ahead and utilize that. Moving ahead with this pointers with arrays. And most of the people will say that this is a hell complex topic. But I will say this is the most easiest topic you are going to witness. Okay, because you already know about pointers, this will be a piece of cake work. So imagine we are creating the arrays and how do we do that? We simple, simply create an array of numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 and 5. Let's do that over here. Let me just remove all of this thing here. Int arr equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is one simple array which I have created inside my C program. Now, how will I actually go ahead and use pointers with this array? If, if, if I simply go ahead and print f modulus p comma ampersand of arr, you will see something. You are going to see one small thing that it is holding this value. Cool, good enough. Now let me create one simple pointer int star ptr equal to address of arr and let me print the value for this print f okay modulus p backslash n comma ptr okay so you will see that what's happening over here is it is having the exact same address yes so Whenever we are creating the array, how it actually works is it is going to hold, array is going to hold only the memory location of memory location of first element. Okay. If I go ahead and show you that, that if, if in case I'm just going ahead with the memory location of zero is still nothing will change for ptr okay still nothing is changing for ptr but whereas if i go ahead with one you will see there will be a difference okay that means there is a difference but if you are going ahead with the first element nothing is changing which means that even if you're assigning that to ptr or even if you are assigning it to arrays the address of first value is going to be same so your arrays is actually working more or less like your pointer only cool good tell here coming back over here okay so what exactly we are doing with this data is uh, we are going to see how different locations of arrays are occupied and how exactly we store the elements okay for that i would have to go with the loop to show you things in a little better way for i equal to zero i less than five because we have total five elements i plus plus and print f modulus p backslash n comma arr of i definitely that is required so arr of i is required if i do this you will see that okay we definitely need ampersand okay so that is storing data in how see first few things are very same okay then it is going to 4 8 and then it went to c and then it went to 56 so as it is storing hexadecimal codes let me just clear this out. The memories are stored in hexadecimal. So it goes from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B, C, D, E, F. I guess this is 16, 9, 10, 11, 12, 15, 16. It goes only till E. Okay. 
so this is how your hexadecimal codes are saved and this is how your data is getting operated so very first if your first element is stored at zero which is over here if your first element is stored over here let's suppose the number was one so it's going to take four bytes of memory it's going to occupy four bytes of memory the so next value will be present at four if you see next value which is present at address 4 integer we have already seen in replicate it is taking 4 bytes of memory so the second value will be present over here and it is also going to occupy 4 bytes of memory it's also going to occupy 4 bytes of memory next value will be present over here which is 3 and then it is also going to occupy 4 bytes of memory and next value will be present over here if you see this is how your datas are stored inside array with the memory address and this is what is called contiguous memory location so they are occupying four slots to store one number and every number is adjacent to each other that's why we call this array as contiguous okay contiguous you will be saying okay mr prashant good that they are storing the data uh, in continuous or contiguous form what can we do with this okay i'm saying we can actually print the entire array with the pointers and we can make this process a little faster when we are going directly with the address how exactly we are going to do that and how exactly we can print the data using the pointers so let me just quickly go ahead and write int star etr equal to m percent of arr okay and instead of printing this okay let me remove this how to print the first value print f what will happen if i remove this arr you have to check that as well okay modulus p and see what is ptr what is the value of ptr so what this is exactly going to hold is your address location so it is anyways pointing to the first location so if in case we are not passing percent that is also going to work in a very very similar way and how to print the data if i write uh oh what just happened if i write here ptr it's going to print my first value but yes i have to pass here modulus d because it was in the integer format so what i got is one if i have to go ahead actually i will just copy and paste and use the second value if i want to print the second value so i will actually create one extra bracket in this i will go to the next address plus one will do what it will go to the next address in order to show that i will actually go ahead and use 10 20 30 40 and 50 so that you should not feel the doubt that what we are doing is that we are adding one to the ptr no we are not we are just going to the next memory location okay let me have their backslash n and backslash n let me have one more thing over here which is printing it again so it will print 10 20 and 20 why 20 because we are not updating the value of ptr so we will have to pass the 2 in order to get my third value this is how we go ahead and use ptr in order to get my values what will ha happen if i use star ptr plus plus let's check that out okay and will this really give me my value so it is giving 10 20 30 so right now we are incrementing the value of ptr and it is going to the next next element but this will result into something that ptr will no longer be able to access my first location it will lose the track of my first pointer first variable first data so in order to get back over there i have to again use minus minus in order to come back over there okay so this is how we use arrays pointers to print the data using pointer can we go ahead and print it using the for loop as well yes int i equal to zero i less than five i plus plus and as we are already having that in the ptr print f modulus t comma star ptr plus plus okay and this will print my entire array 
even we can use the plus i thing to get the data in case we are not willing to increment the value of ptr even this will do the same task it will also print 10 20 30 40 and 50 so both the things are doing the same task and using these locations we will be able to update the value in little faster time in little lesser time moving ahead how the pointer works with the string as you know the strings are sequence of characters and they are also arrays of characters so it is going to work in a very similar way how it is working with the arrays but still let's have a look at how strings work with the pointers very first let's have the string str ing and how do we create this string char name equal to prashant yes so this is how we are creating the string but moving here how we are creating the string over here is directly assigning the values to the pointer variable so there are two ways one create the string in separate variable and then assign it to the pointer let's do that char name equal to prashant that's one thing we can create a char star ptr equal to name and then it is going to hold the first character value let me just go ahead and print f my modulus c comma star ptr let's see what are we getting so we will be getting the first character and what we have to do is we have to continuously keep on going with plus one or plus 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 in order to go to the next data okay and this is going to print my exact value not the star plus plus this is going to my print my pra okay how did it not okay we missed plus plus over here so as we were using post increment it gave ppr now it will give pra okay this is how we can still go ahead and print the entire string that's one thing or else we can directly assign value to this mishra you can directly assign the values to this now it will no longer be pointing to your prashant but to this direct string which is your mishra even we can go ahead and use this for our strings and we can directly create a pointer rather than creating the arrays of characters and utilize this information to make changes using ptr only can we update the values of characters using ptr let's have a try let's have a look so ptr star ptr right now it is pointing to name okay let's suppose it is pointing to name the star ptr equal to i'm going to write m over there okay star ptr equal to m and let's see what exactly this will do print f modulus s comma name okay let's click on run and you will see that it is changing it to okay where is m it's missing <laughs> okay so m is actually missing over here what it did is it actually just deleted it okay because of this character thing now let me just go ahead and check that it is Rashad. so what we what mistake we did was it was double quotation and double quotation is not considered as your characters so it was creating the problem over there okay so star let's suppose i want to change this a to l okay so star ptr plus 2 equal to l okay and that's how that will also get changed it will be ml l s h a n t and the very same way we can also update your arrays because this is again we are working on arrays only anyways so we can even update the arrays in a very similar way let's go ahead and try out something more with the pointers pointers with the functions now this thing is actually very important 
but we are going to cover this in the next video as this topic is little bit big and very important. Hello and welcome to the second part of this function. So after thinking a lot, I got to know that uh, pointers with the functions could be explained in a little better way. And instead of going ahead and telling you every single thing, like how to pass different things inside the functions with the pointers, let's go ahead with a simple example. And that's how you'll be able to understand how pointer actually works inside your function. So let's go ahead with a very simple example of addition of two numbers using functions and pointers in which we will be passing two values. So we'll be creating a function add and here we will be passing int a comma int b but as they are pointer variables i will have to use the star star over here and while calling i will simply give ptr1 comma ptr2 so let's go ahead and see how this could actually work and make our code good so we'll be returning the integer value only because we'll be adding star a star b so int add int star a comma int star b so that's how we take arguments as input and what we are doing is we are returning that in the result we are adding that value and putting that in the result what is star a plus star b and then what exactly we are going to do is we are going to return this integer value result okay we did this integer value result or if you really wanted to store that in a itself or if you really want to store that value in the result we are also going to see that now we will be having uh, the data int a equal to 10 comma p equal to 5 and we will have int star ptr1 equal to a or the address of a and int star ptr2 is going to have address of b let me have and make a small spaces over here and while calling this add i will simply write ptr1 comma ptr2 because we were doing what we were actually uh, sending the pointer variable over here if you can see the same we did and because the result was there we will store this in the int result or interest equal to this and then we can result the value int f modulus t comma result backslash n so we'll also explain like how things are working so over here we made few mistakes which is definitely this so let's avoid that here we need to write backslash n which was causing the simple error so what we got as the input is 10 plus 5 equal to 15 how it actually worked is something which you need to understand in a little generic and general way with the dry run code so very first we had two values a and b so after taking those two values over here we created two pointer variables ptr1 and ptr2 and while calling the function uh, instead of passing the numbers i directly passed the address the pointer variables and in order to accept this address i have to use star a and star b and why int because i am passing integer type of data or the address of integer type of data and that's why in order to welcome them i have to put here int only so it is very similar to let's suppose a japanese guy or a japanese guest is coming who don't know english or who don't know anything so we need to arrange one person to welcome them who also knows japanese so that they can actually guide them where to go and what to do or what to eat or where to take rest or where to uh, give the conference possibly or where to show the demo of the product or whatever things are so this person guide or whoever will be responsible must know japanese to welcome that japanese guest okay this is in the very same way if in case you are having int here that means this is a guide who is here to welcome a guest which is coming from here okay there are the two things which are very very similar and now because we really wanted to return the result which will be in the integer form which will be the result of a and b and in order to get the data 
out of it we use a star a and a star b which will be having the value 10 and 5 as given from here 10 and 5 and the same value was returned as a result which we got over here and we printed it let's suppose we have third variable and if in case we really don't want to go ahead and return anything okay so in that case what we can have is void and we can have one more thing which is result and we are keeping its initial value as zero whatever will be the result of a and b we will keep that in the result so let's create one more pointer int star rptr equal to address of res okay address of res and we will pass that third rptr over here and in order to welcome that int star rptr is something which i am keeping so let me just remove this what we are going to do is star rptr equal to star a plus star b so i am changing the current value of rptr and in that case i really do not have to return anything so what i can do is i can directly print star rptr and i will actually get the result and in order to show you this is magic okay model st i will actually get the result this is magic uh oh it is equal to zero why are we not calling the function and yes we were not calling the function so here i need to pass my ptr1 ptr2 and rptr cool and now if we run it it is definitely going to be a magic because of rptr how this is working so whatever was the result of star a which is equivalent to 10 plus star b which is equivalent to 5 we got the result as 15 and we updated it to the location memory location of rptr we updated it to the memory location of rptr and that's how we don't need to return anything and that's how we were able to use and utilize the same variable to get your data updated in the rptr and that's how this seems more like a magic and this program is working flawlessly in front of you this is how we use pointers with the functions even if you are not passing the value this is how we can update the value so if you understood give it a like and we'll meet you in the next topic till then see you tata bye bye hello and welcome to this new topic which is file handling and this will be the last topic probably in your c and post that we may go ahead and do some questions but we may also do some questions at the end that matters about how we are approaching towards it and post completion of file handling after discussion of some questions like how we should approach those sort of questions we will start our c language not c language we will start our c plus plus language and that is going to be a game changer knowledge though because you already know c language it will be a piece of cakewalk to move ahead with c plus plus because all the syntax and everything is almost same just few changes here and there one more thing your c language is supported in your c plus plus so if in case you forget your c plus plus code you can easily put your c language code and it will work without any errors without any problem so let's go ahead and see what is file handling and why do we need it going ahead file is nothing but a container in the computer storage what is file so file is just a simple container where we can store some information imagine it's more like a text file what happens what we store there we store their text imagine a folder what do we do there we store our normal text files right so it is very similar to this only files are nothing but collection of something where we can put something so here we are putting our text with the help of the c programming moving ahead why do we need files okay so you have seen me writing bunch of codes and you have also seen me creating bunch of data be it the student grades be it the student marks be it about some sort of uh, numbers be it checking if it is a prime number or not a lot of different things right but as soon as we close that file what happens things are gone okay 
things are just simply gone from your console and they will not come back if i simply refresh the data whatever was there inside the console will probably go and you won't be able to get it back or whenever you're closing in like keeping your programs on you won't be able to see those outputs or if you're running your program again your output will change so in order to avoid these sort of problems and in order to go ahead store the data we actually use our files and then we also use files to store large numbers inside our files let's suppose you want to store all the students data inside our file and you want to access it back from there itself in those cases also files are very handy also you can easily move your data from one place to another by downloading it and moving it to the other computer so that will also be very feasible with the files moving ahead we have four operations or five operations or almost six operations to do inside your files very first is creating a file okay the very first operation is creating a file then we have the operation of reading from the file then we have writing from the file then we have appending which is again a process of writing only but that is done separately and then we have closing the file so these are the four main important things which we have to do inside the file we will be creating text files with our code itself and we will be giving it some name in that we'll be writing some content we'll be reading that and then we'll also close that so moving ahead let's see how this could be done so creating and closing a file if in case you want to create a file close a file or work with the file so you have to get your very first thing which is your file keyword and everything will be managed by a pointer inside file so you also need to create one pointer so here i have used one file type of pointer what file is over here it is a data type what is that capital f i l e it is a data type and for that particular data type i'm creating a pointer and using this we are going to create a file and in order to create a file what we do is we simple write one command f ptr because this is where i will be assigning all the values i'll use f open so basically we are going to open or create both are the same thing here we will write our name of the file name.txt txt is the extension so basically we are working with the text file comma and here we will be giving the extensions in order to write the write in the file we give the extension as w but if in case that file is not present it is going to also create the file so let's see how this is going to work f ptr basically the same pointer which we created over here we'll write f open inside this we will write the name as rashant.txt and we'll give the extension as not we'll give the uh, uh, command as w which is for writing and as soon as i run this here you can see this is why i have got this open here you can see all the files this is where your file will get created if i click on run you will see prashant.txt got created and here let's add some data hey i am prashant i love coding and we are learning c lang okay language so that is the data which i have kept inside my text file now what we are going to do is once we have opened it up what we did we created the file so one of the four process is done creation of the file is done opening an existing file now if in case you want to open an existing file you have to use the same method you have to use the same approach but there it will not create your new file if in case i run it it's not going to create my new file but the data present inside that will get deleted that is one thing we should know because of this extra added thing because of this extra extension things will respond if in case you already have a i am prashan and if you don't want to delete that data we will pass a over here so there are different things which we need to keep in mind that whether the data should go or not 
so we have to pass three things or more than three things very first is w which is responsible for writing this will do what this will wipe up all the data in case we just want to read we will write r as the extension and this will allow us to read the data from the file if in case we want to append the data add data at the end without deleting it so we will use a which is for appending if in case we want to do both read and write we can use w plus or r plus so this will do one thing that this will allow both read and write but in this case your file should be created if it is not created you are going to get the error okay so creation is done let's go ahead towards the reading of the file how do we read something or oh, let's go ahead and close the file so we write f close and then we give the pointer f ptr so this is how we even close the file okay and because we were appending it as uh, we were creating it as append nothing got deleted then we will be creating it as w things will actually get deleted from the file it will wipe off all the data okay now we are done with writing reading not reading okay we are done with creating so and closing now what thing is left is reading writing and appending so let's go ahead and write something in order to write inside your file we use f printf so it is very similar to printf only but in front of it we use f printf so the very first command will go will be your pointer variable fptr and then the text which you really wanted to print let's suppose hello from prashant and I will give back less n. So it will get saved as hello from Prashant over here. And this will also create your second line so that whenever you are working with your next data, it should get changed. Okay. Now, if in case I do not have that, I want to store that into one string. Let's see if we can go ahead and add that. What is the string name? And what is the name? Prashant Mishra okay that is the name which i really wanted to store so let's remove this part hello from prashant and instead of this let's have simple name let's see if this string is going to get added to my file or not so if you can see that actually got added so if in case you are adding the name directly or using one of the variable okay that is going to make the changes inside your file so we also did writing part now let's do the appending part because if i am writing again and again my previous data is getting lost in that case what we can do is we can open it as a and next what we want to append is let's suppose we want to append vijay prakash okay that is the second name which i really want to append but we were not having backslash and to which it will get added right after that let me just break this up and go to the next line and give a backslash n after every name. Next is I want to add Sachin. Okay. I'll click on it and I'll see that that text got added. But because of backslash n is not working, that is one thing which is little odd. So even we can try uh, putting backslash n from here or maybe we can try putting backslash n in a different line. Print F, FPTR, comma, backslash N. After every name, we want that backslash N. Let's remove that and enter that as well to a different line. And here we are going to run. So Sachin will get added twice and we'll even create one more line. Now let's go ahead and add Virat. Okay, I'll go ahead and add that that will quickly get added to my file that's how we go ahead and append things into your file now let's start this up from the very beginning so that will be a practice to you file okay file star fptr okay fptr is the pointer it's a, just a variable name you can give any name over there now fptr equal to f open and inside this we'll give the 
text file name which is prashant.txt basically we are going to read from it so i will mention it as r okay i mentioned it as r and now in order to read something from your file you have to use f gets and where exactly you will read that into a variable so let's also create one variable our variable is um, input okay so char input and we also have to give the size let's suppose i want to give the size as 50 okay that is the data which i want to store so very first place i will be passing that i want to get my data in the input what is the size of the string 50 i can only get that much character 50 characters inside this input and what is the file pointer fptr so those are the things which i have to pass in the fkits and that will store data in my input variable now i'm going ahead and simply printing this up mod less s input and let me just go ahead and click on run and you will see that it is coming over here and once we are done it is always advised to close your file fptr okay so we are closing our file okay we saw that there is one error okay it is f gets let's click on run and there we go so we got our data from the file but you will say that there was multiple data you only got prashant mishra so yes your f gets can only get one line from your file so how to get the entire thing from your file in that case we have to use the looping condition let's remove this part okay let's remove this part and write while f gets and the same process we have to pass the input comma 50 comma every single time this input will get emptied and it will have a newer value the uh, older value will get removed let's suppose for the first line it was prashant mishra it will print prashant mishra next time whenever it is going up the older values uh, will get deleted okay input comma 50 comma f ptr and this will start and here we are going to simply print f modulus s comma input okay now this is going to do what it is going to print every single character one by one and why because we yet have not given backslash n how it is coming because that is also getting imported from your text itself so new line means backslash n only that's how i can still get my data so i need no i don't actually need to put that backslash n in order to get my data full data okay so prashant mr vijay prakar sachin sachin virat so that was there in our file and the same got printed in the console as well and that's how we read every single thing from your file so we did all the things creating reading writing appending and closing of the file so we are good with the files we understood all the things creating closing writing appending reading and every single thing is done now let me just give you a simple question and see if we can go ahead and do that okay now what we are going to do is we are going to store students data okay we are going to store a students data okay and what exactly are we going to store very first we will be taking the name and then we will be taking the age that has to go with the spaces that has to go with the spaces we are taking the name we are taking the age and then we are taking um, one more data marks okay we are taking three data input from the user every single time let's suppose we are going for 10 students so we need to run a loop for 10 times and we need to put this data into our file which will be student.txt student.txt let's see if we can go ahead and create this up i'll simply remove everything from this so let that file be present over there prashant.txt we don't need it if in case you want to delete that you can right click on this three dot and you can click on delete even if you want to download the data you can click on download and the data will get downloaded and you can use this txt file inside your system to display the data or you can transfer this to your friend possibly to your family members possibly to your teachers your colleagues to whoever you want to do 
let me just go ahead and simply get started with my question so what my question is my question is that we have to create one file student.txt so let's do that data type file star fptr and then fptr equal to f open and it will be student.txt and it will be in the form of ww is used to create the file let me run it and show you if the file got created or not if you see student.txt got uh, created and it is present with us next is after creating it what do we need to do let's also close it f close fptr okay so we are closing it and we'll move it to the end now we are over here what do we need to do is next is we need to take three things input from the user and we need to insert that in one single line we need to insert that inside one single line let's see how we can go ahead and put that up inside our file and this will have little bit of problem but we'll overcome that problem very very soon now we are going to run a loop for 10 times because we only want to enter 10 data okay int i equal to 0 i is less than 10 i plus plus okay here we want to get the data from the student now what is the very first data which i really want to get as my name f gets and here we want to pass the file name so where exactly are we going to take a name over here care name and here i'm going to write my size as 50 okay and how to use f gets very first i'll use name then size of then here I will pass my name variable comma stdin because we are taking the input from the user and that we are uh, putting that in the name next is int h let also take that variable outside int h comma marks those are the two values which I want the user to enter so scan f modulus d modulus d comma h comma marks if in case you also want to display something on the odd side you can do that but let's simply go ahead i would say if in case you want to display you can just have you just have to give printf like enter your name enter your name okay and this will take the data of the name next is you have to ask the user to enter your marks and the user will enter the marks and then let's not take this all together let's take it separately sorry enter your age and next will be enter your let me just copy this up and paste it over here enter your marks and this will be modulus d marks and because it is a scan f it will go with the ampersand go with the ampersand cool so we are good with that and now we are going to write that data inside the file we are going to write the data inside the file and how exactly are we going to write it that matters very first we'll do f print f we want to enter the name of the student so fptr comma name fptr comma name and then we want to give that extra space we want to give that extra space and how do we do that using backslash t which is an escape sequence to give an extra space fptr comma backslash t that will give the extra space now what exactly are we going to enter let me just copy this because this will be required next is we are going to enter the age so let me just put here age and then next is we want to enter the marks and after entering the marks, we are going to the next line. We are going to the next line. And this process will repeat 10 times. 10 will be very big number and I will get tired to enter that. So let's go with only three data, okay? And once it is done, we'll see if it is working good with our files. It may have certain issues. So let's run it and see how it is going. Very first is Prashant. The age is 45, marks is 99. And it says segmentation fault core dumped and why exactly the core is dumped because of your inputs okay hold on if you do not get our total result 
that will be a little bad let's see so it's running good till here okay so let's do a small change over here instead of going separately those many different f print f let's go with only one f print f print f and here we will be writing fptr comma and let's give it like this name modulus s and let's also give backslash n before that okay name will be modulus s and i will give backslash t to give the space your age will be modulus t and i will give the space with backslash t and my marks will be modulus d and now i need to provide the data name comma h comma marks now it, if it is having the error it will be in the one f printf only and it should not be giving us a lot of trouble so enter your name p r a s h e n t enter your age 45 99 okay it's working good till now sachin 44 and 56 okay so it is only taking two inputs okay zero one and two it should go for three but it is only taking two let's see what is the data which is coming over here in student.txt so it printed more like name prashant and after that it broke so let's see where it is creating the issue okay that could have happened because of the f gets because f gets also gets uh, gets your last uh, data if you're entering as if you're hitting the enter it also captures your enter or the space and that is how it can actually get your entire thing so if in case you just want to have your first name instead of this we can have this scanf as well so this will only work very well with the first name and here we can have our name so let's see if this is working good with this what we will do is enter your name prashant and then i'll go ahead with 3499 vijay and vijay is five years old and his marks is 70. now it's working okay then sachin he is two years old and his marks is zero okay and that should be the data which could have got stored inside our student.txt and if i see this so that is the data how we are able to get and if in case you want to read the data or if in case you want to add the data make sure next time you are not opening it as w and you are opening it as a which is not going to delete the data but instead add the data inside the file x y z is having seven years old got 88 marks a b c is eight years old got 78 uh, QWE is 9 years old, got 99. So that data is actually added. So whenever if you're running that data, that data will get added and get appended if you're opening it as A. And if in case you want to read it, you just have to use F gets in order to read this file. We have already done this before. You can get the entire line, uh, read it into one. You know how to do that. So that will be your part of assignment. So just check that out if I can do that. If not, you can just go back and watch the entire recording. And that is the end of our C programming. And congratulations, you did a great job. Post this, we will be discussing about on uh, like how to go ahead and solve different questions and how to approach a question with different logics and how to utilize all our information. And then we will be jumping towards our C++ information and we'll learn C++ from here on. Till then, take care. Bye-bye. Tara. Hello and welcome to this video where we are going to solve different questions in order to understand the topics of C programming a little better. So moving ahead with direct questions without wasting any single more second. The very first question is to write a program to find greatest of three numbers. So in order to do this program, we very first have to find greatest of two numbers using the if condition. So let's see how we can exactly find the greatest of two numbers and then we will check how we can find greatest of three numbers. Now, in order to find greatest of two numbers, we actually have to take two values a equal to 10 and b equal to 5. And what do we have to do is we need to check using the if condition if a is greater than b, then a is greater else your b is greater. 
okay this is what we are going to print and then we'll see how to find greatest of three numbers moving ahead to our replet and directly taking two values int a equal to 10 comma b equal to 5 these are the two values now we need to tell which number is having the greatest value if a is greater than b print f a is greater which for which you can even print the value okay a equal to modulus d is greater and here we can give the value as r a and we can also give backslash n moving ahead with the else part else so if a is not greater definitely your b will be greater so b equal to modulus d is greater and here we will have backslash n and here we will write our variable b so let's go ahead and click on run and see what it is going to print so if in case my e is greater it is going to print a equal to 10 is greater and if in case that is lower so it will print b equal to 5 is actually greater so what we did over here is we very first compared these two values using the comparison operator of greater than and then based on that because my condition was true that a was actually greater than b this got true and this got printed if in case a was not greater than b so this value will become false and my else case will get executed okay now let's see how we can go ahead and check for three values in this let's suppose the values are a b and c no matter what value they hold what is the condition which we are going to follow very first we are going to compare a with both the variables b and c and we will check if a is greater than b and if a is greater than c so my first condition will be i have to check if a is greater than b and if a is also greater than c if a is greater than b and c both in this case a is greatest okay in this case my a is greatest similarly we are going to do this check with one more variable which is b if b is greater than a and b is also greater than c in this case my b will be greatest and if a is not greatest b is not greatest and we only have three variables in the else part we can directly print that c is the greatest value if you see and so we use double ampersand symbol to replace this and and this will be inside the double brackets and this will be inside my full bracket and using this we are actually going to compare these values and because it has more than one condition it will be checked with else if condition and this will go in the else condition so that is the general structure which we are going to follow moving ahead we'll remove this thing and let's have three values int a equal to uh, 50 b equal to 70 comma c equal to um, let's take it as 10 okay these are the three values and now let's write the condition if a is greater than b and a is greater than c in this case we'll print f what we'll print f a is greatest okay let's also have that backslash n over here now in the next line which will be else if we are going to check the same condition for b if b is greater than a and b is also greater than c in this what we are going to have we are going to print f b is greatest okay and we are going to have backslash n and there we go if b is not greatest a is not greatest definitely your c will be greatest so c is greatest that is what we are going to print so looking at these numbers 50 70 10 definitely my b is greatest so it should print that your b is greatest and that is what we are getting in the output that means it is correct now keeping my c value highest let's see if it is giving as c is greatest and yes it gave now keeping my a value as the highest and it should give us a is greatest so all three conditions are checked and verified and this is the program for finding greatest of three numbers if in case you want to go ahead and find for four numbers you have to use the same technique use some more ampersand if a is greater than b and a is greater than c and a is greater than d so in this way you will be telling that a is greatest and a very similar approach you will use multiple else if to check with b c as well and if nothing of a b c is greatest definitely your d will be greatest and that's how we approach this particular problem moving ahead 
माई नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन से इज स्वैप द नंबर और स्वैप द वैल्यूज ऑफ टू नंबर वॉट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ स्वैपिंग लेट सपोज हेयर वी हैव टू वेरिएबल्स ए एंड बी द इनिशियल कंडीशन इज दैट ए इज टेन एंड बी इज ट्वेंटी आफ्टर स्वैप माई वैल्यू शुड बी ए शुड हैव ट्वेंटी एंड बी शुड हैव द वैल्यू एज टेन सो द वैल्यूज आर गेटिंग इंटरचेंज एंड दिस इज द मीनिंग ऑफ स्वैपिंग ऑफ two numbers in this condition we will be using our third variable let's suppose you have two glasses okay you have two glasses one is having red liquid in it one is having red liquid the other is having blue liquid in it the other is having blue liquid so in order to interchange the uh, content or the liquid of these two glasses we will need a third glass very first what we will do is will pour from red glass to the gray glass which is let's suppose my glass a this is my glass b and this is my glass c i'll pour from this glass to my empty glass this is my third variable which we are going to take and now my a will be empty because i removed all the content from my a and i kept it where in my c variable so let's go and draw that my c is filled with red liquid and now because a is empty i'm going to pour b content to here i'll pour my b content to here and this will be filled with my blue liquid this will be filled with my blue liquid now because the blue liquid is over there this will be empty so from my third variable i will keep my liquid from c to b and this is how it is going to have the red liquid now if you see what is the result let's remove the third variable because that's not needed now my values are actually interchanged with the help of the third variable if you see the red one has blue liquid and the blue one has red liquid this is what we have to do while swapping the values in order to go ahead with those approach what we will be doing is we'll take two values int a equal to 10 comma b equal to 20 okay and now we'll take one temp variable and we are keeping it as empty very first what we will do is temp equal to a okay a equal to b and we will write b equal to temp now before swap this is the condition for swapping by the way i forgot to tell you how to put comments so comments are of two types if in case you don't know what comments are comments are the general notes to the humans they are ignored they are the lines which are ignored by your machines so if in case you want to put single line comment we give double forward slashes if in case you want to go with multi line comments you will start with one forward slash and star and you are going to end with one star and one forward slash and whatever you write in these things it will be a multi line comment multi line comment comments are just simple notes to the humans they are completely ignored if in case i definitely want to write some notes over here that this is the uh, code for swapping and if i simply run this it is going to throw some error that it is not knowing what is this right so the error is right over here so i just want to keep it as notes so i'll write double four slash in front of it and it is going to get ignored now my machine or my code will not throw any error okay so this is after swap and we are going to write the uh we are going to print the value before swap okay this is going to be my before swap print let me just print it print f a equal to modulus d comma b equal to modulus t here i will have a comma b here i am printing my a comma b so before swap my a value is 10 and my b value is 20 i'll have a backslash n over here after swapping i am going to print the same thing okay i am going to print the same thing and let's see what is the difference in the output this is after swap print i am going to print exact same line i am not going to change anything over here okay so if you see the values are changed initially it was 10 and 20 now it is 20 and 10 so this is how we are using a third variable in order to change your Uh, values or interchange the or change the values of a and b and this is called swapping of two numbers our next program says program to find factorial of a number first of all let's understand what is the meaning of factorial so if in case 
we are writing factorial of 5 okay this is how we represent factorial with the exclamation mark so this simply means that we are going to multiply 5 and we are going to lower down the number 4 3 2 and 1 so whatever is the result let's suppose the result is 120 so whatever is the result will be displayed so this is the factorial of 5 so if i say 5 factorial i am going to print 120 and this is how we calculate we'll keep on reducing the number till 1 okay we'll keep on reducing the number till 1 we won't go to 0 because if we multiply it with 0 it will be 0 so that will be wrong we keep on going till 1 or we can still keep on going till 2 only to reduce that one simple thing but let's let's actually go till one because we have to avoid any confusion and i really don't want to confuse you guys if in case we are saying factorial of seven it will be like seven into four sorry seven into six into five into four into three into two into one so from that number to every number till the bottom we are going to multiply and that is the value which we are going to display now in this case what exactly we are going to do is program to find factorial of a number and in this case what exactly we are going to do is we are going to have one result value int result and we are going to store one in it why exactly one because we are going to multiply this data with my number seven five seven six five four three two one and if i keep it as zero and if you keep on multiplying with the zero my output will be zero so by uh, any chance i cannot accept that zero as the output so i have to keep the value as one cool so let me just go ahead and use the code while loop and how exactly we are going with the while loop every single time we'll be reducing the number by one so let's go ahead and i'm putting my condition while my num is greater than one while my num is greater than one if it is lesser than one my condition will stop what is num over here we need to tell that as well so my int is int num is that number for which we need to find the factorial okay so we are finding the factorial of five and we will change the value to see what is the value inside this we have to multiply result equal to result into num and every single time i have to reduce my num num minus minus every single time i have to reduce my num how this will work is for the very first time when the value is 5 it will be result equal to result into num which is 5 so the value of result was 1 so 1 into 5 is equal to 5 now your result has the value 5 and your num will reduce by 1 num minus minus in the next iteration it will be result equal to result into 4 and result was the value 5 so 5 into 4 which will have the value 20 now okay in the next iteration it will be result equal to result into 3 so let's keep the direct value result into 3 which will be 60 in the next iteration it will be result equal to 60 into 2 which will be 120 in the next iteration result equal to 120 into 1 which will be 120 only so this is my final answer this is where i'm going to stop as soon as my value of num goes lesser than 1 i will have to stop okay so num minus minus and at the very bottom i'm going to print my final result factorial of modulus d is modulus d and here in the very first time i'm going to pass num factorial of 5 is result okay and let's see if the factorial of 5 is actually 120 or not so it says factorial of 5 is 120 let's go for 4 it should be um i guess 24 if i'm not wrong let's see okay so factorial of 4 is sorry this is not good and okay yes because we are reducing the num to 1 and that's why it is having this problem okay that's why it is having this problem so we can store that value somewhere else we can have int um temp equal to num and we can instead of going with the num let's not change the value of num let's not uh 
reduce the value of num because anyways we will lose the value of it so instead of that we can use uh, a copy version of it and i am putting here as temp okay and that's how your original value will be reflected over here which will be your num okay factorial of 4 is 24 okay let me just go ahead and run it run it for uh, possibly 45 it will be a very big number okay so factorial of 45 is 0 because it is not getting stored inside your int value so for that i have to use my long int okay and we have to use ld in order to print that data sorry not here here i have to use ld in order to print my data okay let's see if it is able to store it and again uh, that number factorial of 45 is actually very big and that's why the number couldn't be stored and we have to go with long long int and here we have to use lrd okay let's see if long long int can actually store that number um nope it is going far beyond let's go only till 15 let's see if 15 could be stored okay for 15 it is coming 45 is a very big number and we have to use uh, unsigned long long int okay in order to get that because we are not going in negative value so we can actually use unsigned long long int in order to get our data okay unsigned long long int and this is lld we can even print it with lld and we can even print it with uh, lli okay so let's suppose we are going till 30 let's see if 30 is getting printed so for 30 now again the value is so big that it is not coming in this uh, integer and that's why we have to use big int and which is a very advanced topic which we'll learn in c programming anyways okay big int is something where we can go till a 64 digit value and here we are getting i guess uh, let's let's go and check for 19 if 19 could be done so if it is a very big value we cannot go beyond that value for 19 itself it is going 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 16 17 18 and in big end we can go till 64 characters okay so let's leave it this is your program to find the factorial of a number though if the number is very big it's going to have some problem with the ints and in that case we have to use big end which we will see in coming future cool let's go ahead with our next question program to find the number is prime or not so what is the condition for a prime it should have two factors should have two factors one and itself so basically what is the meaning of factor that the number should be divisible by one and itself is one your prime number no why because it is not having two factors okay so two three five seven eleven thirteen seventeen nineteen and 23 all those are your prime numbers so we have to check if the given number is prime or not how do we check it that we need to understand let's suppose if we are finding for 11 okay so what we will do is we will run a loop from 2 to 10 we will run a loop from 2 to 10 and in this case we will check if any number is dividing 11 because 1 is already dividing it and we know that uh, every number is divisible by 1 so we will uh, skip that part if any number from the range 2 to 10 is dividing how we got 10 one lesser than that number if you are going till 17 if you are checking 17 is prime or not so we'll go with one lesser than that number in this case we'll check only till 16 so if in this range any number is dividing my value 11 that means it's not prime because it's divisible by more than one value okay and if it is not divisible by any number in this range that means the number is prime and how do we go ahead with this using the loop so let's go ahead and use for loop in order to start with this problem program to find prime numbers okay and in this case what exactly we will do int num for this we are going to check if the number is prime or not and we will start from 2 okay initially we'll take int prime equal to 1 by default we are considering that the number is prime okay let's suppose you wanted to go to 
mall okay and you really want to buy uh, some clothing on sale so by default you will imagine that the sale is going on after reaching there you will actually check if the sale is going on or not or if the market was open or not or the, if the shop was open or not okay and that is how we are being very optimistic in the very beginning that the number is positive but if in case while we reach there we check if the number is divisible by any other number we'll make it false okay so instead of that uh, for that for the same situation we are keeping prime equal to 1 now we are running the loop int i equal to 2 i less than what number the number which we are having i plus plus and we are checking if any number if any number is dividing my num if num mod less i equal to equal to 0 what i'm doing over here is i'm checking that if any number is dividing num and leaving the remainder 0 what means if it is uh, leaving the remainder as 0 that means the number is completely divisible and in this case it won't be prime so we'll change the value of prime to 0 that means i'm changing my prime to 0 and i'm keeping it as false and because my prime already became false i need no longer to go ahead i can even break my loop i can even break my loop once i'm finding that it is already not prime i can break my loop okay and here itself i can have a print of a statement that number is not prime backslash n and later on once the loop is over and still if you are not getting anything like that that means my prime will be one so i'm checking if prime equal to equal to one in this case i am printing number is prime even if you want to get that number in the result you can have modulus d is prime okay so i'm not uh, getting that number even you can go ahead and put that in the else case like number was not prime so it depends where you want to keep that data it's totally up to you okay so i'll also explain like how things work okay don't worry so 17 is prime let's go with 18 and it will say that 18 is not prime okay 18 is not prime let's go with 19 it will say that 19 is actually prime and if it is saying that 19 is prime that means we are good with our program what we did is initially we got the number for which we are checking if the number is prime or not by default we are assuming that number will be prime we are running a loop from 2 we are running a loop from 2 to n minus 1 or num minus 1 which is if it is 17 we will only go till 16 and every single time we are increasing number if any number from 2 to n minus 1 is dividing that number completely and leaving the remainder 0 we are changing the prime to 0 and we are breaking the loop instantly and then here outside the loop we are telling if prime is, is still equal to equal to 1 that means there was no number which was dividing my number there was no number from 2 to n minus 1 which was dividing my number and it has prime number but if that has happened and prime value became 0 that means the number is not prime and this is how we go ahead and find if the number is prime or not now going to the fifth program write a program to print reverse of a number using while loop in this situation we cannot actually use for loop so we will anyway have to use while loop only so if my number is one two three four five so i have to get five four three two one or if the number is nine one four zero so i have to get four one nine i have to remove this zero from here because keeping zero in front is actually not applicable is not up to the mark okay now let's see how we can reverse a number using a while loop in this situation we'll have to start it from the very beginning program to reverse a number i will request you to keep uh, these projects ready give a hands-on right with me with these videos and that is how you will be able to practice things and that's how you will also have all the codes ready with you okay program to reverse a number let's have the number int num equal to one four five six seven maybe that is my number i will run this loop till my number is opposite sorry till my number becomes zero while num is greater than zero i'm going to run till my num is greater than zero basically what we are going to apply what is the logic for this let's suppose we have the number 123 very first we are going to divide this number by 10 
what we will get is we will get the quotient as 12 and we will get the remainder as 3 right let me just do that in front of you 123 and 10 ones are tens 2 will be the remainder and 3 will come from here and 2s are 20 and 3 will be the remainder so i am keeping this in the remainder i am keeping the quotient separately okay now when we have those two things separately this is my value which i want to keep at the first place this is my value which i want to keep at the first place so we'll have one result or reverse in which we'll assign zero in which we'll assign zero so how we are exactly going to do is we'll write reverse equal to reverse into 10 plus this quotient whatever sorry this remainder whatever is the remainder and what exactly will happen is initially it was 0 so reverse into 10 will be 0 plus remainder this will become 0 plus 3 and it will be 3 this is for the first iteration and now we are going to do the same task with your q the quotient we are going to do the same task with the quotient now we are going to divide the quotient 12 by 10 so 10 ones are 10 and the remainder is 2 so the quotient is 1 and the remainder is 2 so we'll do the same logic reverse equal to reverse into 10 plus your remainder so what is the current value of reverse it is 3 from here this is the current value so this will come over here so 3 into 10 plus your remainder which is 2 it will become 30 plus 2 and it will become 32 and if you see we are reaching close to our let me just go ahead we are reaching close to our things this is going to be 2 next value which you, I want here is 1 so we are going with the next iteration what was my quotient quotient was 1 we are going to do the same thing 10 once so 10 zeros are 0 and the remainder is 1 so the quotient is 0 I will keep on going till my quotient becomes 0 and the remainder is 1 we will put the same formula rev equal to rev into 10 rev is actually one a short form or the abbreviation of uh, reverse which we are using and here we are going to pass the remainder so right now what is the reverse value 32 so 32 into 10 plus my remainder 1 32 into 10 which will be 320 plus 1 it becomes 321 and this is how my entire thing is working so 123 was the number and the reverse which we got is 3 to 1 this is how things are going to work let's go ahead and check this up with our program here we are going to write one more variable int reverse equal to 0 and let's put our logic reverse equal to reverse into 10 plus my remainder and i need to find the remainder yet i have not found my remainder remember yet i have not found my remainder so int remainder equal to how to find the remainder using the modulus so num modulus 10 num modulus 10 by 10 because we were dividing here by the 10 okay now whatever is the remainder be it 0 be it 1 be it 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 that will go and get stored over here cool and now my num i'm changing that to the quotient and how to find the quotient quotient is found let's suppose 120 is my number so i'll divide it by 10 so 12 will be the quotient and how do we find it so 123 divide by 10 and that is what is going to give me the quotient okay and that i'll assign it back to my number and i'm going to send that again to the top okay so num equal to num divided by 10 this is what we have to do we are going to divide it by 10 so the last value is removed as we are working with the integers this thing will not go in the form of decimals and now let's print the value over here print f reverse is modulus t backslash n and comma or reverse okay let's see if we are getting 76541 
seven six five four one let's change the number to 123 and let's see if we are getting three to one we are getting three to one if you see okay let's keep some random number and let's check if we are getting the exact or oh, let's do one thing let's go ahead and keep two three four five six seven eight nine and also zero let's see if we are getting the opposite of that so we are getting nine zero will be removed because that is coming to the front and the value becomes zero if it is not if it is coming to the front it's not applicable so it became nine eight seven six five four three two one that means our code is working very properly with one simple logic of these two codes okay and that is what we are doing i hope you would have understood what we have done in these five questions do give it a try try all the codes with the hands-on practice and if you are trying this then only you will be able to remember just looking at the video won't help you so practice practice and we will be meeting with few more questions in the next video till then tada bye bye see you hello and welcome to the part two of our question series where we are going to start with 10 questions and this is going to be the last video of c programming along with its question and post this video we will be starting our uh, C++ if in case we feel that the video is going longer we may break this into two parts but let's get started and do it at one time so here I have prepared 10 questions and these questions are very important five questions were done in the previous video so including of all this total we are making and concluding it up to 15 questions and all of these questions are actually important and questions like these are very much uh, visible in your placement exams so do make sure that you are practicing them well enough and you are also practicing similar type of questions as there are multiple questions uh, on the internet i can really not go ahead and uh, solve all of them so i'm just trying to show how to reach these questions and how to actually see what what sort of logic we have to apply and how to build that logic how to approach a problem is something which i really wanted to show you so i have covered uh, five questions and i'm going to cover 10 more questions over here so the very first question is c program to find occurrence of given character inside the string so what it is saying is that we already have one string okay and the string could be anything let's suppose here i am taking my name or like suppose i'm taking the string as i love coding okay so i just have to uh, print the occurrence of the word o here so one occurrence is over here one occurrence is over here so i have to print that total occurrence was two and for this we definitely have to run the loop and how much time we have to run the loop using the length and how to find length using str len and how to use str len using string dot h header file so this is how we have to go and where exactly we are going to uh, put the counting using a count variable whenever we find that using if condition inside the loop we will actually go ahead and increase the count of these variable so let's go ahead and see how this could be done inside the code program to find the occurrence of one character inside the string okay so very first let's have this string char str equal to let's have a very big string okay my name is prashant and i love coding okay that is the string for which i want to go ahead and find one character the character could be anything let's suppose if you're finding uh, a b c d which we can directly store in some variable or we can directly put it over there in the single quotation now we really have to find the length so we need one int length and we will be using str len and in order to use str len we have to give one string dot h header so has include string dot h oh string dot h okay now my error is also gone moving ahead i'll run the loop from int i equal to zero because the indexing starts from zero i is less than len because i really do not have to go till there because we are starting from zero so we did not have to touch the last part so less than len is something which i have to pass i plus plus and i have to check if my that character 
if my that character so with i what we can do using indexing we can actually fetch the character and i have to check let's suppose for a okay let's suppose how many times we are having a inside this string so if str of i and this is responsible for one single character every single time this character will keep on increasing is equal to equal to a and then i'm going to have count plus plus c o u n t plus plus so for that we'll also need one int count equal to zero initially we are keeping the count length as zero and post where my for loop is ending i will actually print my thing total number of occurrence of variable sorry of character a is modulus b and here we are going to have our count value and here we will also give our backslash n so let's see if this is what we were looking for so it will actually tell how many times a is coming inside this so it says total number of times coming is four one a is over here next a is over here next a is over here and next a is over here so that means our program is working totally fine let's go ahead and find how many times uh o is coming in this string so it will be like three times okay it's two times one is over here love and the other is coding so those many times your o is coming and this is how we find the occurrence of any single character inside this string moving ahead with our next question program to count vowels and consonants in this string so this is how we found one character okay so if we use or logical or which we have seen that before don't you think we can find all the uh, vowels at one go only so let's see what exactly we are going to do very first we will find the length of the string okay and then we are going to check if it is a e i o u and the same we can do with the capital as well a e i o and u if these characters are there will increase our count value count plus plus count plus plus and this count will be the vowel count so we will reduce this vowel count from the len and that will be my consonants counts so total number of vowels and consonants will be displayed let's see how this could be done let me keep my string the same and let me keep my length also the same let me keep the count also the same and instead i will write v count okay which is responsible for vowel count and how exactly i am going ahead is i'll also remove this line okay i found the length and now i'm going ahead from my index 0 to length int i equal to 0 i is less than length i plus plus and then we are going ahead with checking if my that particular character is a e i o or u so if let's have that over a character char v equal to str of i so it will be responsible for the present character of the string so we are traversing after it over every single character so v is going to store your present character at which the iteration is going at which the repetition or the loop is running so if v equal to equal to a or this is how we use logical or v equal to equal to e or v equal to equal to i v equal to equal to o v equal to equal to u in this case if it is a or e or i or o or u we are going to increase the count value count plus plus so we can even have increase more ors and we can have the capital as well over here but we do not want to go ahead and do that why because that will go in different lines and you may get little confused so instead i will go ahead and copy this with the else if condition and i'll change this to capital okay though this could have been done in the same way but let me just go ahead and put it separately okay and rest in the else if it is not my a e i o u in the rest i can increase my consonant count int consonant count though i can even separate that 
with my total length and that will actually give me my consonant count but because we are already running the loop it's okay to go ahead and actually work with the same loop okay and we will be able to avoid any further logic of like subtraction and stuff you don't have to apply our brain now we can directly print f total number of vowels in the string modulus d backslash n and here we have to write v count okay and i'm going to copy the entire string sorry entire print of a statement and i'm going to actually print it over here and i'm going to keep it as c count which is going to be responsible for my consonants count so here i'm going to replace my wall from consonants okay so that is what we actually have to print Let's click on run and see what is the value which we are getting. Total number of vowels are 11, which is surprising. Let's see if they are actually 11. M, Y, N, A, 1. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay. So 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 and 11 it is actually 11 i counted them including this capital i the total number of vowels are 11 and because the total length was something 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 so the consonants are removed from it so this is the actual number of consonants present inside the string so that is how we were able to complete and check how many total number of consonants and vowels are present inside your string so this is the overall approach of finding the consonants and vowels inside your string Moving ahead with the new question, which is sorting of all the characters inside the string. Okay, so we have to do dictionary order sorting. And let's suppose if my name is, or let's suppose if there is any character like random, okay? Random. So very first, what character should come? This should be in the first place. A will come. After that, D will come. Okay, A and D is done then m will come then n will come then o will come and then r will come so this random should be printed as add a d m n o r they should be printed as a d m n o r and in order to get the shorting done we have to actually use nested loops we have to actually use nested loops and what logic we are going to form over here is let's suppose the character was random okay let's suppose the character was random so what I am going to do is I am going to check my R. I am going to check my R with every single value. I am going to check my R with every single value and I am going to check which is the lowest. I am going to check which is the lowest character. So over here A is the lowest character. So I am going to replace my A over here. What I'm going to do is very first I'm going to check with this. So I got A as my lowest character. So I'll replace that over here. A and R and T O M. And again I am checking this with other characters. This already got replaced over here. I'll go to the next. I'll check if anything is lesser than A. N is lesser than A? No. If D is lesser than A? No. If O is lesser than uh, A or no? M is lesser than O and no. So this is my first string which I got. And this is my first iteration. Let me tell you, this is my first iteration. Okay. Next, in next iteration, I will be checking my second character. In next iteration, I will be checking my second character. So I'll go with my second iteration. A value is fixed now. Okay. Now I will check my R and D O M. I'll check between R and N, which is actually bigger. N is actually smaller than R. So it will be R, N, so A, R, A, N, R, D, O, M. And now I am going to check this with further values. I'm going to check with this, D. Is my D smaller or N is smaller? D is actually smaller. So it will change and replace A, D, R, N, O, M. Now I'm going to check with my next character. D is actually smaller than O. Nothing will happen. It's even smaller than M and then nothing will happen. Then my third iteration will start. Now these two values are good. Now my third iteration will start. In the third iteration, I'm going to check with my R. 
A and D are fixed. Let's keep them aside. R and O M. This is the string which we got from the last one. So what we have is we are going to check with R and N. N is actually smaller, so it will be like A D N R O M. I'm going to check with N and O. And my N is actually smaller, so nothing will happen. I'm going to check with this M. M is actually smaller, so it will actually be A D M R O N. And my fourth iteration will start. My this values got fixed. My fourth iteration will start. Fourth iteration. How many iterations will go till we reach the last element? A D M is fixed. Okay. Now R O N N. Now I'm going to check with R and O. So O is actually smaller, so it will become A D M O R N. Okay. Sorry, this value was N. So let me just keep here N. O R N. Next, I am going to check O with N, and N is actually smaller, so it will become E D M N R, and O will come at the last. Okay, so my these values are fixed. My fifth fifth iteration will start. The fifth iteration, I am going to check with R and O. So E D M N N is already done. I am going to check with R and O. Is my R lesser than O? No, so it will be replaced E D M N. And O R. So this is what is my value. Let's see A D M N O R. A D M N O R. Is this what we got? Where exactly we wrote it? A D M N O R. Yes. And that's how our result will be verified. This is how we have to go. So what sort of logic are we going to use? Though the explanation was quite big. So what sort of logic exactly we are going to use? Let's see that. Sorting of the string. Okay. This is called sorting of string. Program for sorting of string. Okay, and what exactly are we going to do? Is we'll have one string, char name equal to or char str equal to. Which let's have the str equal to. Very first, let's have random and we'll check if our calculation was actually correct or not. So let's have the length. How to find length? Int len equal to str len. And here we are going to pass our str. Cool, because we already have string dot h. We don't have to worry about the same. Now we got the length. Very first, we'll be running my loop from my first character to my last character. For int i equal to zero, i less than length i plus plus. And if you would have uh, like seen over here that when I was going with my r, I started checking next value from a. I was checking my first value from my second value. I am not checking my first value from the first value. So I'll always check from one greater than my i value. I'll always check the second thing from one greater than my i value. So my second loop or the nested loop will start from int j equal to i plus one. It should be one ahead of i. J should be one ahead of i, and it should go till where my j value should actually go till length and j plus plus. It should go till the end. J plus plus. I am going to check if my i value, okay, if str of i is greater than if my i value is greater than my comparing value str of j. In that case, we are going to swap. And because we have already seen how swap is done, char m equal to str of i, str of i. Equal to str of j, str of j equal to m, and this is how the swapping will be done. And post that, we'll be able to print f mod less s backslash n. And here we are printing str. Let's see if random is printed as a d m n o r a d m n o r. Okay, that's it as as a Answer A D M N O R. So we got the answer. What exactly we are doing over here is we are using nested loop, and my next loop or inside loop will run from i plus one and not from zero. Inside this, we are checking if my first element, if my r, we are checking with the next element a. If it is greater, we are checking if my this element i element is greater than my j element. If yes, then we are going to swap, and this is the condition for swapping. We are taking one temp variable and we are swap swapping the value, and that is how at the end we'll have our value in the sorted format. 
okay i hope you would have understood this very very well next is find if the string is anagram or not so what is the condition for anagram that it should have same length very first it should have same length and all the characters should be same and all the characters should be same this is going to be a big question but because we have already done sorting of a string this is very similar to that and we are going to use the same logic so this is going to be an easy one same length and all the characters should be same let's suppose one of my string is a b c and the second string is b a c so let's check if the length is same 3 3 yes second condition check if any character is present here is also present over here a a b b and c c no matter what is the order exact same amount of characters should be present with the same length and if that is so we are uh, we can actually say it that the string is actually anagram and this is a weight of situation because we cannot compare every single time if a is present if b is present because characters can even repeat okay let's suppose here we had one more a and we are just checking if a is present or not so we have we can see that a was present here right so it will always be true for here him and here as well and that is how it will cause some problem okay let's suppose the length was also same here it was c in this case we cannot compare by running a loop that if it is present inside the second string or not so what we will do is we'll do a, a sorting approach okay so a a b c and let's suppose let's take actually two values x z y a this is my first string a y x z this is my second string i'm going to short this up what will be after shorting what will be my result a x y z after sorting this what will be my result a x y z and because we got that so we can actually compare these two string after sorting and we can check if if my strings are equal or not so in this case we can use compare str cmp and if you are getting zero that means the strings are equal and that means these strings are anagram if not they are not okay so let's go ahead and follow the same approach and let's have my first str1 and let's have the second str cat str2 and here we are going to have let's have the same thing m n o m n o r a d okay m n o r a d okay we are keeping one string which is having m m n n o o r r a a and d d so which is actually anagram okay so we have to check with this so here we have to pass str1 and we need to find one more length so this is going to be my len 1 and i'm going to find one more length which is going to be my len 2 so we got two lengths len 1 and len 2 so for len for str1 i'm going to actually do what i'm going to short i'm going to do shorting for str1 okay and when this shorting will take place when the length is actually equal okay if the length itself is not equal why will i go ahead and do this much of hard work right so this is we are shorting sorting my first string let's also sort the second string i will copy from here to here sorting my not sporting sorting my second string and from here to here i'll paste i'll just have to change this to len 2 basically the lens will be equal then only we are going to short so we if, even if you are not changing that that will not make a lot of difference but let's do it str2 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 
str2 because you have already seen the uh, sorting thing so i am like not going ahead with the explanation of what sorting looks like we have already done over here and that is that was a quite big and good explanation i would say so you just have to watch the entire recording what we are going to do is very first the length should be equal if the length itself is not equal it is like um not useful to go ahead and do the sorting because that much computation will go into waste so we will check if len1 equal to equal to len2 if len1 equal to equal to len2 if it is not equal let's check if it is not equal and we are going to break it immediately print f not anagram not anagram because length is not equal okay we are we can break this thing and if you're using break it will actually throw error because we cannot break it over here instead we have to stop the program so we'll write exit zero exit zero is actually going to uh let me just add over here one z and you will see that it is going to stop my program right after there okay it generated one error which is str okay this will be str2 and i made a small mistake okay we were printing str1 instead we have to check if okay str cmp comparison of str1 comma str2 equal to equal to zero so we are doing simple comparison and the result of a string comparison will be zero as we have already seen if it is zero we can print f anagram else we can have we can print f not anagram not anagram okay so these are the two things which we can definitely go ahead and do let me just go ahead and click on run because the lengths are right now not equal so it will say not anagram because the length is not equal and you can see that it is immediately stopping the program it's not even reaching here let me have a print of a statement over here working so that will not get printed because it is not reaching over here it is because of exit zero it is stopping and exiting the code then and there itself okay that is how your exit zero works let me just go ahead and remove that exit zero thing and click on run and let's let me also remove this thing okay now the strings are actually anagram so it says anagram okay and let me just remove one character because the lens are equal now i'll just replace one character it will say not anagram so because the lens were equal it came over here and it said not anagram so what we are doing over here is we are just converting both the strings and we are sorting it and this is the real value after the sorting we are using a string comparison if both the values are equal and uh sorry if both the values are equal it will return zero and that is what we are checking if a string comparison result is equal to equal to zero or not if it is equal to zero that means it is anagram and if it is not equal to zero after sorting that means it is not anagram and this is what we use as anagram and this is one of the most appealing question especially inside the placements if you're preparing for it go for this question practice it thoroughly moving ahead with the next question convert all lowercase character to uppercase this is also one of my favorite question so we can even see the vice versa situation where we have to convert the uh, uppercase to the lowercase or lowercase character to the uppercase okay so what we are doing here is lowercase to uppercase in this situation we can definitely use the ascii value so what you have to do is you have to just search for ascii table and you will be able to visit it uh, over any website or any web, uh, image and here you will be able to see two things that 65 is capital a and 97 is a small a and the rest of the string is like uh, moving just ahead like it goes till 90 and it goes till 122 okay and everything is in a proper sequence so how can we actually use the ascii numbers to actually convert my lower case to the upper case let's look at this your small a is 97 and your capital a is 65 if i remove 97 minus 65 the answer is 32 okay and let's go with b 
D equal to is 98 and B in capital is 66. If I do that, 60, 98 minus 66 answer is again 32. So if I simply remove 32 uh, from my character, lower character, it will again become my uh, upper character, right? And at the very same time, we also have to check that if the character is belonging in the range of A to Z because if it is a space and then we are removing uh, uh, like uh, negating 32 from it it will be a wrong answer okay so very first what we have to do we have to check that my character belongs to the range of a small a to capital z sorry small z or not and if it does what exactly we are going to do is we are going to subtract 32 from it let's see how that will work let me remove everything from here that was a last last code was actually quite big okay so what we are going to do is we are going to have one string str equal to hey my name is prashant okay so it will convert every single character into the bigger character okay sorry i used int which we have to use it as cap now we have to find the length and len equal to str len and here we have to pass str cool and we are running from my 0 to len int i equal to 0 i is less than n i plus plus and in this case i am checking if my character str of i so i am going to store that in t equal to str of i so that i can directly use this t variable though i don't have to but that actually makes it much more readable and good to understand so let me just go ahead and use this t directly okay if t is greater than equal to small a or or sorry let's have and and t is lesser than equal to small z it should be greater than equal to a and lesser than equal to z okay in this situation what we are going to do is str of i not with t str of i equal to str of i minus 32 directly then and there we are going to do it okay and post running this entire loop we are simply going to print up modulus s comma str let's see what will be the output of this hey my name is prashant so it's not changing my comma it's not changing my spaces okay what it is doing is it is just converting it to the uppercase in order to change my uh, uppercase to the lowercase i have to change my small a small z to capital a capital z instead of negating 32 i have to do addition of 32 and the opposite will happen do give it a try and see if you can do it so let's begin with the next question in an array one to hundred numbers are stored and one number is missing how will you find it this is one of my favorite question and this is a very logical question very first let me just delete everything from here okay so we are given the condition that in an array one to hundred numbers are stored okay one to hundred only one number is missing and you have to tell what number is missing or which number is missing exactly so in this <laughs> what we have to do is we actually have to go ahead and create an array and fill from 1 to 100 but i'm not going to do that i'm going to utilize uh, the loop condition to create an array and fill numbers to it okay so how to go ahead with this problem is that very first let's add the int arr and give the size as 100 okay for and i equal to 0 i is less than 100 i plus plus and then i will be going ahead with arr of i equal to arr of i equal to i plus 1 so basically for the index 0 i want to store the number 1 now you will say that okay this is going to store every number from 1 to 100 then which number is missing in order to miss any number what we can do is we can actually keep it as zero let's suppose we want to miss the number 70 so instead of 70 with the if condition we can keep that number as zero okay so let's come here and put the condition if 
i plus 1 why i plus 1 because i is actually indexing which is starting from 0 so i plus 1 will be that number 70 equal to equal to 70 in this case i'm just going to use continue okay i'm just going to skip that particular iteration and arr of will be oh let's actually keep arr of i because anyways that will be left right we don't have to do that arr of i equal to 0 in this case i'm going to store 0 only i don't want to leave it blank anyways if i leave it blank by default it is stored as 0 so i don't have to do that but just for understanding let's keep it like that okay now using this we have created one array which is having the number missing as 70 okay now what we are going to do is we are going to utilize one formula which is n into n plus 1 by 2 n into n plus 1 by 2 it is the total sum it is the total sum of your array so what we can do is we are actually running our code from here okay actual logic so because this array will be provided to you and you cannot modify anything to that but if in case what you have to do is for int i equal to 0 i is less than uh, 100 because that is what we have to go i plus plus if in case the number was missing we have to go till 99 only because your array size will be one less than that okay in our case it's not missing it is zero so we can go till 100 but if it is actually missing we will actually go till 99 only okay because that number is not present itself neither zero is there that number is removed okay it's like that in your condition but in our condition we have kept it as zero so we have to reach till 100 so sum plus equal to arr of i what i did is i stored everything into the sum variable for which initial value of sum is zero so i did what i added every single number into my sum and whatever number is missing let's suppose 70 is missing so my total sum will be 70 lesser than the actual value of 1 to 100 let's suppose i'm adding 1 to 100 and because 70 was missing so my total sum will be 70 lesser okay and what we have to do is we have to find one more value in final sum in final sum and this is what we are going to find using n into n plus 1 which is the formula for what finding the sum of all the numbers till one range and here n in our case is 100 so n into which is 100 okay into 100 plus 1 n into n plus 1 so it will be 100 plus 1 will be 101 and we have to divide it by 2 we have to divide this entire thing by 2 let's see what is the value which we are getting and what we will do is we can have printf the missing value was value was model as d bachelor's n what exactly we are going to do is we are going to subtract your sum from the final sum sum minus sorry you, we are going to subtract sum from the final sum so we have to keep final sum in here and then sum in here and this is going to give our value like what number was missing so it says the number missing was why well, it's saying hey my name is prashant okay it gave the number missing was 70 let's go with uh, any other number let's go with 56 and let's see what do we get here we should be getting the number missing was 56 and if you see we actually got the output and how this is working forget this this is what we are using to store the items inside the array the actual logic is the total number of total value of sum in one range let's suppose 1 to 100 so all the numbers or sum of n natural numbers sum of n natural number natural number is counted with n into n plus 1 by 2 n into n plus 1 by 2 and this is how we are counting the total sum of 100 so 100 into 101 100 plus 101 by 2 this will give you the total sum of the value which you are finding okay and because 
uh, we were having the value 1 to 100 inside the array and this is what we calculated but 70 was missing so my this value will be 70 greater than the array sum okay then the sum of the array and that's how we subtracted and we got the difference and that difference is your missing number or that difference is your missing number this is the logic which we are using in order to find the missing number from the range 1 to 100 cool let's go ahead with the next question it is write a program to find the first duplicate number in an array so you're you are having an array okay let's create a static array itself int arr equal to of 10 maybe we are having the 10 size or let's not give the size okay equal to 1 comma 2 comma 3 comma 4 comma 2 comma 3 comma 5 comma 6 comma 7 comma 8 comma 9 comma 10 maybe this is your array this is your array and this first duplicate number is what 2 if you see first duplicate number is 2 and how exactly we are going to run over here is we are going to use nested loop we are going to use nested loop okay and how we did in a string comparison like let's suppose this is one number and this is my next number how we were comparing like that okay two three four two i'll compare this with this i'll compare this with this i'll compare this with this and if this is what is what is duplicate i'll print that okay this number is duplicate and i'll use exit zero or break to stop my loop then and there but it has one problem and what is the problem if it was in a string we could have used str len to find the size of the array here purposely i am not keeping a fixed size as 10 20 and we are not going to count it we have to find the size and there is a way to find the size of the array which is int size equal to using the size of operator so size of arr divided by size of my int because it is an int type but what if you don't know what is the type of the array in that case you can even have the first value arr of zero even this is going to do your task okay now let's see let's print f modulus d comma size let's see if it is actually giving us our value and then we will count what is the actual number present yet we have not counted it says 12 let's count it 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 so that means it is counting even if we replace this int arr so arr 0 with int it is going to give me the same thing which is 12 and how this actually works is very first it is finding the total size of the array which is going to find in the bytes let's suppose there are 12 elements and because it is in the form of int one element is taking four bytes okay one element is taking four bytes the total bytes which was given to us size of is going to do what it is going to find the number of bytes okay which that array is occupying let's suppose it printed that Mm, 48 bytes it printed that total of 48 bytes of data is being consumed i know that one int value is going to have four bytes of data so i'm going to divide it by four and then i will get 12 so that means i have 12 elements present inside the array and this is how we find the size of the array okay i hope you would have got this we will have one more question on this in the uh coming slides so let's stick to this knowledge okay and now when we know size we are going to run a loop till this size okay for die equal to zero i is less than size i plus plus and then moving ahead what exactly we are going to do is we are going to compare how exactly are we going to compare with the nested loop with the nested loop for int j equal to and what we did in this string i plus 1 we are going to compare with the one element ahead of it then j is less than size j plus plus moving ahead what exactly we are going to do we are going to check if arr of i equal to equal to arr of j as soon as that happens we are going to print off that element that modulus d is the first 
डुप्लीकेट एलिमेंट डुप्लीकेट एलिमेंट एंड वी विल हैव बैचलेस एन हियर वी आर गोइंग टू गिव ए आर आर ऑफ आई लेट्स सपोज द फर्स्ट एलिमेंट व्हिच वाज फाउंड इज 2 वी आर गोइंग टू प्रिंट इट इवन इफ यू वांट टू फाइंड ऑल द एलिमेंट्स व्हिच आर डुप्लीकेटेड यू कैन यूज यू कैन जस्ट कीप इट रनिंग ओके यू कैन जस्ट यू डोंट हैव टू ब्रेक एनीथिंग so what we will do is if we use break over here it is only going to you break your external loop is going to break your external loop so we have to use break twice with the condition so it is actually good to use exit zero in this case it is actually good to use exit zero in this case and if nothing if it is not getting exited in that case what we have to use we can even use return zero if in case we want to if in case we want to stop we can even use return zero and this will do the same task But exactly why for loop is ending, and if till that point this condition was never true, we will print f. No element is duplicated. We also have to take care of this situation, else it is going to throw us the error. If there is no duplicate element, it will not print anything, right? So let's click on run. It says two is the first duplicate element. So let's remove two, and let's see if it is making any change. So three is the first duplicate element. Let's remove three as well, and let's see if it is making any change. Right now, there is no duplicate element. So it will say no element is duplicated. That means your program is very very fine, and I hope you would have understood this program very well. Okay. Moving ahead to the third question: How to compare if two arrays having equal number of elements or not? so it is again the question of size we have two arrays array 1 and array 2 okay int arr 1 equal to uh -oh. int arr 1 equal to we have certain number of elements okay we are not sure how many elements are there then we have second array int arr 2 in this we have certain number of elements and we we are actually not sure how many elements are there okay we are not even going to count it so these are the elements present inside your arr2 very first we are going to find the size of the first element in size 1 equal to size of my arr1 comma divided by size of my arr of 0 okay this is going to find the size of my first array cool i'm just going to copy it down and paste it one more time in size 2 here i'm going to replace it with arr2 here i'm going to replace it with arr2 and then i'm i can simply compare if size 1 equal to equal to size 2 print f arrays do have same number of elements Okay, backslash n. Else, print f. Arrays don't have same number of elements. Okay, this is what we had to do in this question. And now let's click on run. It will definitely say that they do not have same number of elements. As we can see the difference. Let me remove this much of data. and i guess now they are equal looking at the size i can tell that they are equal it has to print that arrays do have same number of element so that means your program is working absolutely flawlessly okay next go to find the smallest number and the largest number present in the array so there is one array okay arr it has so many numbers 1 2 3 8 9 0 2 5 6 or whatever okay we have to find two things the smallest number which is going to be your 1 and the biggest number which is going to be your 9 and how do i do this again using the comparison of nested loops only how we did it in your strings i will compare this value with this if this is greater no 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 i'll keep on checking and i'll see that 9 was greater so i'll keep 9 over here i'll keep 9 over uh, a different variable i don't have to 
change the value of the array so i'll keep 9 in a variable i'll check if any number greater than 9 has that value even we can go ahead and not do this with the nested loops you can simply run one loop in arr i am keeping the first value smallest and biggest both i'll check if this value is biggest than this no let's leave it if 2 is bigger than uh, 1 so we are going to say that big is equal to 2 then I am going to check with 3. Is 3 big than 2? Yes, I am going to assign 3 to big. Is 8 big than 2? Whatever value is there? Yes, so I am going to assign 8. Is 9 big than 8? Yes, so I am going to assign 9 to it. Is my 0 is big than 9? No, actually let's, let's do it very clearly. That was getting a little rough. So here we have certain values 1, 2, 3, 8, 9, 0, 5. This is an array. And we are running a simple loop. We have assigned that big equal to the first array element, which is one. Now I'm running the loop from my second element. I'm running the loop from my second element. I'm checking is one greater than two? No. So I'm going to put a different value, okay? Which is going to be two. I'm going to check with the next element. Is two greater than three? No. Three is greater. So I'm going to keep three in my big. Is three greater than eight? No. Eight is greater. So I'm going to keep eight in my big. Is 9 greater than 8? No, I am going to keep 9 here. Is 9 greater than 0? Yes. Is 9 greater than 5? Yes. I will keep it as 9. So, the biggest element is 9. And opposite we have to do with the smallest element. Let's see how this could be done inside the array. So, let's suppose this is the array which we have. This is AR2. And this is the size which we are looking for. Okay. We found the size ARR and ARR. Now we have the array, we have the size, we just have to run the loop for int i equal to 0, not 0, 1. i is less than size, i plus plus. And here I am going to assign my int largest equal to arr of 0. Let's find the largest and then we can find the smallest in the same. Okay. Here what I am going to do is if largest or if arr of i is greater than largest if arr of i is greater than largest that means i got a value which is greater than my current value which is present in my largest if that happens i'm going to update my largest value to be the arr of i so if in case i found that my 4 is greater than 3 so i'm going to update 4 to my largest and Moving ahead, I saw that, okay, there is one 5, which is largest than 4 as well. So, I'm going to keep 5 in my largest. And when I am having 5 in my largest, I'm going to compare if 7 is actually greater than 5. And yes, so I'm going to keep 7 in the largest. I'm going to check with the next element, which is 8. 8 is greater than largest. So I'm going to store 8 over here. I'm going to check with the next element, which is 4. So, 4 is not greater than 8. So, I'm going to keep it the same. Okay. And at the end, when the loop ends, I'm having the largest value, print f largest value is modulus d comma largest here let's have a backslash n the opposite we have to do to find the smallest value and we can do it in the very same variable so the largest value was 8 let's keep it as 15 and check if 15 is our largest value that is coming that means it is running good okay now in order to find the smallest value i am going to write int is smallest equal to arr of 0 and i'll keep on checking but this time i am going to check for smallest this was for largest and i'm going to check for smallest smallest if arr of i is lesser than smallest in this case i'll update is smallest equal to arr of i if in case i'm finding any value lesser than my smallest then i'm going to print it and at the end when the loop is ending i'll have my smallest value so let me just go ahead and print it smallest value equal to smallest okay cool let's click on run and see what is the output over here so the biggest value is 15 and the smallest value is 3. Cool. Okay. 
let's go ahead with the next question program to find the sum of all the elements present in the array okay i hope that you will be able to solve this question on your own what we have to do is we have to run a loop from one to the size and keep on adding all the elements in the array so let's have this array only let's have the size as well let's remove everything int sum equal to zero i have to run for int i equal to zero i is less than size i plus plus sum plus equal to ar of i what i'm doing is i'm adding every single element i'm iterating over the uh, array i'm iterating over the array using this loop and whatever value i'm getting i'm putting that in my sum and at the end i am just printing the sum total sum of array is modulus d bashless n and here i am printing arr of sorry not arr of i actually sum okay this is going to be my total sum and whatever is the total sum will get printed which is 41 so you can just calculate if this is going giving us the total sum of 41 or not for which i am pretty sure so i'm not going to check it okay so that's it in this video and from next video we'll be starting with our c plus plus concept keep on practicing with the sheets i will be providing insight right after this code so you can have a bunch of more questions to practice on your own till then take care tata bye bye